Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I am Joyce Ilas. I am the Communications and Advocacy Manager of uh, Stratbase ADR Institute, and I will be your host for today. And on behalf of the Stratbase group, we would like to welcome you to the second day of uh, Filipinas Conference 2022. Our theme for today is Business Value Creation, Paving the Path for Inclusive Growth. And to officially open the program, may we call on Professor Victor Andres Dindo Manhit. He is the current president of the Stratbase ADR Institute and the lead convener of, uh, for the Democracy Watch Philippines. He is the managing director of the Bauer Group Asia in the Philippines. He served as associate professor and chair for the political science department of the De La Salle University. He was a former undersecretary of the Department of Education, and he was appointed as one of the ASEAN regional forum experts and eminent persons by the Department of, the Fo of Foreign Affairs. He regularly contributes articles and columns on renowned news platforms like the Philippine Daily Inquirer and Business World. His expertise are strategic studies and management, legislative research, and public policy analysis. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Dindo Manhit. morning to everyone and thank you for being here on the second day of the 2022 Filipinas conference yesterday we had at least 180 participants and we had 300 uh, participants in the zoom uh, through the zoom link yesterday's event was everything we at the Stratbase ADR Institute had hoped for and more our discussions were engaging, at times riveting. We deep dived into the most pressing issues and challenges besetting our nation. We heard the perspectives of representatives of various stakeholders of Philippine society. Again, we were reminded of why we chose to do what we do every day, because we want to have a free, prosperous, productive Filipino nation. We want to end the inequity that has plagued us for so long. We want to be part of a society where institutions, no matter who are sitting at the helm, are functioning properly, accountable and responsive to the needs of the Filipino people. We want to be accorded respect in the international community for being a country that respects and upholds the rule of law. We want to ensure that there will be enough resources available to sustain us and future generations of Filipinos. Day two of the 2022 Filipinas Conference will center on the role of the private sector in, ger in generating value, driving growth, and occasioning inclusive prosperity among our people. Yesterday, we have shared what we track and what we consider as geopolitical risk that we are facing in 2022 and beyond. And I've always argued that the Philippines continues to be in a long economic emergency where many people continue to be poor, hungry, and desiring for jobs while dealing with the realities of geopolitical or asymmetric security challenges in our country. We continue to be data-driven in Stratbase ADR Institute. And part of that is we run quarterly surveys to focus on and understand what are the pressing national concerns? And what we took note is on top of that list is always the economic challenges, issue of prices, issue of jobs, issue of income, poverty, and with poverty, we'll always say there's hunger. It's good news that when you look at the third quarter data, our economy still expanded with 7.6% in the third part. When I see this data, thankful for the service sector driving growth. But imagine if we can have the manufacturing sector grow more, be more aggressive, given the regulatory laws and policies that have been enshrined and institutionalized to generate more growth and investment, both by foreign and domestic investors in that area. Imagine if we can make agriculture more productive, then we can have jobs 
for the 7.3 million people who call themselves unemployed. On the eve of the inauguration of President Bongbong Marcos Jr., we ran a question with Pulse Asia, and we took note of what are the issues that the new administration should act on. Again, economic. Issues of controlling increases in prices, stimulating the economy to create employment for the rest of the year, and crafting new pro-poor programs in education, health, and housing for the poor, and finding ways to finance them. Indeed, these issues on the, that the Filipinos on the ground want the new administration to act on are economic challenges that they continue to face day to day. And this is where we put the role that we hope to play as one institute in Philippine society. How do you help bring people together and generate a more confident business outlook. And it reminds me of the latest third quarter business outlook on how similar issues of high inflation, rising fuel prices, decline in sales and demand, peso depreciation, dampens that outlook. But on a hopeful note, we see if we will address these issues on a whole of society approach, the Filipino people across geographic and demographic areas would like us to work together. In our third quarter commission survey with Pulse Asia, we took note of the private sector as an indispensable partner of the government in achieving its aim to improve the Filipinos' quality of life. They invest and pour capital into the system and it will create jobs and it will lift the lives of the Filipino people as they provide employment and consequently income. They also transfer technology and help upgrade people's skills. They are now taking the lead in the responsible stewardship of the environment. Filipinos acknowledge and appreciate this. That's why when we conducted the 2022 survey with Pulse Asia, it showed nine out of 10 Filipinos agree that the private sector plays a crucial role in accelerating economic growth and that the government and the private sector should engage in partnership to sustain our country's recovery. Respondents also during the say, this survey believe that there are several ways in which a private sector can help boost the Philippine economy, and most prominent of which are creating jobs, helping uplift the lives of the Filipinos out of poverty, and expanding livelihood opportunities, and improving healthcare systems. Other areas of cooperation identified respondents were improving the quality of and access to digital services, managing natural resources, taking care of the environment, developing public infrastructure, and even improving the quality of education. These numbers by themselves are already telling, but they become even more so when we take into considera consideration that the earlier survey, just 58% of respondents nationwide agreed creating jobs was an area where the private sector can help. Nine months later, the number jumped to 69%. We run this survey once a year on the role of the private sector. We at Stratbase believe there's nothing better than a heightened, constructive, and sustained engagement between the government and the private sector. Their role strengthens resources, strengthens, and resources with perspectives complement each other. They will be able to do so much more together rather than if operated on its own. And if ordinary Filipinos are aware of this, it does not make any sense for our public sector leader to be half-hearted in their dealings with the business community. Here in Stratbase, we believe a sustained committed partnership between the government and the private sector. Moving forward, as we cross to 2023, will be a game changer in our recovery and development. We are already seeing this at work in the specific sectors where partnership has existed or does exist. What we need, however, is partnership with the private sector as a national policy, as the rule rather than the exception, arising from an acknowledgement of the private sector's immense contribution to the development of our nation. In order for the Philippine economy to bounce back amid global uncertainties and achieve sustainable long-term 
economic growth, the new administration must pursue an investment-driven strategy to transform the economy into one that is more resilient to shocks. But then again, the government cannot address complex interconnected challenges alone. The private sector in the Philippines, which for the longest time has proven itself to be a reliable partner of the government is a key driver of innovation and economic growth through their investments. Hence, the main challenge of the government is to create an enabling and stable business environment for investment to thrive. Market-friendly policies, practices that promote ease of doing business, transparency protocols, good governance, all contribute to the development of public trust, ultimately providing a haven for business to operate in the country, both foreign and domestic. International trade and investment make the world economy thrive. However, the global supply chain is vulnerable to economic, political, and environmental changes and can lead to a domino effect that largely impacts the entire supply chain. Ultimately, the objective is to make the countries more attractive to both foreign and domestic investors, especially those involved in manufacturing and production. Investments in manufacturing that directly cater to the needs of the growing domestic market, which we discussed yesterday, will lessen the local economy's dependence on imports. Moreover, these activities will not only stimulate the economy and strengthen the Philippines' role in the global supply chain, but also generate jobs and livelihood opportunities, provide income security, elevate poverty, and improve the quality of life of Filipinos moving forward. Only by shifting to investment-driven growth can the country prosper inclusively and sustainably. There is no single sector that can and should drive the nation's affairs. There are no formulaic solutions or quick fixes. We acknowledge the complexity of what we are up against, the diversity yet interwovenness of our interests, but also the singularity of our aspirations. A better, more secure life for the Filipino people. A guarantee that people will not only survive but flourish for many years, 18 years when we established Stratbase in 2000. For we have been doing just that, bringing people together, providing the platform for interaction, provoking talk, sparking conversations, and translating all this into actionable policy recommendations, which we hope helps make a difference in people's lives. I look forward, and I hope you also do, to our sessions today and to hearing what our esteemed speakers, panelists will say, both in their tasks and in the open forum indeed. The private sector is an able and willing partner for the government. So maybe our question this morning is how can we move collectively together forward with this knowledge? On behalf of the Stratbase ADR Institute, I welcome everyone. I think we earlier we had 200 Zoom participants already. For those both media, friends in the private sector, friends in civil society, members of the diplomatic community, Welcome to day two of the Filipinas Conference. And allow me to introduce our the keynote speaker for the day two of the Filipinas Conference. I've known him since the mid 90s when I was still with the Senate of the Philippines. He's now the Secretary of the Department of Finance and also the Professor Emeritus of the University of the Philippines School of Economics. Prior to his appointment as Fiscal Chief, he served as the Governor of the Banco Central ng Pilipinas from 2019 and 2022. Was budget secretary from 2016 and 2019, but also in 1998 to 2001, when I was serving government in the education department. His policy expertise and research contribution extend to various areas of public economics, such as tax policies and reforms, public expenditure, management analysis, fiscal decentralization, the national budget and public debt. Again, everyone, let's welcome Secretary of the Department of Finance, Benjamin Jock. Okay, I, thank, I thank Stratbase ADR Institute for organizing this conference. Uh, this is a great opportunity for the public and private sectors 
to exchange ideas on how we can work together towards inclusive and sustainable growth. I commend the strength and resilience of our business community throughout the pandemic. By quickly adapting to market developments, you have kept our economy afloat. Today, we face new challenges, but despite the threats of geopolitical risk and slowing world economy, our latest economic indicators have been encouraging. For the first three quarters of 2022, the Philippine economy grew by a solid 7.7%, despite inflationary pressures and other risk. This suggests that we are well on our way to securing our full year target of 6.5 to 7.5%. We might even achieve the upper bound of this target. And from 2023 to 2028, we expect the economy to expand even faster at 6.5 to 8%. Foreign direct investment inflows are on the rise. In 2021, just a year since the onset of the pandemic, we reached all time high inflows of 12.4 billion US dollars. Our latest revenue collections reflect higher economic activity. From January to September, 2022, Total revenue collections reached 2.7 trillion pesos. That's 19% higher compared to the same period in 2021. And we expect revenue collection to even exceed its pre-pandemic level this year. Our labor market has bounced back. In September of this year, we recorded an employment rate of 95%, the highest recorded since the pandemic hit in January 2020. Unemployment has also continued its downtrend to 5% from 8.9% a year ago. This figure is the lowest unemployment rate since the last quarter of 2019. While the effects of the pandemic still linger and new threats have emerged, we move forward with renewed confidence equipped with the fiscal tools and strategies required to navigate an environment beset with uncertainties. To guide our vision, the government has crafted an eight-point socioeconomic agenda containing strategic interventions to decisively address challenges to recovery. In the near term, we will reduce socioeconomic scarring from the pandemic arrest the acceleration of food prices, and ensure macroeconomic fundamentals. Over the medium term, the goal is to create high quality and green jobs. To achieve this, we will invest heavily in physical infrastructure, digitalization, and human capital development. Such massive investments will require fiscal prudence and a cohesive strategic plan. For this, the economic team has prepared a medium-term fiscal framework, the first in Philippine history. This fiscal plan aligns the financing program for the next six years with a sharp focus on improving tax administration, enhancing the fairness and efficiency of our tax system, and promoting sustainability to address climate change. But we cannot achieve any of this alone. We recognize that effective public-private cooperation holds the key to a host of desirable goals such as workforce upskilling, climate change mitigation, and infrastructure development. We will harness the public-private partnership mechanism to execute impactful projects consistent with our development goals. This requires a sound framework to facilitate the execution of public-private partnership projects. And to demonstrate our commitment, we have revised the implementing rules and regulations of the Build Operate Transfer Law. Transparency and accountability underpin the revised IRR, particularly in processing infrastructure and development projects to arrive at the real cost of the project to the government, the consumers, and the taxpayers. Hopefully, the revised IRR will allow us to sustain our current 
momentum of infrastructure spending despite budgetary constraints. We also anticipate significant benefits from the implementation of key structural reforms such as the Corporate Recovery and Tax Incentives for Enterprises Act or CREATE and the Economic Liberalization Laws. CREATE has transformed the country's corporate tax structure and it has modernized our tax incentive system. This landmark tax reform cuts corporate tax rates by 10 percentage points for domestic, micro, small, and medium enterprises, and by 5 percentage points for all other corporations, including foreign enterprises. This significantly reduced the cost of doing business in the Philippines. CREATE also offers a single menu of superior incentives for businesses and activities that are aligned with our strategic priorities. Meanwhile, amendments to our investment laws widen the space for international firms to invest in previously protected sectors, such as among others, telecommunications, toll roads, and shipping. It formed part of joint ventures with private, private sector and even fully owned enterprises employing advanced technologies. In closing, let me assure everyone that the government readily welcomes your wealth of ideas, expertise, and proposals. The task of rebuilding the economy requires a concerted whole of nation of effort. So let's work together to deliver to the Filipino people a prosperous nation and a secure future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary Jokno. That was a very inspiring speech. We definitely do have a lot to look forward to in the next six years of this administration. Thank you again, Secretary Ben Diokno. Moving on to the first panel, our theme is sustaining the Philippines' growth momentum amid fiscal challenges and global uncertainties. The public health emergency and its unprecedented consequences demonstrated the pressing need for collaboration between the government and the private sector. The private sector, which has proven to be a reliable partner of the government, is a key driver in promoting inclusive growth and sustainable development through their investments and initiatives that shall reinvigorate job creation, provide income, alleviate poverty, and even protect the environment. Indeed, the private sector is equipped and to and uh, is equipped to expand meaningful partnerships across all levels of society, balance stakeholder value creation, respond to crisis in the short term, and boost communities' resiliency to possible risks in the long term. For our first speaker in this panel. He will be discussing the Philippines as an investment destination, a United States perspective. Joining us through Zoom is Mr. Ernest Bauer, who is the founder, president, and CEO of the U.S.-based Bauer Group Asia, a strategic advisory firm working with, with the world's top companies across the Indo-Pacific region. His career has focused on helping promote prosperity and security by finding ways to align the needs and aspirations of people, communities and institutions in Asia, and the goals, capabilities, and potential of the world's top companies. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ernest Bauer. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank Dindo, Secretary Del Rosario, and Stratbase for the invitation to join you this morning. Congratulations to Stratbase, and thank you for the important role you're providing a database, a database policy foundation for the Philippines. I'd also like to thank Secretary Jokno for his visionary presentation. It's an honor to join all of you today. Almost three years after the COVID-19 pandemic began, the Philippines and other economies in Asia continue to face uncertainties because new risks have emerged, such as the impact of Russia's investment 
invasion, sorry, of the Ukraine and the geopolitical predominance of the China of China US tensions. These three trends have presented a real challenge for the Philippines in the form of energy and food shortages, a spike in the poverty level starting in 2021, and signs of creeping inflation. At the same time, these conditions also present opportunities, with China and the US competing so aggressively for markets and the edge in advancing their own technologies and standards, the Philippines and other ASEAN members are being wooed and offered, being offered new opportunities. The private sector, including many ch private Chinese companies, is working overtime to supply, diversify supply chains to reduce dependence on China. Amidst the threat of a global recession, Asia continues to stand out as a relatively resilient region providing the world's engine for growth. The IMF predicts Asia's economies will expand by 4.9% in the coming year, while the rest of the world is expected to see growth of only about 2.7%. So it's no surprise that companies are taking a new hard look at what ASEAN's economies have to offer in terms of regulatory certainty, openness to foreign investment, efficient infrastructure, good governance, and competitive talent. Countries doing best in terms of attracting investment are adopting pragmatic, diversified investment-driven strategies, focusing on long-term growth and development. This approach is catching the eye of executives combing Asia for new suppliers and investment destinations. Countries like Vietnam and Singapore have done very well in this environment. In Vietnam, the government has decided to aggressively pursue foreign investment and has made it relatively easy for new companies to invest in Vietnam. Malaysia is going, doing well too. Many companies looking outside of China start by looking at Asia's two next biggest economies, India and Indonesia. The result there is decidedly mixed as these countries have not established clear policies toward foreign investment. And I'm sorry to say, that many investors share this rather uncertain view about investment in the Philippines. But this also means there's an important window of opportunity. Companies are considering options they haven't contemplated in the past, and the Philippines is of real interest to many of them as, the, as they reset their investments and in supply chains across Asia. Vietnam has seized this window. In recent years, they've vigorously courted big investors like Samsung and Intel. They've instituted policies to incentivize foreign companies and ensured factories, ensured factories that they will have access to reliable power supply, easy access to ports and other infrastructure. One area where they're still struggling is providing access to highly trained and a capable workforce. But what they have lacked in terms of a more sophisticated educational system is being made up for with hardworking and reliable talent pro-business labor laws, and vast investments in education. In this context, the Philippines faces some really important choices about its economic policies. Investors are aware that the economy there has been dominated by local companies and investment. Foreign companies who manage to navigate the complex labor and ownership rules tend to do well, but investors who want to work here in the Philippines sometimes find themselves frustrated by these rules and the business environment. Having worked closely with government leaders and private executives in the Philippines for over three decades, I have to say I don't believe there's a strong consensus about whether significant new foreign investment is desired. If that were the case, I believe you would have made the needed policy adjustments long ago, and I suspect foreign investment would pour into the country so blessed by such strong talent and the, the will of its people and its its it's, it's fortuitous geography. If you'd like to increase foreign investment, the roadmap is fairly straightforward. Specifically, the government could make a few changes that provide an environment that promotes business growth through market-friendly public policies, reform labor and ownership restrictions, and continue to invest in good governance. Some good progress has been made in recent months and years, as mentioned by Secretary Jokno in areas like telecom and mining. At the same time, the government cannot address these complex interconnected challenges alone. 
the private sector has dem demonstrated itself to be a reliable partner of the government, especially in managing the impact of the pandemic. And it will have to embrace this direction as well. This would require a change in the outlook across key sectors in the Philippines, a shift from protecting key market segments to welcoming new investments, partnerships, new technology, and linkages to foreign markets. And with it, competition, of course, and a new commitment to take what's worked very well in the Philippines and invest overseas. Some Filipino champions like Jollibee have made this dream a reality. I believe the Philippines top companies are more than ready to compete with any company that comes into your country. They're managed by some of the world's leading executives. They know the markets, they know the people and how to operate there. Such a shift in thinking would unlock powerful new economic growth, which if properly directed would promote inclusive growth and sustain sustainable development. It would create jobs and community development around the country provide more income security, help alleviate poverty, and generally grow the economic pie of the Philippines. More emphasis on the manufacturing sector would produce more exports than imports to balance the trade equation. To make growth more holistic, local and foreign investors alike should be encouraged to venture into, the manufa into manufacturing and production. Investors are looking closely at the relatively new Marcos administration for signals. The appointment of many well-respected technocrats, like Secretary Jokno, who just spoke, in key economic policy-making roles, like the, like the Secretary, the Department of Finance, have very much increased interest among companies. But to convert interest into high-impact growth, investors are looking for signs of real change in perspective a strong desire for new investment that's backed not only by words, but by actions in the form of reforms, policy changes, and particularly in the areas of relative concern, such as labor, transparency, and limits on foreign ownership. Thank you for your consideration today. Congratulations on the conference, and, and I appreciate the kind invitation to join you. Thank you very much. but also a lot of opportunities that we can take advantage of to ensure development in the next uh, six years. And like what Mr. Ernest Bauer said, we are also very helpful that the plans of the government will not just be words, but will also translate into concrete actions. So moving on to our next speaker, he will be discussing achieving shared prosperity through a competitive job-creating economy. Mr. Edgar Chua is the chairman of the Makati Business Club, a nonprofit organization that initiates public discourse on major socioeconomic issues, key legislation, and policy directions. He has had many years of experience in the petroleum business as the former country chairman of Shell Companies in the Philippines. He is a recipient of numerous local and international recognitions, including Asia People of the Year in 2013 and MAP Management Man of the Year in 2013 as well, among others. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Edgar Chua. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Um, I'll go straight to the uh, uh, topic at hand. Uh, as of last September 2022, 5% of the uh, labor force or 2.5 million Filipinos were unemployed, while 15% were underemployed. Meanwhile, 18.1% or 20 million Filipinos live below the poverty line. In 2020, two dozen business organizations, including the Makati Business Club, PCCI, and MEP, launched the Covenant for Shared Prosperity with the key message that business as usual is over. We recognize the need to step up and refocus in terms of uplifting the lives of stakeholders, especially the poorest 40% of Filipinos. In my talk today on shared prosperity, poverty alleviation, and job creation, 
I will focus on three areas, which we believe government, the private sector, and civil society organizations should prioritize. One, education and upskilling. We have a crisis in education. Second, business environment supportive of MSME growth, which is a major sector for job creation. And third, our sectoral reforms to create green jobs and quality jobs. On the first focus, education and upskilling for quality jobs. For the pursuit of shared prosperity, we must invest in human capital development. As we all know, 30% stunting is actually what's happening in the country right now. And so what we need is not just improved education, but we also need to address poverty alleviation. According to the Global Talent Competitiveness Index of 2022 by the Business School in Siad, the Philippines dropped 10 spots to rank 80th out of 133 countries. Countries are evaluated based on their ability to enable, attract, grow, and retain talent, vocational and technical skills, and global knowledge skills. The need to reskill and upskill Filipino workers, as well as improve the education system, is all the more important with the onset of the fourth industrial revolution. We should not miss this again. <clears throat> For reskilling and upskilling of the current labor force, a long-time proposal of the private sector is the passage of the apprenticeship bill to increase the duration of apprenticeship from six months to a maximum of two years, depending on the complexity of the skill being learned. Uh, Makati Business Club had a meeting with uh, Secretary Laguesma to discuss this issue. And the uh, secretary is supportive, uh, but just wary to ensure that there is no abuse in this uh, longer uh, apprenticeship. And I believe that the uh, private sector can also have uh, their own controls to ensure that this is not abused. On top of this, TESDA should improve and update their current course offerings, especially for regional training sites to ensure workforce competitiveness in terms of skills, both in rural and urban areas. For the prospective workforce or those who are still in the education system, but will soon join the workforce uh, and employment, education reforms must be done to ensure that they are hireable and equipped to enter the labor market and meet the skills demand. A proposal to consider is the upskilling of teachers. DepEd can create continuing education programs and certification processes for teachers. Another is developing STEM to produce workers with high value skills in the age of the uh, fourth industrial revolution. Increasing government spending in R&D, as well as strengthening the curriculum for STEM education is key. Looking at the uh, amount of support governments are, are providing, the Philippines is eighth or ninth in the ASEAN region as far as uh, government spending in R&D is concerned. Vietnam is spending more than double what we are spending. How can the business and private sector help? Participating in the apprenticeship program, providing input on market demand to improve test the courses, and moving away from college degree-centric perspective. Not all Filipinos can afford a college education, and there are many skill-based jobs still requiring college degrees. But the private sector must also consider hiring workers based on their skills for skill-based work without requiring college degrees. The second focus on business environment supportive of MSE growth. The ease of doing business. As far in 2020, the World Bank's uh, doing business report, the Philippines was ranked 95th out of 190 economies with a score of 62.8. We have the ease of doing business law, which aims to make it easier for business to start operating in the country. However, Continued bureaucracy is encountered, especially at the LGU. So the LGU needs to establish one-stop shop processing centers for permits and licenses. Uh, this is important to increase the efficiency of government services and transactions. The another action point is further legislation to help advance digitalization, such as the use of Digital Payment Act and the E-Governance Act. Ease of paying taxes is also something very important. The Philippines ranked 95th for ease of paying taxes in the World Bank doing business report in 2020. At the moment, they estimate that a private company takes, uh, takes uh, or spends about 170, 171 hours to file taxes each year. Furthermore, business registration is mostly delayed 
due to tax-related concerns such as BIR registration and compliance. An action point is to pass the ease of paying taxes bill, which would simplify tax forms and processes for business, especially for MSMEs. The third focus of sectoral reforms is on the, on the aspect of agriculture and food security. Agriculture remains the country's backbone for the sustainable attainment of food security. 22.5% of employed in the Philippines are in the agriculture sector, but the September 2022 labor force survey shows an exodus from this sector. Stagnating farm productivity and declining farmers' income are affecting job prospects in agriculture. According to the ILO, annual incomes of farm households are almost 30% lower than the average family income, and poverty incidence among farmers is estimated at close to 32%. What can the private sector do? Invest in food processing facilities, working directly with local farmers, help them connect to the global supply chains and customers. Second is increase and improve training and financial assistance for farmers. Use more technology in terms of connecting farmers to the market. The second sector that needs a lot of assistance is advanced manufacturing for value-added jobs. Opportunities lie in shifting towards high-value-added activities. What can the private sector do? Develop and offer training programs to improve skills. Tie up with universities and training institutions. Support green growth, green industry, use of clean technologies in industrial production. And I'm pleased to share with you that the Makati Business Club is currently working with various st stakeholders led by Unilab Foundation and USAID for the development of advanced manufacturing workforce in the Philippines. Our coalition is focused on two things, help shape a Philippine environment supportive of advanced manufacturing sector. And the second is to create a pipeline of highly skilled and adaptive workforce who meet the evolving requirements of the advanced manufacturing sector. The next uh, area that needs a lot of uh, attention is the power sector. The Philippines is facing a power crisis due to inadequate capacity, old, unreliable, and efficient plants. This is aggravated by the depleting Malampaya gas reserves and the Russia-Ukraine war, which is causing tight fuel supply and high prices. Power shortages and high power prices will slow economic growth and job creation. What can be done? The business sector and government should seamlessly coordinate projects for renewable energy facilities. Renewable energy plants can be set up much shorter than thermal plants and are already very competitive relative to the, the traditional fuel for power plants. Recently, 100% foreign ownership is now allowed in the renewable energy sector. Second is to align and harmonize the various institutions or agencies involved in power. The DOE, the ERC, NGCP, uh, Transco, they all need to be harmonized. Someone needs to be um, orchestrating how the policies should be actually uh, identified and the priorities so that there is a, to facilitate the provision of power and lower the cost of power. The next is institutionalize the Energy Investment Coordinating Council and operationalize the Energy Virtual One-Stop Shop Law, which will allow projects of national importance to be fast-tracked. While there are many more areas that need to be addressed, MBC believes that education, sectoral reforms I mentioned, and the business environment are most important to attract more investments that will create more jobs and in turn achieve greater prosperity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Edgar Chua. Indeed, one of the best investments our government can do uh, is invest on the Filipino workforce. So moving on to our next uh, speaker, he will be discussing positioning businesses as proactive catalysts of growth and development. Mr. George Barcelon is the president of the Philippine Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the largest business organization in the country. He sits on the board of BDO Unibank Incorporated and represents the private sector in the Industry Development Council and National Competitive Council. He also serves as the president of Integrated Computer Systems Incorporated and Paramount Vinyl Products and Interpolymer Corporation. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. George Barcelon.
I'd like to greet Secretary Alberto de Rosario, whom I haven't seen for quite some time. It's so nice to see him here uh, face to face. And of course, to the panelists uh, who will be speaking and my friends, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you, Dindo, for inviting me to share some of my th thoughts in the uh, business organization. Sustaining the Philippines growth momentum amidst the various fiscal challenges and global uncertainty is indeed a very timely and apt theme of this plenary this morning. I say this as we continue to confront the various headwinds and volatilities that has been mentioned earlier by Mr. Bauer, the war in Ukraine, food crisis, climate change, global slowdown in economic growth. Now more than ever arises the need for government and the private sector to work together and craft the necessary policies and interventions to ensure that we utilize the best available fiscal, monetary and industrial and trade policies to continue the flow of trade and investments in our economy. I just came back well, last week uh, from two trips, one in, in Cambodia for the ASEAN, ASEAN Business Investment Summit, known as ABIS. And after that, to the APEC meeting in Thailand, of which uh, both events President BBM attended. <clears throat> Discussion abound on how ASEAN can chart various pathways and find consensus on the present concern that we need to face heads on. From the various flash points and discussion, we saw a common thread. How do we develop economic and social resiliency to counter the negative effects of climate change, spikes in energy prices, dislocated supply chain, and so on? How do we effectively utilize the various policies, as I mentioned earlier, to continue to sustain the growth in our economy? This is where the business community can, be, can contribute as a proactive catalyst of growth and development. With the unceasing pursuit of innovations in products and services, and by continuing to improve our business processes, we contribute not only to the employment of our, of our population, but also in increasing the overall productivity, competitiveness, which impact our country's economic performance. But we cannot do it alone. We need the expertise and research development specialization of our friends from the academe and the provisions of a business-friendly environment that our partners from the government can provide. As Secretary Diogno earlier, detail that the laws have been changed to really benefit more investments. And my friend, MBC Chair, Mr. Echua, has very eloquently pointed out the gaps in our education, which must be attended. We need to strengthen collaboration between government and private sector to reach our economic target. I'd like to mention also during the trip of uh, President BBM to the UNGA, uh, wherein uh, there were meetings that was organized to talk with the, uh, to speak with the top business captains in the US. And uh, there was a very positive response. Um, our, the key players here in our BPO, we're all very optimistic. And they projected the growth for the next five years, almost double to what they are generating in revenue. Our BPO, our IT BPM sectors now generate about almost $30 billion. So if they're talking about doubling it, that's quite a hefty sum. Yeah. And aside from that, other sectors such as uh, the president of Coca-Cola, Philippines, joined also the, uh, the discussion. And he was very optimistic. He projected in the next five years, 
they would be investing tens of billions in our country. I guess we have reasons to be optimistic in the Philippines. We have a young population of which all of us are aware of, while other countries, even our ASEAN neighbors, like Thailand, their average age is inching towards 40 years old. Japan is inching beyond 50 years old. China is pretty close to 40 years old in Malaysia. The only two countries in ASEAN is Indonesia and the Philippines, where we average about 25 years old. So this is really an upside for the Philippines. And yesterday I, was, I had a meeting with the uh, European Chamber of Commerce uh, president, Mr. Lar Wittig, who's here this morning. And we had a lengthy discussion about really the uh, Europeans should really look into the Philippines for investment. I don't need to add any further uh, about the AIDS gap, but Europe is pretty much double our average age. So you can imagine how we can really take advantage of that. So in this aspect of uh, the president, uh, Ferdinand Romualdez uh, Marcos Jr. during his visit, he's really reaching out, making businessmen in, in the US and also in the ASEAN region aware that we are ready for investments. And anecdotally, I used to say, in the many decades, in the many administration in the past, We've always been advocating for more direct investments. And true, we are in the radar, the past administrations. But the thing is, our runway was not ready. And many of the planes were diverted to other countries. I don't have to mention about how Vietnam has been one of the attracting, uh, well, the attracting uh, many foreign investment that came out of China. So we are, we should be ready, work together, and hope that this time we would really get more investments from abroad, which is important for us to generate more jobs. And that is uh, something that uh, we have been advocating in the sense that uh, we need to go up the value chain. And in my discussion with many of the other, many of the chambers, foreign chambers, we feel that we can work together targeting specific industry. Sometimes we use a shotgun approach, which is not very effective. And uh, one of the visitors who came with uh, Mr. Wittig is with big company, Boss. And I said, why don't you really look into the Philippines wherein we can work with Dole on the training and upskilling of workers so that when you come, you will not feel that there's a lack of skill sets for the kind of jobs. So I'm, I'm, uh, I just saw the sign there, I have only three minutes to go. So I'll just share with you, you know, some of the resolutions that we just, we just had our Philippine Business Conference last month. So I'd like to share the resolutions that we presented to President BBM. And this touches all aspects of our, the business sector. On the food security, our resolution is urging the national government to achieve food security by amending the agrarian reform law to increase the land retention limit from five to 24 hectares. Our productivity in agriculture is very low because of the limited land that they're tilling on, which is one and a half hectare, mostly on the average. Of course, the law limits it to five hectares. Implement a debt condemnation program for un unpaid amortization of agrarian reform beneficiary and convert certificates of land ownership awards into simple titles. Second on the health issue, resolution urging the national government to reform field health into a science-based and transparent healthcare system and encourage public-private partnership in the implementation of the universal 
health law. Employment, I think uh, my friend Ed pretty much covered it. Both employment and education are something that we in the business sector is really concerned. Digitalization, urging the national government to develop and implement nationwide internet connectivity that is reliable and competitive. We now have three players, well, two and a half players in the IT. I hope that, uh, and, and the secretary of the ICT, attorney Ivan, we is open to this. Small countries like Israel and Singapore, they have four or five telco players. We have a population of 110 million and we are ar archipelagic. I think we can, and the secretary feels that we can accommodate at least five or six players in this sector. Environment and climate change, urging national government to address both of these issues by developing PPP and to establish world-class water and waste management infrastructure. One of the overarching advocacy of PCCI is reach out. I will just concentrate on the first R. R is to reinvigorate our resource-based sector. Meaning to say, mining, responsible mining should be, should be looked into. Planting of trees, rubber trees, bamboo, salt harvesting. Those are all resource-based that we have overlooked in the past decade. Power was also touched on by, Mr., uh, by Ed Chua. Transportation. We urge the national government to provide world-class integrated transport system and decouple the regulatory commercial function and Philippine Port Authority. One other area that I've spoken this lengthily to Secretary uh, Jamie Bautista is that we should operate our port and customs 24 by seven so that the smooth flow of goods coming in and going out will help decongest our port and also indirectly help the traffic. If you have big trucks, container, using our traffic 24 hours, that will come in, that will be very helpful in the congestions. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for taking, for being patient and listening to, for, for my sharing some of the rest of the PCCI. Maraming salamat po, thank you. Thank you very much again, Mr. George Barcelon. Indeed, we are ready for investments. And like Mr. Barcelon, we also hope that uh, no flights will no longer be diverted to other countries in the next six years. Uh, maybe we can learn from our next speaker who will be discussing strengthening government and private sector collaboration to attain economic dynamism. Mr. Rogelio Babe Singson is the president of the Management Association of the Philippines. He is also the president and CEO of Metro Pacific Water and the director of Laguna Water District Aquatech Resources Corporation, Ecosystem Technologies International, and Manila Water Consortium. He previously served as the Secretary of the Department of Public Works and Highways from 2010 to 2016, where he led the Good Governance and Anti-Corruption Program and the implementation of major infrastructure projects across the country. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Rogelio Babes Singson. Thank you very much. And uh, Secretary Albert, uh, my good friend, uh, former colleague in the cabinet, uh, well, Secretary Ben Jokna, unfortunately, had to leave. Uh, Secretary Ben Jokna and I go a long way uh, during the time of Titakori. Of course, our good friend, Strat Base uh, ADR uh, Institute President, Dean Domanhit, distinguished panel speakers, ladies and gentlemen, a pleasant good morning to everyone. I was asked to share the views of uh, MAP board on how to strengthen public and private sector collaboration to achieve economic dynamism. My own insights on public private sector collaboration will be based on my long experience having worked on both sides, 
both the public and the private sector, starting with the BOT law, all the way to the current PPP development projects. Just to mention some of these projects, uh, even the Heritage Memorial Park, I was very much involved there, the Fort Bonifacio Development Global City, uh, military basis conversions, uh, SBMA, Clark, of course, my good friend Vince Deason is here, uh, water concessions, uh, toll roads, among others. I will also briefly mention what MAP proposed to the administration of President BBM as the eight priority areas for economic dynamism. I will flash on the screen uh, the major policy directions, uh, policy concerns. Can we have the, okay. To achieve and create an atmosphere of trust between public sector and private sector, we propose to NEDA Secretary, uh, Arshi Balisakan, PPP Center, and some cabinet secretaries to address these specific policy concerns for public and private sector collaboration to work well. First is to clearly define the purpose and objectives of the different PPP projects and privatization projects of government. It's not, ladies and gentlemen, one size fits all. Is the PPP project a fundraising project for government, like the disposition of government shares, to mention a few, Petron, Pal, Malampaya, or are these the development, for example, of airports, toll roads, or is the objective to let the private sector provide a public service or a public good using private sector technical financial capabilities and giving the benefit to the public users of the facility? These are two privatization models having different opposing objectives. Mixing the objectives may not be a good proposition. In fact, some PP toll road projects undertaken by government which I did not fully agree was to give the PPP project to the bidder that submitted the highest front end concession fee instead of awarding to the bidder that offered the lowest user fee. Those are very opposing uh, objectives. But as a general rule in privatization, I would leave the private, I would live with the private sector the operations and maintenance of public infrastructure like toll roads, transport infrastructure, rails, airports, and seaports, and public utilities like electricity and water. I say this because of the very restrictive government procurement rules and regulations, which practically prevents even well-meaning government officials from being able to do a good job. To cite a few examples, award always to the lowest priced equipment and supplies. No value for money proposition. Budgetary constraints, which is on a yearly basis and therefore procurement will not be on economies of scale, but you have to buy based on what is budgeted. Limited allowable emergency purchases, limited allowable overtime, and a long list of restrictions. Third is to provide an atmosphere supported by policies to create a level playing field and respect the rights of both the public and the private sector. Sometimes we forget in the public private sector that public officials also have a responsibility. They also don't want to go to jail. <laughs> in short, both sectors must fully understand the technical, commercial, and legal aspects of the PPP projects particularly the risk sharing arrangement and what is referred to as the MAGA or material adverse conditions of the contract. More often than not, many of the delays in PPP projects are due to delays in the delivery of government responsibility, particularly in the delivery of right of way in toll roads, power, water supply, and the like. Number four, clearly define the roles and responsibilities of the various government institutions involved in the review and approval processes for PPP projects. This was mentioned earlier. Oftentimes, the delay could in fact be between government national agencies. And now add to that between national agencies and the local government units. 
So getting a PPP project underway could take several years because of the long, tedious process. One concrete recommendation we made to both NEDA and the PPP Center was to increase the threshold amounts of investments in projects to avoid ne needing several layers of reviews and appro final approval that will have to go all the way to the NEDA board. Fifth, respect government contracts entered into in the past and in future contracts with the private sector. Often the habitual review of contracts entered into by previous administrations even after an arbitral court ruling. Number six, create joint public-private sector advisory council for specific areas. I think this was mentioned earlier, could be on agriculture, trade and investment, energy, water sector. The reason for that is that we want a project before it is finally issued and bidded out that at least the terms of reference has been discussed with potential investors. There has to be a market sounding. You don't issue a TOR without even knowing whether there will be investors or not. As I mentioned, last July 2022, MAP proposed eight priority areas for the President BBM's administration to achieve economic dynamism. Due to time constraints, I'll just highlight some of this where the public and private sector collaboration and support is necessary. As mentioned, we indeed have an education crisis. One of the, some of the concrete recommendations where there is enough support from the private sector is to mobilize the second education commission and create the multi-sectoral advisory council to develop a clear roadmap out of the learning crisis. Also mentioned was, was tech, uh, teacher upscaling. And the third one was to make sure that uh, we harness the industry associations like large corporations to provide inputs and supervision in the curriculum and method of instructions in K-12 uh, tracks. In the healthcare, this is uh, to ensure that in upgrade the public health system by investing in technology enabled management systems and outsource to the private sector certain functions. Scaling, scaling up, this was mentioned earlier by Ed Chua, to, to combat hunger, malnutrition, and child stunting to address long term effects of malnutrition in the grade schools. In the area of agriculture and agribusiness, it was mentioned earlier to lift the farm consolidation. In other words, lift the land reform, uh, land limits or ownership ceilings so that you have economies of scale in farming. Another area that was recommended was to improve the food value and supply chain through upgraded transport and logistics facilities, including cold storage and cold chain facilities, which the private sector can easily handle. Shared facilities, uh, we said that uh, we recommended that to expand DTI's program to provide shared service facilities like uh, processing, uh, cold storage, as mentioned earlier, to ensure that small producers are able to provide good quality outputs. Now, in the area of trade and industry, we have to ensure trade and industry policy environment that fosters level competition, lowers cost of doing business and encourages productivity enhancing innovation. The important aspect here is lowering the cost of doing business. Among the specific recommendations that we have made is to immediately ratify and actively participate in the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership or the RCEP agreement. Of course, uh, we were suggesting with the former MAP president himself, DTI Secretary uh, Fred Pasquale, to uh, encourage support for export trust and industry roadmaps together with the private sector. In the area of infrastructure, we need to pursue 
continued support to public-private partnerships in infrastructure development. And here, I'll just name them, as mentioned earlier, energy development. This is very important. Digital transformation, water adequacy and security. Let me emphasize, if people don't realize we have a water crisis, where have you been? No, we have a water crisis. Of course, attractive PPP policy environment to make sure that we update the rules and uh, legislation on encouraging more private sector participation. Let me emphasize, finally, in terms of the trade and industry, commitment to sanctity of contracts. In terms of the labor market and employment policies, this was already mentioned, to make sure that people understand or government understands that labor market and employment policies are critical ingredient in, the, in enabling environment for investments, as well to, as to encourage human capital development, especially outside of the capital centers. Regional has to be encouraged. In terms of fiscal and financial policies, they must be supportive of business enterprises, especially MSMEs to promote wider job generation. Here we also propose to review the tax regime for micro and small enterprises to help their viability and thereby expand the tax base and employment generation. We feel that there's too much regulatory happening and red tape for small and micro enterprises. We also did mention that there has to be adequate small farm and small business financing available. Finally, on the, in the area of justice and rule of law, justice and rule of law must always up, be upheld if business confidence is to be sustained. Here we are referring to government transparency and good governance, zero tolerance for corruption and restore faith in our institutions, particularly those that directly interface with the public, BIR, LTO, MMDA, NBI, PNP, among others. So with that, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to share our views on how to strengthen public and private sector collaboration to attain economic dynamism. Good morning to everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary Singh Son, for that very insightful discussion and very interesting uh, recommendations. We do hope that the government is listening because they can really learn a lot from that presentation. Um, and more on public-private partnerships. Uh, our next speaker will be discussing expanding infrastructure investments through public-private partnerships. Mr. Vivencio Vince Dizon is the former presidential advisor on flagship programs and projects and was previously president and CEO of the Basis Conversion and Development Authority, where he became a key figure in the government's Build, Build, Build infrastructure program. Prior to these, he was a consultant of then Senator Alan Peter Cayetano, Under Secretary for Political Affairs of the Office of the President and Chief of Staff of the Office of then Senator Edgardo Angara. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Vince Dizon. Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, to my uh, professor, Uh, Sir Dins, thank you very much for having me. Uh, to uh, Secretary Albert, sir, so nice to see you well and healthy. You look really good, sir. Uh, of course, to Secretary Babe Singson and uh, everybody here. Uh, I also saw my former boss, uh, former uh, political affairs advisor of President Aquino, Secretary Ronald Yamas, I think he's hiding somewhere. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here today uh, amongst uh, our partners in the private sector. Before I begin this brief uh, presentation, um, I just wanted to say that I think 
one of the most important things that President Marcos has said uh, during the last four months is when he said that the best kind of governance is the governance that gets things done. I think that's the most important thing that resonated, especially in, in, in the private sector and across the country. Because I think that bottom line, that is really the role of government. The role of government is to get things done and to get things moving. And when uh, Secretary Jokno, myself, Secretary Sani Dominguez, Secretary Tugade, Secretary Villar um, started the Duterte administration with a very bold and uh, I think unprecedented program of building up our country's infrastructure after decades of neglect, uh, that was what we had in mind. Um, of course, things always don't work out as planned. Uh, nobody planned for 2020. Nobody planned for the uh, problems in Europe. But I think bottom line, if governments continue to have the mindset of getting things done, then I think we're, we're going to be in a good place years, years for moving forward. And uh, it reminded me of a forum such as this during the early part of the Duterte administration where I quoted a, um, a Indian proverb which simply said, dogs bark, but the caravan moves on. And I think, you know, in, in, the, in, in an age of social media, in an age of so much noise, I think what government really has to do together with the private sector is just cover your ears, focus on one direction and just get things done. So with that, um, Build, Build, Build uh, really started with a vision. It started with a vision to leave behind decades of neglect of public and public infrastructure and really usher in as it was DBM Secretary coined golden age of Philippine infrastructure. And I think um, we were able to start that significantly from uh, an average of roughly about 3% of GDP, uh, the Duterte administration throughout its six years almost doubled that to six, oh, sorry, uh, more than doubled that to 6.3% of GDP infrastructure spending in 2022, despite COVID and despite all the problems that we faced during the last two years of the Duterte administration. But like I said, like what we said six years ago, and what I will say today, six years is far from being enough. Even two administrations, 12 years is not enough. We need at least 30 years of continuous focus and investment in infrastructure to achieve what our neighbors throughout the region and throughout the, and all other uh, developed countries in the world have achieved. And this is just a snapshot of, um, uh, the infrastructure flagship program during our time, which was uh, significantly passed on to the administration of President Marcos, 4.6 trillion pesos of projects. Now, amongst uh, that um, are, is uh, roughly um, 1.7 1. Seven plus trillion pesos in PPP projects. If you ask me, that might have not been enough uh, during the Duterte administration, but it was a very different time. 2016 uh, was very different uh, from the economic challenges that we face today. In 2016, our debt to GDP ratio was uh, 40%, now it's 60%. In 2016, there was so much. Uh, domestic and foreign liquidity available, interest rates were very low, inflation was low. Uh, so government could uh, do a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of infrastructure spending. But today, very different. Um, and I see Professor Romy Bernardo here. I remember, sir, when FEF visited Clark uh, and we were talking about that, and I, I know you had many discussions with Secretary Dominguez at that time. But I think now, is the right time really to push PPPs. It is the time 
where government needs the public sector the most. And I think uh, the president and the team led by the economic team led by Secretary Giocno has really acted very swiftly, first of all, by revising the BOT, implementing rules and regulations to make them more PPP friendly. Uh, uh, Sir Romy is very happy and smiling because I know his vital role in trying to push that. Um, but I think what is most important is the power that PPPs can unleash in infrastructure. And we saw it. No, um, and I'll give two examples. No, and uh, uh, I'm very proud of this particular project. Uh, this was the only PPP project during the Duterte administration that was completed before the end of the administration. From start to finish, po, uh, talagang pinaspasan natin ang uh, construction ng Clark International Airport. It was a hybrid PPP where uh, the government invested roughly about 12 billion pesos for the construction of the, of the structure, and the ONM was bidded out uh, shortly thereafter and awarded. And now Clark International Airport is fully operational. And I mean, if, if, for those of you who have not yet had the chance to fly out of Clark, believe me, it's a, it's a breath of fresh air. Napakaganda po, napakaluwag, napakamaliwagas, very modern. And of course, it's very well run because it is run by the private sector. It's run by a consortium uh, involving Philinvest, JG Summit, and of course, the operator of the top airport in the world, Changi Airports Group of Singapore. So you really cannot go wrong. If you have an airport run uh, in partnership with uh, the group that runs Changi, I think uh, there is no doubt that it will be a very well-run airport. And, uh, and, and apart from that, we're also very proud because it also showcased Filipino talent in design. Uh, I think uh, it's the first public building in the Philippines that was ever nominated in the pre-Versailles uh, Architectural Awards. It didn't win, but it was the, one of the three airports nominated uh, in pre-Versailles 2021. Um, and I think that's another thing that the private sector brings to the table when it does infrastructure. It's not constrained, as uh, Sec. Babes mentioned earlier. Hindi po sa gobyerno po kasi may uh, may COA, may uh, may kung ano anong regulasyon na hindi mo pwedeng gawin ito, hindi mo pwedeng gawin yan. No, but with the private sector, you can really build iconic structures like. Clark International Airport, like Cebu Mactan Airport, no, like the beautiful um, uh, CCX Bridge in Cebu. Uh, kung gobyerno po yan, hindi po magagawa ng ganun yun. No? Totoo po yan. And, and, and gagging po ako sa gobyerno. I came from government and I can tell you that government will not be able, given all the constraints that it has, kung si Sec. Babes po ang gumawa, no, baka nakasuwan pa siya noon, kahit na napakaganda nung nung bridge na yon. No? So that is really the importance and the value that the private sector brings. Apart from the speed at which we can construct, Clark International Airport broke ground in 2018. The shell was completed less than two years after. And in 2021, after three years, it was open. Three years po, tapos po yan. But I can tell you that without the private sector, we would not have been able to do it. And ayan po, no, napakaganda po ng airport. Pandemic proof pa po yan because of the innovations of, of Changi Airport's group. Um, uh, one of the advantages of finishing this airport during the pandemic in 2020 and 2021, we were able to leverage on the technologies that our foreign partners had uh, and were implementing in, in Singapore at that time. So the other one, and again, uh, this is very important to mention, is Wawa Dam. Alam niyo po, um, the last time a dam for Metro Manila water supply was built before Wawa was in the 1960s, Angat Dam. That was the last time, decades upon decades on decades, government did not build a new dam. And in, um, when I was um, 
presidential advisor and flagship projects, we had two major, um, we had one major um, uh, government led project for water supply in Metro Manila, Kaliwa Dam, the very controversial, controversial Kaliwa Dam, uh, funded by Chinese ODA. A lot of opposition, a lot of problems, but the president said, let's just get it done. And it's under construction right now. But I was told, um, and, and I was the one who presented this to the NEDA ICC, that there was a project, private sector led, called WAWA, a uh, joint venture between the Vilago group and the group of Mr. Razon to provide initially 80 MLD to, uh, to, uh, to Metro Manila and then ramping up to about 300, 500 MLD. So I asked Secretary Dominguez, can we include it in the, in the, in the, in the infrastructure flag GPS? And, and he said, okay, let's do it. And lo and behold, after being included in the, in the infrastructure flagship list, and because of that, you have certain benefits. No, you, 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 permitting is faster. You get to skip some of uh, the some of the steps, or you 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 get to start construction despite things being still under process. Lo and behold, Wawa Dam is now completed. Tapos na po, and it is ready to provide water to Metro Manila. This started in 2019, despite the pandemic. In only two and a half years. Wawa Dam is completed. The first dam uh, for water supply in Metro Manila completed since Angat. So again, you see the power of private sector partnerships. And I, I, I've been signaled to wrap up, but just to show you some pictures, I just wanted to show you other projects that are shovel ready, ready for the new administration to implement immediately. Airports. We have all these airports, regional airports. Alam niyo po, napakatagal na ito. Alam ko po, time pa po ni GMA pinaplanong i-rehabilitate ang ating mga regional airports. No, Unfortunately, uh, ang natapos lang po dito, yung Panglao. No, it's a beautiful airport built um, uh, built by uh, government but now needs needs a desperately needs a private sector operator. Yan po lahat yan, ripe for the picking, ready to go immediately. Ports, Igo Igo Port. In Dumangas, very important. There's a current unsolicited proposal by ICTSI for this. Uh, Gemsan Port, very, very important port. No, kailangan na pong rehabilitate. Ready na po yan. Uh, ika nga, sabi nga po, I remember in one of the meetings with the private sector, si Mr. Rason po, sabi po niya, pirma lang ang katapat niyan eh. Pirma lang, kailangan ng pirma ng gobyerno. Go na. Davao sa support. Commuter railways, napakadami po niyan. This is already underway um, with the JICA funding and ADB funding. Uh, if you go to Malolos now and MacArthur Highway, you can already see this was the old North Rail uh, uh, alignment that leads all the way to Clark from Laguna. That's already underway. Manila to Bicol. Again, I think the detailed engineering designs of this are already done, ready to go. Um, You've got an unsolicited proposal to build a SkyTrain from um, Makati to BGC. Uh, I think this is from Alliance Global, from um, the group of Mr. Andrew Tan. You've got the MRT-10, uh, C the C5 MRT connecting to MRT-7. You've got MRT-11. Uh, you've got LRT-6. This will connect from the current LRT-1 extension all the way to, to Cavite. You have, you have a proposal, you know, I mean, there's, there, I think there's only one area in the Philippines that has worse traffic than Metro Manila, and that's Cebu. No, but they desperately need mass transit. Cebu monorail, ready na rin po yan to go. Highways, napakadami po, agam po ni Sec Babes yan. Yung, uh, ito po, napakaigsi na rin po nito, no? yung for Metro Pacific, yung link, natapos na po yung uh, harbor link, kailangan na lang extend all the way to Anda Circle, but I'm told that there is even a plan of Metro Pacific to, to have an alignment along uh, the shores of Manila Bay all the way to connect to Cavitex. Can you imagine if we had a, a highway connecting NLEX all the way to Cavitex? And the plan is already there by Metro Pacific. Again, pirma lang po ang katapat niyan. Kailangan lang pong i-approve ng gobyerno. Go na po yan. You have the TPX extension. Now it's already up to Rosario. So that's why 
Everybody can enjoy Baguio in three and a half hours because of, because of SCTEX and TPLX. But the, the vision is really to extend that all the way to San Fernando La Union, all the way to Poro Point, you know, which is a major port. Um, Cavitex, ito po, uh, importante din po yan to the south. Ang south po, naiwan ng, ng ano, ang, ang dami na yung mga naunahan na po ng mga industrial parks doon at developments doon, kurang sa highway. Um, and I can just go on and on. No? But um, bridges, you have the Davao Samal Bridge, which is already underway. Um, and this one is really going to be a game changer. This is a, this is a bridge stretching along, across Manila Bay, from Cavite all the way to Bataan. The Bataan Cavite Link Bridge. This is already, I think the detailed engineering of this is already done, set babes. Um, and again, ready to go. No, so um, and of course you have the Panay Gimaras Negros Bridge in the Visayas. No? So and dami putaga. No? Kung titignan po natin yung mga picture na paka exciting po. Ano? Pero kailangan ng putaga execution. We just have to get it get things done. Uh, we tried our best during the past administration, but I think what this administration has right now is really a very deep and very rich um, uh, pipeline of projects. These are just some of the examples. There are 100 flagship projects right now that are ready to go. And I think um, all we have to do is execute and just uh, build better more as I think is the clarion call now of the uh, BBM administration and with Secretary Jokno, um, Secretary Bonoan, Secretary Bautista, Secretary Pangandaman, with the entire economy, economic team led, of course, by our president, I think there's no reason why all these things uh, cannot get done very, very soon for the benefit of all Filipinos. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Vince Dizon. And very interesting presentation and very exciting shovel-ready projects. Um, I'm sure many of us guests here in the Yala Museum have uh, questions for our panelists. So we would like to call them back again on stage for the open forum uh, segment of our panel for today. And uh, yes, joining us today in the panel also is... Uh, Honorable Maria Shello Magno. She is the Undersecretary for the Fiscal Policy and Monitoring Group of the Department of Finance. She is also the focal person and chair of the Philippine Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. She was an associate professor at the University of the Philippines School of Economics and represented civil society in the International Board of the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative. Her research areas of focus are on taxation, natural resource governance, regulation, and civic space. Uh, Yusek? And also aside from music, we would also like to call on um, Mr. Vince Dizons, Mr. George Barcelon, Mr. Babes Singson again, and Mr. Edgar Chua back on the stage for the open forum. And to moderate our open forum for this morning, Advert advertisements and campaigns and promotions of the media network. He was also the special projects manager from 19... analysts in one table i only see them through zoom when i interview them and it, it's just about 10 to 15 minutes i was with them for for more than an hour talking to them um let, let me begin with the questions
growth and onward to new beginnings. But uh, allow me to just maybe take a couple of steps back. It was during the second year of the pandemic, if I'm not mistaken, when uh, that we kept on hearing then presidential uh, advisor Joey Concepcion saying that the economy cannot afford another lockdown. And he kept on repeating that in all of our interviews. Now, from, from the time that the country itself was somehow uh, quarantined and isolated, what were the, the lessons that the government learned? And what is the government actually planning now to quickly recover from a similar scenario? Maybe not, not another pandemic, but in a situation where almost business activities were, were halted, were stopped, and mobility uh, was restricted. And I ask that because I'm interested to know how fast the government can, um, can act and can get the economy back up again, and then talk about sustaining growth again uh, as soon as possible. Yeah, I actually find it very ironic that I'm now the spokesperson of the government. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> I think questions would have been easily answered three months ago when I was part of the Academic and Civil Society. And the, the uh, experience of the fellows with me here as part of a government, actually have more experience combined than me. But just speaking um, now as an undersecretary of the Department of Finance, combining it with my experience from the academia and civil society, I think one of the most important uh, lessons that we learned during the pandemic is that governance has to be data-driven. And I think that has to trickle down, not, that, not just at the national level, but at the local government level. We can see that the most effective approach at that time when we had the pandemic is when local governments can quickly respond to the challenge at that moment. So we can, we can avoid a situation where we need to lock down the whole Metro Manila. Imagine if we're data-driven, we can identify areas that we need to close down without affecting the whole community, the whole town. So I think that's very important right now. Uh, we have existing policies that already empower local governments to improve their data management, hiring statisticians, so that... Uh, policies at the local level can also be data driven. Um, I think we also realize the importance of being uh, of giving the government the flexibility to acquire um, quick response uh, solution like for example the acquisition of vaccine. So you have to continue educating the public on the importance of public health, uh, quick response to that and giving the government the ability to uh, quickly um, implement those programs without the hindrance of the bureaucratic inefficiency. I think those two elements so far are very important to, to give us that flexibility. Okay, just another more question uh, for, for the government. By, by a lot of indications, of course, it's global headwinds it's affecting uh, our economy, putting a drag on our growth. But are, are there still any other creeping roadblocks ahead in in in, in dragging uh, our momentum, uh, maybe just peeping its head now, but could be a possible threat in disrupting the growth momentum again in the near future. Maybe, uh, maybe including climate change and how we are uh, a vulnerable country to extreme weather patterns. How is the government and what is the government uh, financially planning for, for its effect uh, in the country and uh, on the economy? Yeah. So, for example, what you mentioned climate change, I think some of the hindrances and challenges that we're going to experience in the next months have already been mentioned and was also presented yeah. when Secretary Jokno delivered his speech. But, for example, from my portfolio, I was just given the portfolio to chair the technical committee of the uh, Fiscal Incentives Review Board. We are now currently looking at the, how we looked at the cost-benefit analysis that we apply to uh, the private sector when they apply for incentives. Um, in the initial list, we only have the, the fiscal cost, we have the fiscal benefit, we have the economic benefit outcomes and externalities. And we are currently reviewing that because I personally think companies should not be penalized just because there's negative externality. I think it's more important for us to ask the companies what mitigating um, strategies are they going to apply to address the externalities that they're going to produce. And aside from just asking what mitigation strategies, I think it's very important to now shift the way we look at how businesses are operated. So it's not just about the externalities in terms of production, but also how they're influencing, how they're mitigating, how they're contributing to reduce the impact of their business operation on the mm -hmm climate effect in, in the community. So this one is what we are currently exploring right now in terms of how we evaluate companies as they apply for incentives. 
Okay, thank you very much for that, Yusek Magno. Let's go on to our businessmen, uh, Mr. Barcelon and uh, Mr. Babe Singson. Uh, unfortunately, Mr. Uh, Edsu will not be able to join us uh, for this talk. But uh, Mr. Barcelon, I, I, I remember asking Mr. Singson about this. Uh, I think it was during the State of the Nation address. But is the private sector still able to help with the government's uh, PPPs, given that it, it it's still supposed to be reeling from the effects of the pandemic uh, and also facing challenges themselves. Um, how much can the private sector help? If you look at what happened to us during the COVID, I think the private sector played a very key role with all the unwarranted lockdown, the supply chain on the essentials was not hindered. It was all private sectors moving behind it. And I think it's very important that uh, for us, uh, focusing on the uh, MSMEs, uh, which was uh, discussed uh, by uh, Mr. Ed and also Babes yeah. on the financial needs. And uh, uh, many of the small ones are unbankable based on the tedious uh, requirement uh, imposed by BSP. Okay? As uh, was mentioned earlier that I'm an independent director of BDO and I, ask very often why do they why do they have to be asked to sign so many papers because it's bsp requirement okay. so having said that uh we have to really nurture the msmes because the majority of our institutions our establishment are 99 percent in that sector but having said that it's more important for us to have uh manufacturing big scale in a way, because the MSME, when you think about it, they are part of the supply chain. Many of the MSMEs are supplying to the needs of the uh, income bracket, D, C, and D, okay? But a lot of them are also part of the supply chain of the big companies. So, you know, talking about uh, MSME sometimes, we need to focus on the movers. And these are the big companies, the big manufacturing outfits that we can attract. If you go to Vietnam, you can see the, the um, uh, activities on the streets, okay? Why? Because there are many investors there, electronic, garments, whatever. So those are the moving force behind. So I would like, I hope that the government uh, can really make sense of uh, of uh, promoting more businesses from outside and when this would cascade down to developing our MSMEs. And the other thing that I'd like really to stress is the local, the, the role of the local government. You know, the, our costs, even the agricultural sector, is because of the various unnecessary costs through the whole supply chain, in the logistic, in the transportation, going through a, going through a barrio, misreading road tax or whatever. And I tell you, this this thing, I was talking to Mr. Uh, Boitis when we were in, uh, in uh, Thailand. I said, I know President BBM is in charge of agriculture. We cannot increase output overnight. We can reduce the cost of the logistic in transporting agri products. And I hope that uh, they will really seriously look into that. And I've mentioned to Secretary uh, uh, Benher, I said, uh, you know, uh, Secretary, we should have a meeting with the LGUs. So that among yourself, you come up with what is best practices. Okay? And that will influence the whole set of uh, local government. And one of the criteria, every year we have, uh, we, we, we vet most, most friendly provinces, municipalities, and now we're including job creation. And I think that's very important. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Just following up on that, uh, Mr. Singson, uh, with the MSMEs being mentioned, we've, we've heard the president, of course, vowing full support for the sector, uh, uh, which makes up more than 90% of all the businesses in the country. Have we been feeling that support? Have we been seeing that support? And um, do you know of a concrete plan in fully supporting the MSMEs? 
we're, we're happy that uh, Secretary Fred Pascual is there in DTI because uh, in our discussions prior to his uh, assumption as DTI Secretary, we were already talking about uh, the tax regime imposed on small and medium businesses. It's the same whether you're small or big, you go through the same practically process. And we said, why don't you let them survive uh, reduce the regulations, reduce, let them flourish first before you impose all of these restrictions. No? So it's as direct as that, that we recommended. And, and we said, you're there. Uh, you cannot, as mentioned by Mr. Barcelon, the small and medium enterprises really support the whole supply chain that goes all the way to the big corporations. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, uh, as you mentioned, uh, employment at the community level starts with the small and medium enterprises. So I did mention ease of doing business and please not the cost of doing business. Those are <laughs> opposite because right now the main concern is the cost of doing business, not the ease of doing business. The second is really ensuring that they are provided some financing uh, from the banks, but uh, because of the tedious process of approvals, barangay captain can hold you hostage, mm. you know, uh, this cannot happen. This should not be happening. Thank you very much, Mr. Shigson. Mr. Dijon, um, one question for you. Uh, of course, we've seen the, uh, the, the projects lined up that have been completed and uh, are also in the pipeline. But they're pretty nice pictures to see. But at a time that the public is maybe more concerned about rising prices and the smaller amount of pay that they can keep in their pockets, how can you make them relate or understand how big infrastructure projects can make their situation better? Because that's a big part of our news, of course, uh, for, for ANC is... Uh, uh, talking about government, its projects, its uh, uh, the 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 PPPs, but it's not really a challenge. But we also have to make other viewers relate to how they can benefit immediately from from these projects. I, I know it's not going to be immediate, but how how can you make them understand that this will really benefit them? Yeah, you know, great question, Ron. I think you know. And I'll answer that by giving you an example. My personal experience no, as a commuter. You know, I, uh, in 2018, uh, my entire family relocated to Pampanga. Mm -hmm. no, um, we, we made that decision because, not only because of work, because of my work at BCD at that time, but we also wanted to just, you know, we couldn't stand the, you know, the, the city anymore, Metro Manila anymore. Um, and uh, I would do a daily commute no, to, to, to Manila. Uh, of course, BCD had its office in Clark. And it would take me, on a bad day, maybe three and a half, oh my God. four hours. But uh, in uh, late 2020, there's this beautiful infrastructure project that was completed, Skyway Stage 3. Mm -hmm. And now, it takes me an hour, 30 minutes. No, and then... That is a game changer, not just for me, but can you imagine for, you know, but, but can you imagine for other people who have to go to Bulacan, who have to go to, you know, who, who, have, to, who have to fly from uh, Pampanga, go to Naia, no, dere derecho, uh, in only an hour and a half. No, and, and I think infrastructure, um, is life changing. That's how I call it because it changed my life. Because now I've got, you know, uh, at least four hours more in a day that I can spend with my daughter back in Pampanga. And I, I, and I can speak for millions of people who do that commute. But think about it. What if we had a train from Clark all the way to? Makati, all the way to Taguig, all the way to uh, Paranaque. And it would only take 45 minutes. I mean, that 
changes everybody's lives. No, it, I mean, you know, it, it, it's something that uh, sadly we only experience abroad, but that's going to happen. It's, I mean, you see the, you see the work in uh, along MacArthur Highway from, uh, from Tutuban all the way to to Bulacan nearing Pampanga already. I see every day the work uh, being done uh, through ADB funding from Clark going down to to Malolo. So that is going to happen. Um, I think within the term of President Marcos, and, and and can you imagine what kind of changes that will provide to people who live in that corridor? No, and 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 I could go on and on. No, and 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 so I think you know, um, we really have to stop looking at infrastructure as just you know simple brick and mortar things that you see, you know, columns of cement. But, in reality, you know, for people who, who need public infrastructure because uh, they don't have the luxury of private vehicles, I think, you know, it's the best uh, legacy that any administration can, can leave behind. But, you know, it's, it's, it's really going to change lives for the better. So we just have to keep doing it. We just have to, you know, we can't stop. You know, it can't be... One administration does so much, the next administration, for whatever reason, mostly political reasons, stops. Mm -hmm. And then we got to start all over again. No. So, kailangan lang, si Sec Babes, just go, uh, decades of experience from time of President Cory. No? Uh, and he's seen what life-changing effects infrastructure can provide. So we just got to keep on doing it. And we can only do it faster if we do it with the private sector. That's something that I think is very, very important to understand. Okay, thanks for that. Um, Mr. Barcelona, I just want to go back to you. Uh, it's unfortunate, again, that Mr. Chu was not here and I was listening intently to uh, that part he was talking about education. And and you strongly agree with that as, as well as you, Mr. Singson. But I, I just forget which interview that was that I was listening to. The, the, the problem with the education system in the country is that it is too centralized. It's, it's uh, the, the national office which dictates uh, the curriculum for the whole country. And you were talking about the LGUs uh, a while ago being given more power to decide on uh, agriculture. How about for, for education? Do you think they, they, it, their constituents and their region would be better off if the local government units get a greater say on what courses and what curriculum will be taken in their regions to benefit their people and their region itself? Earlier, I mentioned that we had our uh, Philippine Business Conference National in October. But prior to that, we always have five area conference, business conference with North Luzon, South Luzon, NCR, Visayas, and Mindanao. So I went to all these places. I went to Tacloban, Olmoc, and then Tandag in the south. And, you know, one of the issues that was discussed was the Mandanas Garcia devolution of honor. Of course, they were excited initially because of it takes about a quarter of our GAA, right? Later on, when they do the pension pushing, they found out it very little. And then from the, what I took off from them is that they're asking the national government, the health and the education should still be borne by the national. The amount of money. Now, having said that, of course, they are, they want to have a, a active role in education. Here we have REC, you know, Regional Economic Council, but the education side is not so much stress. And I think they should be involved in that. And uh, during our conference, we invited Vice President Sara Duterte, uh, uh, Carpio, uh, and she's the head of education. So I asked her uh, privately, I said, uh, Madam President, uh, Vice President, how do you plan to collapse the two years that we missed out on the students? You're not going to, I mean, it would be very financially heavy on the government if you have to spend all these two years that were lost using the same curriculum. 
it would be better that you collapse it with some objectives in mind, when could be STEM, science, technology, math, and so that that would really get our young people up to speed rather than spending another two years. So education has to be, we have to be innovative. Uh, the, the example that I'd like to use is when I see my grandchildren play video games, no guidebooks, no nothing. They just play. And you know what I observed? They learn by mistakes. Yeah. And I'm just wondering whether there's kind of a digital platform that allow our young to learn by mistakes. Could be faster, digital. And uh, uh, I, I hope that the uh, Department of Education can be more innovative. Aside from uh, we need to have uh, better teachers, as mentioned uh, by uh, Secretary Bates, and uh, and uh, really, you know, maximize the budget that we have in the education. The education has the biggest chunk of our GAA, so almost eighteen percent. Okay, and uh, but based on the outcome of our international tests, the PISA and everything, it's quite yeah <laughs> concerning. And, uh, and and we can see that. I, I, I'm one of the ASEAN back and I, I go to Thailand, as uh, Vietnam, and of course the last trip was in, uh, in Cambodia. And I can see that, uh, you know, education plays a very key role for us to progress economically. Thank you. Mr. Shingsa. Yeah, just to add, and I'll be very candid about this statement. People will hate me saying this, no? but I will say it anyway. Uh, the danger of passing education to the LGU will aggravate the situation. We need international best practices for our educational system. Right now, what we're hearing from data is teachers at the local level are afraid to fail students because the mother is my sister, the mother is a neighbor, so they will come to me every time I start giving bad grades to that student so that they graduate grade school, high school with practically very little comprehension, no math, no science, precisely because of the situation. Now you want to aggravate that, bring it all the way to the mayor. Everybody will go to the mayor and complain, my child uh, failed and so and so. He was failed by my teacher who is my neighbor. Mm -hmm. That cannot happen. As I said, I'm going to make this categorical statement. Let's practice best practices, but don't aggravate the situation of, of what is now causing actually the deterioration in our education system. Can you give uh, specific examples of uh, best practices from, from other countries that we can uh, look at and maybe practice here? Higher standards for teacher skills. Okay. Uh, I don't know how our teachers are upscaling their skills. No. Uh, and of course, my practice then was a regional director of DPWH could not be assigned to the district where he comes from, because then he will be in a much bigger influence. He will be influenced by the politicians, by the mayors, the neighbors, the contractors who are who may be just in his locality. You know? So I avoid teachers. Of course, the situation is. Teachers go to, the, they can take transport, public transport, but that's a challenge. But again, let me emphasize the difficulty is at the local level. Teachers are afraid to fail students precisely because their parents will start going to their house and saying, why did you fail my son, my daughter? So that's the situation that's happening at the local level. Okay, unfortunately, I still have a lot of questions, but unfortunately, our time is up. We a question? National standardized testing. It's not up to the mother, it's not up to the teacher anymore. And this is the best practice, sir. No, I, 
I fully agree with you, gentlemen. National testing at different. I fully agree. Uh, national testing at specific areas: uh, grade school, high school, and even at the K twelve. I mentioned earlier that the business group should be aligned in terms of curriculum, uh, what skills are needed so that those who come out of K-12 are already employment ready. Mm -hmm. They cannot be left on their own because I'm, I'm afraid to say they might end up with, with general degrees, but not employable. Okay, thank you very much for answering that bonus question. We'd like to thank our panelists, Yusek Magno, Mr. Babe Singson, Mr. George Barcelon, Mr. Vince Dizon. Dizon, thank you very much for taking time to answer my questions. And uh, that wraps up uh, this panel. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Ron Cruz, Mr. George Barcelon, Yusek Shella Magno, and former secretaries Babe Singson and Vince Dizon. So we will be going on a lunch break from uh, what time is it? From 11 20 till 12 30. We will resume at 12.30 to discuss balancing recovery with progressive developments through global cooperation. So enjoy your lunch, everyone, and thank you for joining us this morning. You gotta put your past behind you. Look, baby.
Bad things happen, and you can't do anything about it, right? Wrong. When the world turns its back on you, you turn your back on them. That's not what I was told. And maybe you need a new lesson. Repeat after me. Hakuna Matata. What? Hakuna Matata.
can't wait in their affirmation. You can't wait in their approval. You can't wait in their support. Sometimes you just got to run and look behind you and say, everybody who wants to run, run. But I can't stop running because you're not running with me. Listen, listen to me, hear me. You can't stop chasing your dream just because somebody in your life won't chase you with you. You can't stop believing in yourself just because somebody in your life won't believe in you. You can't stop chasing the dreams of your life just because when you know when you do it, you're going to have to do it all by yourself.
you got to put your past behind you. Look, kid. Bad things happen, and you can't do anything about it, right? Wrong! When the world turns its back on you, you turn your back on them. That's not what I was told. And maybe you need to do less
Good afternoon. We will start our second panel in five minutes. Hope you're all enjoying your lunch.
Good afternoon, everyone. We will now start the second panel for today. If we can all um, go back to our seats, please. So our second panel is called uh, Balancing Recovery with Progressive Development Through Global Cooperation. To sustain economic growth and to gain a more positive business outlook, the new administration should be able to position the Philippines as a highly progressive and viable market. Through its accessibility for trade and investment, environmental sustainability, adaptive labor, labor market, and improved quality of life. This entails a whole of society approach, which allows stakeholders in the private sector, academe and civil society to work with government. This panel is organized with the support of the delegation of the European Union to the Philippines. For our first speaker, for, or for the keynote address rather, he will be discussing opportunities for increased connectivity and development. His Excellency Luc Veron is the ambassador and the head of the delegation of the European Union to the Philippines. He was previously the head of division for human resources in the European External Action Service, which is the EU's foreign service, and was the deputy head of the Central Asia Division and advisor to the Security Directorate. He spent five years in Washington, where he led the political section of the EU delegation to the United States of America and the EU observer role at the Organization of American States. Ladies and gentlemen, Ambassador Luc Veron. Good afternoon. I'm very delighted to be the first speaker after your lunch um, and uh, delighted to be here. Um, Professor Dindomani, thank you so very much for, uh, for the invitation. Uh, business and industry representatives, ladies and gentlemen, um, a very good afternoon to you all. Actually, the, uh, the annual Filipinas conference is an important uh, event in the calendar of the European Union in the Philippines. And I'm very pleased to, to be here today with you in person. I'm delighted that after two, more than two years, we can uh, now meet again in the same room. The Ayala Museum, on the other hand, is um, uh, the perfect place for um, the Filipinas Conference because it's a showcase of Philippine culture and history. To begin, uh, allow me to um, congratulate and thank Stradbay's ADR Institute for all the good work done, especially during the very challenging last years. I uh, highly value this partnership between you and us, the European Union delegation, notably in promoting sustainable and inclusive growth which is the subject of today's conference. We also value the cooperation between Stratbase and the EU delegation because it supports the mutual understanding between thinkers and decision makers in the EU and the Philippines. Ladies and gentlemen, in the beginning of 2022, um, we, we are uh, rooting for the global economy to show its most, imp its most robust uh, post-recession recovery. Instead, we are experiencing a sharper than expected slowdown, inflation, tightening financial conditions in most regions, the fallout of uh, the Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine on food supply, and energy, as well as the lingering COVID-19 pandemic, all weigh heavily on uh, the global economic outlook, and in particular on the livelihood of our citizens. Europeans and Filipinos actually now feel in their daily lives 
this uh, slowdown. And consequently, it's projected that the EU economy will grow by only 2.7% this year and 1.5 next year. And that of the Philippines, that in the Philippines, the growth will be between 6.5 and 7.5%. And in the case of the EU, I have to confess that this is far below our expectations. However, I don't want to linger on our unfulfilled expectations and rather speak to you about opportunities from the crisis we face today. As in any crisis, there is also an opportunity. Every crisis is a break of our routines that forces us to think things over. In Europe, we try to seize the opportunity. The EU Next Generation EU program, which is the recovery plan for Europe, the European Green Deal, the Digital Europe program, and our investments in research and development are in place to set Europe on a path to a sustainable recovery. These initiatives will transform the EU into a modern, resource efficient and competitive economy. Allow me to elaborate a little bit on the EU sustainability agenda and the European Green Deal. On the one hand, it is the EU's vision for climate neutral continent in 2050. And on the other hand, a very dedicated roadmap to the goal of reconciling the economy with our planet. In short, the European Green Deal is about cutting emissions, creating jobs, and boosting innovation. The Green Deal actually is our new growth strategy, one that gives more back than it takes away. The Green Deal is implemented through a growing body of innovative legislation. Since uh, 2021, the European Commission adopted several initiatives under the Green Deal. And let me just mention two major ones. First, a carbon border adjustment mechanism. This aims to tackle the risk of carbon leakage and put a price tag on products with higher carbon footprint. And second, a proposal on deforestation. This aims to guarantee that products consumed in the EU do not contribute to deforestation and forest degradation within the EU and in the world. Also in 2022, the Commission tabled a proposal on sustainable corporate governance, which aims to set mandatory environmental but also human rights obligations for companies. And talking about human rights, and since we are approaching 10 December, the 2022 Human Rights Day, let me also mention that just last December, September, the Commission has brought on the way legislation that prohibits the placing on the EU markets of goods produced with labor force, a forced labor, a forced labor, uh, whether origin originated in EU or abroad. And here comes in trade and trade policy and the economic relations with our partners. Indeed, the measures under the EU sustainability agenda put obligations on all EU companies, including those engaged in foreign trade. The EU measures ensure that EU economic activity, whether internal or external, is sustainable, responsible, and coherent with our shared global objectives and values. The measures are designed in full respect of WTO rules of non on non-discrimination and proportionality and built to the widest extent possible on international standards. Plus, they are designed to avoid unnecessary disruption of trade. They allow us to maintain open trade 
while achieving our sustainability goal. Ladies and gentlemen, trade plays uh, a key role towards a resilient and sustainable economic recovery. Indeed, open trade and investment are critical to generate the growth and jobs that Europe and its trading partners need in order to recover from the crisis. Furthermore, the impact of the pandemic on global supply chains and the economic consequences of the crisis kick off by Russia, show more than ever the critical role that an open rules-based trade and investment environment plays in upholding our economic model and ensuring our well-being. That is why beyond EU own measures, the EU through its trade policy puts a strong emphasis on sustainable development. Why the EU has taken a leadership in multilateral fora and has made a central has made it a central pillar of our uh, bilateral relationships. All our modern trade agreements, trade agreements include trade and sustainable development chapters. This means that the EU is committed to foster respect of international labor and environmental standards. The EU is also an important trade and investment partner for many developing countries. Our trade relationships, accompanied by targeted development programs, support countries in their sustainability objectives. One of the main goals of the EU is to harness the significant potential in global markets for low energy technologies, sustainable products and services in order to achieve climate neutrality. However, to achieve a climate neutral and circular economy requires the full mobilization of industry. Not only businesses will benefit from this, it is also expected to generate, to generate jobs, for example, in renewable energy, energy efficiency buildings and processes. We all live in the same planet. We need to work together to protect our home. There is growing evidence that to tackle climate change, we need to address the large inequalities in carbon emissions. Recent data shows that the top 10% of emitters are responsible for close to 15% of all CO2 emissions while the bottom 50% for only 12% of the total. The Philippines is one of the highly vulnerable countries on the impact of climate change. Ladies and gentlemen, as the Philippines finally reopens to the world, as we see it, it is an opportune time for the country to implement reforms and policies that will lead the country towards a resilient and sustainable future. Indeed, we see that important legal and policy reform have been brought forward on the way in the Philippines. These reforms open key economic sectors to foreign investment, modernize customs, and could have the potential to improve the ease, to improve the ease of doing business. In particular, we welcome the revision of the implementing rules and regulations of the Renewable Energy Act, allowing 100% participation of foreign investors, including Europeans in this sector. These legislative projects, if and once fully implemented and without new restrictions, can be beneficial to businesses and investors also from Europe. These reforms will accelerate know-how transfer and have the capacity to create new and better jobs and support the growth of a sustainable, more inclusive economy. 
And they will make the Philippines more competitive in the region. A final word, beyond legislation and beyond economic agreements, global challenges can only be addressed through international cooperation. We have to embark on the same journey. This is the only way to achieve sustainable transformation of our economies and create a better life for us and future generations. I wish everyone a very fruitful discussion ahead. Thank you, Maramin Salamat. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, definitely, we can learn a lot from our friends in the European Union. Uh, moving on to our next speaker, he is expected to talk about pursuing a sustainable expert-led national growth and development. Mr. Sanen Perlada is the Chief Operating Officer of the Philippine Exporters Confederation Incorporated. He also leads the Export Development Council of the Philippines, a cabinet-level public-private partnership composed of government representatives and private sector export business representatives. Mr. Perlada served as a director at the Department of Trade and Industry. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Sanen Perlada. Thank you so much for the very kind introduction, but I have to make a correction. I used to be the executive director of the Export Development Council in my capacity as director of the Department of Trade and Industry, but I retired in 2020 during uh, the pandemic. So yes. So anyway, Excellencies, um, Excellency Ambassador Luc Veron. Um, well, my boss is not here anymore. Uh, Phil Export Chairman and Board of the Board, uh, Dr. George Barcelon, es esteemed fellow speakers and guests, including those that uh, have been recognized earlier, friends, ladies and gentlemen, it's so nice to see everyone uh, from our previous assignments in the DTI, former colleagues, for the first time actually. No? And thank you very much, um, Professor Dindo Manhit for this invitation, uh, especially to the Phil Export. Um, this is a yearly thing, it's almost uh, being done. Eminent industry captains and business leaders um, to be able to tackle a very relevant and timely um, issues or timely issues uh, to promote inclusive growth and sustainable development for the years to come. Actually, I stand here fresh from Phil Export's 30th anniversary. So you will see that the slide, the cover slide is uh, that of a uh, pearl, uh, which we had last month, where we drew up the commitments of industry heads to precisely continue to share and live out Phil Export's mandate and vision of a sustainable export-driven, if you will notice there was a change because I think what you will hear today, it's very hard to say export led. I would rather say export driven, national growth and development. So over the past 30 years, Phil Exports advocacies, Phil Exports advocacies were faced with a lot of headwinds and challenges, but with grit and diligence, were somehow rewarded with meaningful victories. Among our highly impactful accomplishments include the passage of Republic Act 7844 or the Export Development Act of 1994. Probably because all of the speakers, especially in the first panel, actually talked about the PPP or public-private partnership, but it was actually the Export Development Council that first coined that acronym and term. But the definition is quite different. Our public-private partnership in the Export Development Council is really government and private sector working together. We're not talking about infrastructure. We're just talking about shared visions and shared goals and what to do in order to move the country's exports forward. 
Now, under the auspices of um, the EDC also, was born the National Competitiveness Council, which actually eventually became what was the forerunner of the, of the ARTA, okay? Because of the advocacies, uh, the, the, uh, what we had there, uh, the, Expo, the National Competitiveness Council uh, okay, uh, brought about the um, National Competitive, uh, National, Com National Competition Council which eventually it morphed, as I said, uh, into ARTA. Now, the, the, um, the uh, EDA set in motion advocacies and programs in collaboration with government, especially the Department of Trade and Industry, uh, that are to be the foundation of the evolving spirit and consequent interventions, okay, to include the following, no? The Philippine Export Development Plan, the Magna Carta for MSMEs, the Export Promotion and Support Funds, trade advocacies on export procedures and requirements, as well as collaboration with government and other business support organizations on trade facilitation and other product and market diversification programs. This morning, we had a very, very uh, important business support organizations here with us, PCCI, MAP, Makati Business Club. Um, I guess you could say that this particular forum really brought together all of these business support organizations in order for us to tackle uh, the subjects at hand. Now, Phil Export is a partner institution, and I go directly into this because I, the next speakers after me will be talking about more about the EU GSP Plus. And thank you, Ambassador uh, uh, Peron, for, for, for stating that. And Mr. Wittig will also take care of that, talking about that as well. So with Mr. Dupuy. But Philly Export is a partner institution of the ITC, the International Trade Center, in the implementation of the ARISE program, a program that is funded by the European Union. Right, now we go to the pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic, as we all are painfully aware of, was really a major disruptor an eye-opener to the structural weaknesses in national and global economies. There was a sudden renewed pressure to revisit and fortify domestic pol policies and structures against the global dynamics brought about by the pandemic, those related issues and opportunities. And while the Philippine export sector actually was exempted from the lockdowns, if you will remember, our exporting companies were actually allowed to operate but they had to make certain adjustments that, for example, in PESA, they had to actually house their workers, you know, to provide living quarters and so on. Uh, and it was a huge challenge uh, breaking through the local and international uh, borders, literally, as the pandemic paralyzed the local port operations and even global supply chains. Now, as the succeeding couple of slides would show, the disruptions caused by the pandemic cannot be decoupled from trade. As Ambassador Veron had also mentioned in his speech, results, okay, results from the Euromonitor's 2020 sustainability survey, for example, confirm, get this, the positive effect of COVID-19 on SDGs. Take note, positive impact of SDGs related to socioeconomic issues and innovation, and the negative impact on goals related to education, poverty, and peace, along with some environmental goals. Now, despite the initial concerns about the pandemic affecting the climate change momentum, climate action and access to affordable and clean energy, key to achieve to a net zero economy, uh, change continues to be a priority of companies despite the health and economic crisis. And many businesses are keeping pre-pandemic commitments to become net zero with key players launching new carbon targets to accelerate the transition towards a net zero future. Now to this day, even as disruptions and constraints on the health aspect of the pandemic wanes, the trade related barriers that emerged have negatively impacted our exporters, mostly micro, small, and medium enterprises. Among those encountered were difficulty getting shipping space, 
Many fell prey to arbitrary huge increases in freight rates and port fees, resulting from delays in berthing schedules, etc. In our chapter and industry association consultations last month, uh, for example, uh, we had FGDs for a supply chain study in the gifts and housewares sector, which were supported by the Export Development Council, Phil Export and PCCI, and old and new issues were raised. These were all old issues that we have been talking pre-pandemic, in pandemic, and now even post-pandemic. And every speaker that we had in the first panel talked about Vietnam and how that country has somehow weathered through all of these difficulties, right? So we've been talking about this for a long, long time already, greening the supply chain, reshoring production. Um, you know, we have to, to, to talk about uh, reshoring production domestically as a response to the global supply chain disruptions. We want to upgrade skills to keep up with the fourth industrial revolution, all right? And we wanted to, uh, we, we, we talked about emerging global recession as a result of rising inflation. And of course, e-governance. Now, where are we in all of these? We talked about the ease of doing business and as, uh, uh, Secretary um, uh, Singson talked about the cost of doing business. No, I always say, or not always, but sometimes I say jokingly that we have the ease of doing business. I hope it's not the easing out, you know, people getting eased out of doing business, especially for MSMEs, no? Why? Because a lot of our problems in Philippine exports are really not because of markets, for example, the European Union, but really behind the border issues. Our goods have not yet actually reached foreign shores, and yet we are faced with all the difficulties. Suffice it to say that we are familiar with all of these, and various interventions have been offered and are, and are still in the works to the situation to turn, to turn this around. Now, as 2022 comes, comes to a close, and as the disruptions brought about by the pandemic eases, the climate change crisis is deepening as we speak. I mean, we've all heard about COP27. I think they just finished, or I don't know if they extended, okay? And precarious macroeconomic trends such as inflation and a looming global recession threaten lives and livelihoods. Deepening geopolitical discord continues to emerge and skepticism about the benefits of globalization make trade and international cooperation even more complicated. An inordinate share of these challenges, in fact, undue strains, and uh, Ambassador uh, Veron has mentioned it, will continue to hurt people in poorer countries like the Philippines, where financial resources are scarce, social safety nets and public infrastructure are weak, and whose economies are so uh, less resilient to shocks. And when there's unfavorable disruptions and a slowdown in the global economy, trade has traditionally been pardon me, the whipping boy that takes the blame. But being the whipping boy, as Ambassador Baron has also said, this is also where the opportunities lie and where we can avoid all of this. Now, according to the Carbon Almanac, when goods and services move, did I go ahead? Okay. When goods move, uh, across borders, approximately 25% of all human activity flow from one country to another via imports and exports. And as to, ex as to be expected, these flows are not evenly distributed across countries nor products. So commodities such as steel, cement, chemicals account for roughly half of all cross-border carbon flows. The remaining half is contained in semi-finished and finished products like cars, clothing, industrial machinery, and equipment. A major Philippine export product, thank God, it turns out, doesn't make up like bananas, for example, <laughs> does not make up a significant amount of worldwide carbon flows. So the wealthier countries, because of their cross-border carbon imports, are pushing the dirty job of combustion to other countries. And tracking this flow will make it easier for governments to properly account for and limit carbon emissions. Hence, it is quite interesting 
what will be eventually the outcome of the loss and damage talks at COP27 in Egypt, and how these will really impact the economies of the most at-risk countries like the Philippines, uh, which was already mentioned earlier. While it is imperative to meet these pressing charges, the burden of doing so should not be justification for countries to backslide into trade protectionism and raise market access hurdles. As disruptions caused by the pandemic wanes, we continue to face strong headwinds for our exports. In a manner of speaking, global trade is actually in crisis mode. Nations are turning inward, emphasizing self-sufficiency, sorry, self-sufficiency, and friend shoring in place of strengthening trust and commercial ties. Political leverage and, incre and mediation is increasingly ineffective and absent. Now, guess what? I think uh, I'm looking here at the crowd here. Um, there's probably a good number of millennials and those that will appreciate this slide, you know? In a survey of Statista, about half, okay, of the people uh, from the Philippines uh, from about age 16 to 25 last year, are extremely worried, extremely worried. And it's just natural because we're one of the most at-risk countries. So you can see that Philippines, India, look at the countries like UK and United States down there, okay? But it's interesting that Philippines is right there because I am hoping that these guys, for example, in this table would be able to take on the cudgels for climate, for the climate crisis as we get out of this room. All right. Okay. Um, with the deepening climate crisis and the learnings from COVID-19 as overlapping backdrops, how will the Philippines achieve export-driven growth and development? Well, you see the slide here shows you have corporate involvement, both as individual companies and as business support organizations, okay? and government action, okay? All taking their cue from consumer demand. And the consumer has changed. As you can see here, you know, consumer markets have really been disrupted. So you're looking at sustainability to purpose. The other centeredness of consumers has come for. The new experiential consumer is there. How, where and how to shop has changed. Wellness has been redefined. And innovation and the new core in rapidly changing operating and consumer environments with risk averse retailers and consumers, experimentation is being diminished. But innovation will be driven by the demand for immunity, health boosting ingredients for which consumers will pay a premium. So the new normal, what's here to stay? We have already all experienced that here. So being the purpose, the purpose of being new normal, what will happen? We've been talking about this for business. The standpoint of business, you want to build back better, you want supply chain safety, you want value for all, which is so nice in this particular um, conference because the definition of value and wealth creation is basically changing. It's no longer just your profit motive. It's not about satisfying your shareholders. It's really talking about taking into consideration all your stakeholders, right? So green and sustainability principles, manufacturers and exporters are now compelled basically to factor in environmental impacts in their operations, okay? So we're now talking about all of this ESG, but I don't know, I don't think we're doing enough. You travel to Japan, their subways have all of these colors, okay? The SDGs, public transportation, you see this, it's very ubiquitous. And they have seen, they seem to have embraced this more than actually we have. And I think in the Philippines, if I might say, we really need to do more about awareness about the SDGs and what actually your activities as individual persons, households, and companies impact, how they impact the environment. So we've been talking about the circular economy. Of course, nothing is wasted. And in the Philippines, there are opportunities. Our bananas now no longer are wasted too much because they're being turned into banana flour. Mango seed is actually being turned into flour as well because it is gluten-free, okay? The waste that we generate 
actually has opportunities for the uh, circular economy, which can be sustainable. Now, the SDGs actually, Ambassador Veron has already mentioned it, potentially can generate 12 trillion. Okay, and if even looking at the, at the timeline of 2030, you're looking at all circular models from automotive, energy efficient buildings, and even reducing food waste in the value chain. Okay, carbon labeling is something that we have to look forward to. Are our exporters ready? Very hard to say. In the European Union, for example, the Rolls Royce was supposed to be, pardon me, um, Ambassador Veron, but it was the British Retail Consortium for food, right? BRC. We don't even know now whether BRC is going to be honored in all of the European Union. I'm not familiar now. I'm, I'm, I'm out of it. No? But we're looking at you know, being able to certify to carbon neutrality, carbon positive and carbon negative um, uh, products, climate neutral, net zero carbon emissions, net zero emissions, and getting into carbon offset programs. These things should be top of mind for all of us already. And here we're looking at the EU. Again, pardon uh, for, uh, uh, for, uh, my, for my friends from the European Union, but I always, when I was in DTI, I thought, I, 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 I um, referred to the EU as Fortress Europe. Even before this, we already had the IUUs. IUU, IONU. <laughs> no, there's illegal, unregulated, unreported trade in forestry products. There is IUU for fisheries, illegal, unregulated, unreported exports and imports of, of um, fishery products. Okay, Philippines though, uh, you know, STI at the Heinrich Foundation says that we're not so bad, we're kind of middle of the road. We rank 12th in the 30 economy for the sustainability uh, trade index. Now for field export, we have programs and we still continue to work with partners that include government, most especially, that would uh, facilitate trade and ease the flow. And remember what Secretary Singson said, the cost of doing business. So it's not just the flow, it's also the cost. Okay, so we talked about our 30th anniversary. We have improved in terms of our digitalization by having a portal that is much better than before. We have, uh, are preparing a groundwork for future ready field export in its members. We are using the cluster approach, just like the DTI in continuing our engagement with government partners. And we have development, uh, uh, we, are, we, we develop, or we are developing business, continue to, business continuity plans for field export national and its chapters. Right, have you guys read this? Anybody here? Vision 2050 of the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Anyone? Oh my God. Oh, Professor Dindo, I suggest that you do this as required reading, okay? <laughs> okay, uh, the WBCSD is a uh, group of 200 multinational companies that have come up with a Vision 2050, including their commitments of what they will do for climate change, okay? So I suggest you do this. I'm just saying I read, oh, I, I, looked at the, I looked at it. I checked with the, with the Global Reporting Initiative and they partner with this group. So I think they're legit. They're legit. And all of the things that they're saying there is no longer rocket science. There's, there's a lot that can be done at the individual and corporate level in order for us to do that. Now, lastly, so, my takeaway, your takeaway, the new normal, the global economy is digital, it's green, and it's circular. The movement of social, economic, and environment sustain, uh, environmental sustainability is destined to keep growing. It's not going to stop. So for businesses to thrive, they must embrace this movement or simply face extinction. That's simple. And we all have a responsibility to ensure that future generations will inherit a livable planet. I heard about a couple of weeks ago that we are now 8 billion people in this planet, right? Now up to how many can this world that exists sustain or you know, uh, provide for 
uh, a, a population that it continues to grow. Now, my parting word to you is, and I just coined this as I was listening to everybody. You sustain, you sustain, or else everything is pain and no gain. That said, maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat. Thank you very much, Mr. Sanen Perlada. Very interesting, uh, the survey, Statista, Statista survey he showed about 18 to 25-year-old Filipinos being extremely worried about uh, climate change. Hope that also means a better future for the environment and that this extreme worry by these uh, millennials and Gen Zs would also result to actions. Like, it, can you just imagine TikTok or Instagram content about climate change, right? Instead of just dancing. <laughs> All right. So moving on to our next topic, we uh, our next speaker will be discussing advancing market-oriented reforms and good governance for sustainable investment growth. So Mr. Michael Guarin is the president of the Financial Executives Institute of the Philippines for 2022. He is also vice chairman of the Phoenix Research and Development Foundation and the head of the deal advisory group of RG Manabat and Company or KPMG in the Philippines. His experiences include providing financial due diligence services to various industries, such as financial, industrial, healthcare, retail, energy, and media. Again, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Michael Guarin. Okay, thank you. His Excellency uh, Luke Veron was here earlier. Uh, to the rest of my distinguished co-speakers this afternoon, and uh, to the organizers, Stratbase, uh, Professor Dindumanhit, thank you for the invitation. All the attendees present here, present good afternoon. So allow me to start with the administration's eight-point socioeconomic agenda. I assume all of us here have at least seen it, heard of it, and has gone through at a high level of the framework uh, one way or another and have studied, studied its components uh, with varying degrees of detail. So this was welcomed by the country given how straightforward it was, how relatively easy to understand, given all of the main themes and all of the main uh, sub-components. And then another thing that uh, was welcomed when it was discussed as early as June, uh, would be the timing priority. You can clearly see here the near-term and medium-term agenda points. No? And even as recent as the last U.S. trip by the government, and, you will, and if you check the Department of Finance uh, website, they continue you know, to harp on this message. So the next question is, um, what then are the specific reforms that are being introduced, that are being pushed, to try to make sure that the country realizes the good plans. You know, and as usual, uh, we always come up with excellent plans. And the uh, key challenge there is how to make it, how to actually implement it and to make sure that it reaches the, you know, the, the farthest corners of the country. So as part of that, um, just to share with you, in a, in a letter dated July 2022, the, group, the Philippine group of business organizations, uh, including Phoenix, and together with the joint uh, foreign chambers, we submitted to the Philippine president 24 uh, priority programs. No? Uh, measures, 24 measures that we felt should be prioritized and with the overall theme of obviously opening up the, the, the country in general, number one, increasing operational efficiencies in the country where applicable, and also make easing the flow of capital or the flow of funds from one location to another. What we, what we did was to start with a long list of 37 measures, 
and then we finally decided on submitting 24. We won't go through all 24, but just, just to mention, uh, part of it would be liberalization of the foreign equity restrictions in the Constitution. Obviously, no changes to the Constitution are now being pushed, but implementing rules and regulations, as well as several amendments have been put in place. And then those details I'll mention shortly. It also includes open access and data transmission, uh, even the promotion of digital payments, that's part of that. Um, part, part of the 24 would be amending the um, BOT law, the Implementing Rules and Regulations, and Phoenix. And I've seen a lot of you there present at the ADB, um, you know, going through the changes. And fortunately, last October 12, those changes have been um, more solidified. Even pushing for secrecy of bank deposit law amendments, intellectual property code amendments, Philippine pension portability. I'll mention that uh, later as I discuss the blueprint for the capital market development of the Philippines and even agricultural lands ownership easing. So out of those 24, there were already around seven reforms present during the 18th Congress. So we're currently on the 19th Congress. And uh, part, of it, part of it would be measures meant to liberalize right, foreign uh, ownership of uh, assets and companies here in the Philippines. So what we're trying to do is to make sure that whatever momentum uh, that was started by the, by the prior administration, we are able to continue. So some of those positive things would be amendments made to the Foreign Investments Act. As you know, no, uh, 200,000 US dollars and below are supposed to be reserved for uh, uh, Philippine companies. Uh, however, as a result of this amendment, uh, it now allowed uh, foreign companies to own uh, up to 100,000 US dollars subject to several conditions. So right now, given those reforms at the tail end uh, of the Duterte administration, what we're doing now is making sure, or at least we're monitoring and then trying to influence to the extent that we can, um, the full implementation. And if there are further nudging that needs to happen, uh, we're there to try to push. No? So some of the, so foreign nationals can now own an MSME with a minimum paid in capital of 100,000 US dollars as mentioned, provided that those enterprises meet the following conditions. So some of them would be uh, those MSMEs utilize advanced technology or they are endorsed as startup enablers or as a startup in accordance with the Innovative Startup Act, no? among others. No? So again, it's in place, but how do we make sure that it will actually be implemented and implemented well? And then part of the reform there would be the formation of an interagency investment promotion coordination committee. So right now, what we're trying to do is making is to monitor, make sure that it's actually doing what it's supposed to do. And then, as mentioned earlier, uh, we 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 definitely welcomed the reforms made by the current Department of Energy Secretary regarding the uh, allowing foreign nationals no, to own 100% of renewable energy companies in the Philippines. And then so, some of the other items that have moved recently would be open access and data transmission. This is an act that hopes to promote fair and open competition by lowering barriers to entry for the telecommunications industry. Currently, obvious and as expected, current telecommunications companies are, um, uh, are raising some questions regarding specific details uh, of that act, and it's still um, in progress. Another item would be ease of paying taxes, right? It's, it is a subcomponent of making sure that we operate more efficiently. So as you've read, probably, you know, the House of Representatives uh, already endorsed it to the Senate. Um, and then uh, just to remind everyone, it seeks to modernize tax administration and improve tax compliance. Then as mentioned during the introduction earlier, uh, my other day job would be being a KPMG partner. And part of that would be trying to convince foreign investors to check out the Philippines and to actually make that investment. And for sure, 
one of their top priorities would be heavy, trying to better understand you know, and improvements and changes to the tax regime and tax administration in the Philippines because obviously it does have a direct effect on how they will be doing business in the Philippines. And then another item would be the promotion of digital payments. Although I, I'm not sure if you're aware that we do have the BSP's Digital Payments Transformation Roadmap 2020 until 2023, we're nearing the tail end of that roadmap and uh, we're uh, coordinating with the, with the BSP regarding how much uh, they've actually realized the main objectives. Now, so some of its main strategic outcomes would be to strengthen customer preference for digital payments. It seems like uh, we're heading towards that direction, but they do have a specific threshold in place. So we'd like to find out by the end of that roadmap, the period of that roadmap, whether they've actually reached their target. And then number two, um, whether there are more innovative and responsive digital financial services. And as a result of the current fintech companies and the continued inflow of new technology into the Philippines. And lastly, the further improvement by the current fintech companies, I'd like to think that um, the results have been pretty positive. And then um, in addition, a, a long uh, low hanging fruit for the country would be the RCEP, Regional Economic Comprehensive Partnership. And I wasn't here this morning, but I'd like to think that former Secretary Singson mentioned it. So th that's something that the business community would like to happen and happen soon. Uh, we don't want to be left out. You know, as a potential outcast, uh, there's still that time for the Senate to ratify. We would we we want to avoid losing foreign investments, having access to those markets, and learning you know, from the biggest trading bloc uh, in the world. And then uh, another, another item in terms of the actual reforms or potential need for reforms would be. Um, how all of us can relate no, with a um, that um, have, having a convoluted system is definitely a turn off you know, for potential investors, current businesses, um, and for all types of stakeholders. So agencies that exist and uh, initiatives that have been formed whose intentions are to reduce or eliminate red tape for sure and to resolve government inefficiencies should be fully supported. So hopefully, whatever issues that you've read about you know, uh, that agency has already been resolved, hopefully. So a serious attempt must be made to reduce corruption. It's always at or near the top of the list of uh, bad news no, for the countries from investors, particularly for foreigners. So I'm sure you, hopefully you've read as well through the uh, recently released a global corruption index 2022 wherein we actually fell so you want to be you know ranked higher we we fell down to 105 we were the 105th uh, most corrupt or at, at, in terms of scoring now what 105 out of 196 so the lower the rank the better right so comparing it to the rest of our neighbors ASEAN neighbors uh, Singapore was 13th uh, Malaysia 49th, Brunei 70th, Indonesia 98th, and Thailand 101st, and we're 105th. So definitely a lot of room for us to try to improve in. So, and uh, and obviously, uh, all of these things are needed to be threshed out and improved on in order for us to truly head, no, head towards a truly sustainable investment growth uh, trajectory. And then, um, again, we're not doing this in a vacuum, right? So what, what are... No, no problem. 
So in a recent uh, regional meeting within KPMG in Hong Kong, uh, there was a smart cities conference. And I thought that it would be um, useful for us to understand what other jurisdictions, this one in particular was Hong Kong, China. What, what, what are the main themes that were discussed in that conference? So uh, these are the things that we should be monitoring and be aware of. Uh, changes that we're doing should react or, at, or maybe spur new reforms throughout the region. So if you read through this, some of the things would be uh, making sure that they continue to be a, an, the international financial hub you know, for the region. Um, some common items, uh, net zero goals and decarbonization. Obviously, that's also part of our regular agenda. Uh, you can ignore Northern Metropolis, uh, the Greater Bay Area that's specific to their country, trying to improve on 5G data analytics and technologies, uh, even social inclusion and diversity, at least we can relate to all, those, all of those things. And then if you look at the emerging giants in Asia Pacific, it's really making sure that they are aware of the requirements and needs of the next in line giants in their countries to help support them and for them to grow. And I wonder whether we're doing a similar thing right here in the country. Definitely priorities wise, we are aware of the requirements and needs of the conglomerates, the blue chip companies, but what about th those that are next in line? How are we trying to help them grow and reach higher levels in the business community? So some of the main thoughts uh, and themes mentioned would be uh, for, in order to be future-proof, smart cities must be sustainable, very consistent with what um, our first speaker mentioned. And then, I mean, so, something uh, consistent with what Mr. Perlada mentioned, a shared economy, circular economy, must be created to minimize consumption, promote zero waste, and increase the length of life of materials. And then governments can be the enablers and infrastructure provider and we're, I think we're already doing that. But if a connected city is to be successful, it requires not just government involvement, but also participation from the private sector individuals. I'd like to think that where we are now is we have a more open line of communication to and from government in the private sector. And then, so in, in relation to that uh, would be the people must be at the center of a smart city, right? And trust must be built up to encourage everyone to be part of a connected city. The reason why this is important, because in the near future, it will no longer be a G to G, but it will be a city to city, a type of communication and flow of investments. And we don't want to be left behind where our cities, our local government units are not able to communicate because we're years, I wouldn't say decades or several years behind some of those mo more modern locations. So on, the, on our left, obviously how to make sure that uh, specific services are uh, up to date, are reliable and are present. And on the right side would be specific investments that will tend to be required across all countries and all jurisdictions. And then next, I would also like to share that uh, I'd like to think that we all know that uh, the Philippine government, we have an existing e-government digital master plan. It's in place. It was launched on June 2019, not even uh, during the uh, BBM administration. So through the EGMP, the government is expected to strategize how processes can be simplified to help make access to accurate information faster and less costly. And again, it's really part of the overall digitalization of the world. And again, similar to my first point several slides ago, I am personally am very interested, interested to monitor how it's being implemented. As you know, it's always an issue from one administration to the next, the continuity of programs. And as mentioned, this was from a prior administration so we'd like to check how the current DICT is potentially using this um, to try to spur 
and to push forward with their own initiatives. So this master plan lays the foundation upon which the structure of e-government has been, uh, as you can see, has been transformed from pushing for infrastructure, which is needed, we'll continue that, and more pushing for info structure, right? So uh, it will cater to digital applications, the systems that will allow these applications to talk and coordinate with each other. And lastly, uh, the core objective of having e-government in the first place is achieving a seamless and citizen-friendly provision of services by the different government agencies and attached bureaus and organizations. And I'd like to think that that's an area where we can still uh, improve on, hopefully through this digitalization. And then uh, lastly would be in relation to capital market development. We chose this slide design to remind us that uh, we are always competing uh, for capital flows with the rest of the region. So this is just uh, some 12 countries in Asia Pacific, Obviously, uh, we're like Asia Pacific is likewise competing with Americas, Middle East, Europe, even Oceania, so Australia, New Zealand. So it, it's really a very competitive global market. And uh, let us be reminded that there is an existing blueprint, the third of its kind, the third blueprint containing the development plans for the Philippine capital market. So something that's much closer to our hearts in Phoenix. Uh, we are the uh, private sector chairman you know, of that council. It's currently chaired by the Department of Finance Secretary. Um, so uh, its objective is to lay out policy goals focused on deepening the local capital market, promote more inclusion, and attain sustainable long-term growth. So uh, the four core financial instruments being considered would be equities market, the fixed income market, Alternative products, we, we will include REITs, real estate investment trusts, trusts there, and savings and pensions. So all of these items are currently uh, regularly being discussed. And the current time, uh, time frame, 2019 to 2025, so we are monitoring the achievements and, um, achievements and goals uh, of the overall blueprint. And within the next few... Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if later, the, later next year, 2023, there will be a newer version, the 2026 and onwards, uh, that will be started to be developed. So the intention really is how do you make sure that majority of the 110 million, well, you remove the 40 million below 21, so let's say 70, 70 million, how do you then maximize you know, the uh, demand and supply between the institutions and having a population of 70 million Filipinos. And then uh, lastly would be in relation to uh, corporate governance. So a lot of the investments earlier mentioned obviously are governed by a board of directors. And what, what are some of the board agenda for 2022 and onwards uh, that we've been seeing? So draw, drawing on our research insights and interactions with directors, and business leaders, we highlight here eight issues for boards to keep in mind as they consider and carry out their 2022 and onwards agendas. So uh, just going through some of them, how companies address climate change, uh, even uh, DEI, diversity, equality, and, and inclusion issues, um, is now viewed by investors, research and rating firms, activists, employees, customers, regulators as fundamental, pretty basic uh, to the business. And they are all critical to long-term sustainability and value creation. So suddenly you have so many stakeholders and these same stakeholders are now trying to grade you and trying to see how you stack up to more things. You know? Definitely areas that are not necessarily within your um, main business. And then uh, the litany and the severity of crisis that companies have found themselves facing in recent years continues to loom large with crisis prevention and readiness now featuring more prominently, prominently than more than ever you know, in the boardroom. So again, 
uh, as a result of the recent major crisis that especially the Philippines uh, using the 2022 index we are the most exposed right 2021 we were still fourth but we, we seem to be improving on the wrong things now but again I'd like to think that there, we're doing a lot of things well and we're heading towards the correct uh, direction. So um, I'll stop at that. Again, um, I look forward to the panel discussions later. Uh, thank you very much and have a nice afternoon. Thank you very much again, Mr. Michael Guarin. A lot of uh, things need to be done and a lot of really good plans. So exciting to see how the next six years will unfold. Moving on to, to our next speaker, he will discuss attracting investments for inclusive growth and a resilient economy. Attorney Anthony Abad is an international trade lawyer and technical advisor on international trade policy and regulation, competition law and policy, and economic integration. He is the CEO of Trade Advisors and senior partner at Abad Alcantara and Associates. He served the government as tariff commissioner, president of the Philippine International Trading Corporation, administrator of the National Food Authority, and Chairman and President of the Food Terminal Incorporated. Ladies and gentlemen, Attorney Anthony Abad. Hello. Thank you for having me. Uh, Dindo, uh, Secretary Albert, uh, and uh, all the uh, the staff and members, the family of the strat based ADRI family. Thank you for having me here, and then throwing me this uh, provocative uh, title, you know, of course, that forces me to think and philosophize. I am going to, if you will pardon me, if you'll forgive me, um, I'm not going to dwell on technical details. I am a lawyer by profession and uh, also well, a part time economist. So I tend to look at, in the day-to-day -day work, I tend to look at very fine details, no? make sure that everything is legal, everything is uh, effective. No? But I also want to look at the big picture. No? And, and that's what I want to share with you today. So the big picture that's going, going on in my head. And I might liken this to, uh, maybe this is like a brown bag for a proposed dissertation. No? Uh, <laughs> In a philosophy, a doctor of philosophy. So it's going to, I'll try to be as philosophical as possible. No? Um, but when you say inclusion and resilience, I mean, that's a tall order in terms of what, what you want or you expect out of a society. So it's not as simple as, you know, I, I, that's why I don't want to get bogged down in sort of technical uh, proposals or things, th you know, going into the nitty gritty. I want to look at the framework. I want to look at how we look at everything from the big picture, and then from there, work on the nuts and bolts. Um, <clears throat> so inclusion and resilience. Inclusion and resilience also makes me think of another word, peace. Now, peace, not maybe peace in the humanitarian, the, the strictly huma humanitarian uh, way or or peace in war, no? but I'm talking about peace, the peace of the individual, the peace of society, no? being able to live uh, at peace, being able to live and work without fear no? that uh, either you will suffer from want or you will suffer from violence, uh, you will suffer from crime. No? So it's that kind of peace, I think, that you want to aspire for and that what you want to see in, in any society. So. When we talk about attracting investments in an inclusive and resilient economy or in resilient society, investments, as I will point out, will be necessary to achieve inclusion and resilience. But at the same time, the problem is investors are looking for inclusion and resilience before they make the decision to invest. So it's sort of a chicken and egg situation here. Um, I just came back from a trip uh, from Mongolia. Um, and uh, well, 
uh, it's nice to know that this time, this trip, uh, rather than negative 30 degrees Celsius, it was only negative 26. Um, but I was there for a, um, well, uh, the development of a program or project known as Pax Mongolia, which is a project uh, together, a multi-sectoral project together with the government of Mongolia to enhance its role as a uh, honest broker and venue uh, for resolving conflict in, in its region. So immediately it's of course dealing with Russia, dealing with China, the two big neighbors, dealing with the rest of Northeast Asia, that's the Koreas, uh, who tend to see Mongolia now as, as I said, in, an honest broker. But it also got me to think about Mongolia itself. You know? I was asking about, you call yourselves a land of peace. You know? uh, what do you mean by that? And they said, well, you know, sir, actually, um, people don't know that we have the highest gun ownership, <laughs> they say, in the world. Because all, all the herders, all the nomads have a hunting rifle. But they never harm each other. That's what they pointed out. They don't use their guns against each other, ever. They fight in the political arena. It's very difficult, and I think they need to reform their politics. But they don't, there's no violence. No? So in, 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 let's say this is a land of peace. They, they work with each other. And the nomadic life also has given them a DNA that makes them close to nature, a, res, a healthy respect for nature, because they know that it has to, give back to them and, and sustain them. That's why it's an interesting, well, it's, it's given me a lot of perspective, no? um, this idea of Pax Mongolia and thinking about our own Pilipinas. No? That's now this is the Pilipinas conference. So there are certain prerequisites or preconditions I see before you can have a truly inclusive or resilient society or, or country. And this will set the stage for, uh, I think, long-term development and growth. No? Um, when you look at the Philippines, sometimes you, you sigh in frustration. But uh, I also want to point out that we are evolving. No? All humans are evolving. We are, we are different from the Philippines of 10 years ago, 100 years ago. So we are evolving and we should trust in the evolution process. But evolution also means change, which is a necessity in creating an inclusive and resilient economy. Okay. Now, what is this framework I was thinking about? No? Um, I'm putting on my philosopher's hat and trying to bring together um, uh, different concepts uh, try, to try and explain um, this, this importance of, uh, of uh, oops, yeah. the importance of inclusion and resilience. Now, I, I um, a great admirer of Sir Adam Smith, okay, who gave us the wealth of nations. He's also the father of modern economics and um, gave, it, gave us the competitive pricing model. As a professor and teacher of competition law and international trade law, I'm always confronted with that graph, you know, the X and Y graph, the demand and supply curves, and the equilibrium point. Equilibrium is a concept, I, under, I, I know that. But I like to borrow the term equilibrium to explain a state where things are at balance, at harmony, at peace with each other. What Adam Smith is saying first is that there is a law of individual liberty. Everyone must be able to express themselves and do their thing and specialize and differentiate and pursue their dreams. But of course, doing so without harming others. And in doing so, as a buyer or a seller, you make decisions, micro decisions. And the collective action of buyers and sellers gives you what is called equilibrium. What is important here is that no single buyer or seller can dominate or upset the market. Okay? The market is in harmony. The market is in equilibrium. That's why I like to use that term, equilibrium. So it's, there's no such thing as real equilibrium in, in the real world, but we must always tend towards that equilibrium. We always fight for it and work towards it. At the top, I see social equilibrium as a balance of power in society. I mean, we, don't all, we don't have to hug each other and love each other, but at least we're not harming each other. 
that there's an understanding that we can work together, we can cooperate. And that is what, that's what I'd like to see happening in the Philippines, no? that we can trust each other no? enough, just enough so that we can all go on with our lives, go on with our jobs and, and work um, at peace. No? Uh, but to be able to achieve that, of course, the other very important equilibria are economic and political. I'll spend most of the time on economic, of course, because that's what, uh, I mean, that's where it all begins. No? Economic equilibrium okay, is about poverty, uh, poverty eradication, number one in your SDG goals, number one and top priority. Without poverty eradication or alleviation, there will be no peace. No? As they say, they say no peace, no poverty, uh, no peace, no prosperity, but at the same time, no prosperity, no peace. Okay, so uh, you have to eradicate poverty. I mean, that's that's is that is a given. Now, I, I talk about things, of course, in their ideal state. No, I I I know that in the Philippines we have a bad habit. No, uh, they say that in the Philippines there is a problem for every for every solution. No. <laughs> We just like to, we love to shoot ourselves in the foot. You know? um, and we, we love to say, you know, we love to set the limits already that, oh, we can't do that. Okay? Oh, we can't amend the Constitution. Uh, we can't pass RCEP, okay, because, because of the Senate, blah, blah, blah. Or we can't, you know, we already, we already tell ourselves that we cannot do things. You know? But I want to, I don't want to buy into that. I want to look at what is the ideal situation and then work towards that. Okay. I am not with the government. I'm an academic. I am a professional. So I'm at liberty now to just dream about what should be. Okay. And I advise all of you to also do the same thing. Oh, so when we talk about poverty alleviation, let's not say that it's impossible. No. Let's, not, let's not buy that, that argument that the poor will be with us always. No. That, that, that poverty is a fact of life no? because it tends to make us neglect that very important goal. Poverty alleviation is not impossible. In fact, if you are to look at 19, the, well, the, the example of Vietnam was cited since 1993 to 2014, 40 million Vietnamese lifted out of extreme poverty. Okay? Since 1990 to the present, one billion people, at least, lifted out of extreme poverty. We're not doing that bad. No? But most of this is, of course, China, Vietnam, and even India. No? Because of what? Because of market reforms. Because of openness and uh, economic integration. Johan Norberg, a Swedish uh, writer, uh, empirically, well, showed us empirical evidence that the countries that were able to rapidly reduce poverty are those most open, okay? You might argue, ah, oh, but if you're open, then you're vulnerable. No, openness actually and integration will lead to resilience. Okay? That's why economic integration is so important. That's why if we can dream, <laughs> if we can dream for a Philippine, an EU Philippines FDA, despite, uh, well, the problems, Okay, let's please, let's dream for it and then let's talk about it, okay. Um, RCEP, Senen, we were also being uh, frustrated about it. Let's also dream, let's apply some law of attraction and positivity that it's going to pass. But these are all necessary, the bilaterals, the regionals, and the multilaterals are all important. And that's, and that's actually my day job is uh, I am... Uh, a panelist in the dispute settlement body of the WTO. There are also problems at that level no? uh, involving the U.S., involving the, the leadership of, of WTO. But I'm still hopeful that we can move forward there. Um, I, I advise companies on international trade. So I'm always optimistic that, you know, eventually the integration process will happen. And that's because technology is also driving our integration process. So whether we like it or not, more inventions, more technology, more science is being applied. So we are, even if we're trying to avoid it, even if we're trying to be protectionist, okay, 
the cross-border transactions are happening, the communication, the transfer of knowledge and technology. Capital accumulation is all important. Adam Smith had pointed it out. Capital accumulation, value adding. And economists all the way up to Danny Roderick okay, will also point out to you that capital accumulation is important. Uh, Eric uh, Beinhocker, who wrote The Origin of Wealth in Complexity Economics, also agrees with this concept. You have to accumulate capital. There has to be capital before you can alleviate poverty. And that is why FDI is so important. Okay, And then again, you look at countries like China and Vietnam and the export giants before that, Japan, Korea, Taiwan. Okay? What did they do? They integrated with the international economy. Okay, They may have certain regulations in place, but essentially they opted for an open economy. And that's what we have to do here in the Philippines. We have to open our economy because you have to bring in FDI. And that is why um, countries like Vietnam don't have these dysfunctional provisions in their constitution, asking for 60-40 uh, limits. Uh, actually, as a lawyer, it doesn't make sense also. As a corporate lawyer, it doesn't make sense to use equity restrictions as a means of regulating foreign investment. If you want to regulate foreign investment, then we can talk about national security provisions and other forms of regulation, but don't, don't mess around with the equity because capital does not have any nationality. Capital is just looking to become more profitable and to return into itself. Now, whether there is some dark, sinister agenda on the part of the investors, okay, something that can be addressed in other ways and not through equity restrictions. But the moment you put something like a restriction in the constitution, it's a instant turn off okay and as was i think mike pointed out um there are all these different countries that are hungry for investment hungry for capital so why will they bother with us they'll just go and shift to, to vietnam cambodia laos okay? so that is well, a signal or that's my own suggestion that we have to really look at the constitution we have to look at all our all the items in our negative list and do away with them. Okay. Fortunately, we have we've already addressed certain issues with the passing of the PSA amendments, uh, FIA enhancement, uh, and retail trade uh, amendment. No? Um, but still more work to be done if we want to be truly integrated. And remember that with investment also comes science, technology, and innovation. Okay? And the salvation of let's say the agricultural sector, rural sector, food. We're talking about hunger, we're talking about all of these SDG problems can be solved with the application of technology. And it can be inclusive. No? It's not in the exclusive realm of the, of the rich and the powerful. It is in fact, science and technology is a way of democratizing economic development. And that's why it's an important thing to follow, an important component to follow when you monitor and look at invest, investment. And competition, okay. Why is competition so important? Let's go back to Adam Smith. There should be no single buyer or seller that dominates the market. Because the moment that happens, then they distort the pricing. They distort the market. No? Uh, and price, prices are higher than they should be, or they prevent they prevent um, uh, the innovation you know, uh, from happening. Um, and, and think of all the other different things. And eventually, uh, it even leads to political problems, political issues, you know, when there is too much concentration of wealth and power. So competition is there also as a way of disciplining all who have invested in the system. You know? And it is a way of maintaining resilience. And there is inclusion because one of the important elements of competition law and policy is that there should be no or minimal barriers to entry. Okay, so with that, I'm, this is, these are the policy imperatives for the economic, in the economic sphere. And if you make sure that there is capital accumulation plus competition, plus the application of technology, you will see a very modern, very forward thinking and very dynamic economy. However, okay, 
it is not complete because oftentimes good economic policy is negated by bad politics. Okay. And I think we are very familiar with that. You know? uh, we are not, of course, unique. You know, in the world, there are, well, many places with bad politics or bad political systems. Bad political systems will always negate the good that people are trying to do through policy reform. So we cannot also neglect the political sphere or the sphere of governance, government and politics. No? It also has to be reformed. And I think this is some, something that the, the political science scientists under Dindo's wing and everyone else uh, who have been studying carefully what the proper system should be, should take a long, hard look again at the political system that we have. Okay? And I'm not saying this for any political agenda. Okay? I just is, is something that will bring us back into the well, bring us back for bring us forward rather into the 21st century. No. Uh, okay, what are the elements of a good political or governance system? Political competition. So if you were to apply the competition principles in economics that Adam Smith teaches us, there should also be no single politician that is able to dominate or dictate. Okay. So I'm this is a refer, ref, referring to authoritarianism and dictatorship. There should be no concentration of political power. Okay? Even if there is an election, if the electoral process actually grants dictatorial powers to a single individual, then that authoritarian system will lead to dysfunction. So in the 21st century, in this modern age, we have to consider a different form of political system. And that is where political competition should come in. There should always be the opportunity for a new generation of leaders to come into the political system. Okay. If, there is, if there are barriers to entry in the political system, then it's dysfunctional and it should be addressed. Participatory governance. In this day and age, uh, there was a an, uh, there was a conference in the Netherlands recently on democracy, and one of the interesting discussions was that the application of AI in governance actually also requires that there should be more part direct participation of citizens in the democratic process. So you have to actually redo your political system to allow citizens to have a direct say or have to have some participation. Um, again, here's my, I, I, my own personal opinion, personal view. The current presidential system okay, that grants a dicta dictatorial power to a person for six years no, and has no, well, very weak accountability, no transparency, uh, no way of recall except by impeachment no? makes the system very opaque. So when I study different political systems, it seems more logical to me, and I've seen it happen in Europe, a European style or even, uh, I mean, other, other countries. Now that, that doesn't have to be Europe, but the parliamentary system, you know, which creates a town hall for, uh, for the citizens, is actually a better option, I think, or it gives more opportunity for, say, the prime minister and the cabinet to actually discuss public expenditure, to ask uh, to discuss the passage of laws at the venue itself. No? So, um, and of course, you know, as you know, it's it's more like a corporate system. If you're unhappy with the management, there's a way to take out the manager. Okay. Which, which happens in corporations. If you're unhappy with your CEO, the board will, will remove the CEO. If you're not happy with the board, the board can be voted out. But in this system that we have, it's very, uh, it's very uh, how do you call it? Uh, it's very, uh, it's, it's, it's inflexible. No? Okay. And then I mentioned already, transparency and accountability are also important in the modern day, in modern day governance. All of these are supposed to add to um, add to a system that encourages more economic integration and participation. That, of course, justice and the rule of law. 
sorry, uh, just signal me if I'm already rambling too, too long, but uh, I also have to mention this. Um, Adam Smith says in The Wealth of Nations, okay, there is this misconception that, well, there's a misconception that the laissez-faire system, okay, or the system of, of free, free enterprise requires no government, government. But actually, if you read to read carefully, Adam Smith advocates a strong government. The three important roles of a government. First, to defend the country from outside, outside threat. Second, to protect each citizen from every other citizen. And this is the importance of the administration of justice and the rule of law. Okay? People should go unpunished if they hurt another citizen. And that has to be in place in a proper system. Now, and finally, there should be the adequate provision or the correct provision of public goods and services. Is the role of government. Okay, and then finally, it leads to social equilibrium. What is social equilibrium from my point of view? I said it's a balance of power in society. Okay, like I said, we don't have to hug each other and love each other, but at least we have to be at peace with each other. We, are, we have a healthy respect for each other, a mutual respect. Okay? That's how I would describe a society, an economy that is at peace and that is social equilibrium. This means that there are also certain policies and regulations that have to be put in place that contributes to this social equilibrium that also strengthens the system for resilience and inclusion, tolerance and mutual respect. Yeah. If I were to make reference to the Mongolian Empire before, there was actually a tolerance for all religion. No? And in fact, they found each religion interesting. But it also means that everyone was free to follow their path. They're free to, to express themselves as long as in expressing themselves, they do not harm others. Okay? So do no harm but you can exercise your individual liberty and be tolerant of everyone else. But that means we have to respect okay, everybody's choice. Okay? That means you have to put legislation in place which respects all okay, the people in a society. I know some with certain religious inclinations or religious uh, conservatism or orthodoxy might not agree with this, but it is necessary. No? After all, this is not a religious government, a government run by the religious. It's a government for all people. No? So we should respect that. And it will lead to this harmony and cooperation and peace and stability. Harmony and cooperation lead to the peace and stability, which imply that you already have achieved that level of inclusion and resilience that you'd like to see. And then it becomes uh, uh, how do you call it? Uh, a society, uh, it becomes a cycle, uh, a, a, pros a cycle of prosperity, meaning that it now attracts more investment, no? and then more and more investment. So it's a, it's a, the chicken and egg. No? If we uh, if we put all of these in place, this whole oops, if we put this in place, then we're going to achieve inclusion and resilience okay thank you very much thank you very much attorney abad it's very interesting his presentation about economic equilibrium makes you makes you hope and then he talks about the political climate, the political situation in the Philippines, and then makes you frustrated again. <laughs> but very insightful presentation, Attorney Abad. Moving on to our next speaker, we have uh, our next speaker will discuss imperative and practical solutions for a better business environment. Mr. Lars Wittig is the president of the European Chamber of Commerce of the Philippines, the oldest European chamber outside of Europe which provides support by facilitating market access and working on the creation of a level playing field for both European and Filipino companies. He is also the country manager of the International Workplace Group for the Philippines, Vietnam, 
Cambodia, Thailand, and South Korea. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Lars Wittig. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to Stratbase for the honor to be invited uh, to speak here today. Thank you uh, very much to Secretary Alba del Rosario, Founding Chair Nono Ibezeda, the old friends and audience, colleagues. I'm here to speak. Uh, actually, I will focus more on uh, inclusive growth uh, as we are moving forward. Uh, but what I've noticed in particular today is that everybody seemed very um, upbeat and optimistic about the future of the Philippines. And I don't think you would experience the same uh, optimism in uh, many other, most other countries in the world right now. I'm here as president of the European Chamber of Commerce, but what actually made me get that honorary title with is rather as chairman is really my day job uh, in the in the private sector. So um, attorney Abad, uh, he was wearing the uh, very f philosophical hat. He took it with him when he walked down again. So uh, I'm now wearing a, a virtual Viking cap uh, or helmet. So I think um, I came here in 92. I worked a lot with distribution into Saudi Saudi stores with Philip Morris, Coca-Cola company, Dole, Dole. And uh, basically it was mentioned this morning about the, uh, the Filipino population being at an average age of barely 25. That means my social security number in the Philippines is five years older than the average Filipino. So uh, with that background is probably what made me the chairman and thereby president of the European Chamber of Commerce, which coincidentally is the oldest European chamber uh, outside of Europe. And by the way, probably also the only foreign chamber in this country to actually be growing even during uh, COVID. Uh, as the members were seeing uh, much added value. We are quite big here. Um, today, we, um, we have six offices, uh, two in Mindanao, including uh, Kagandoro and Davao. In Visayas, we are, of course, in Cebu, um, but also opened a, a chapter and an office in Iloilo earlier this year and two in Luzon and Clark, and of course here in uh, Metro Manila with over 700 member companies, 23 committees, over 35 full-time employees. And when I'm speaking on behalf of the European uh, business community, it is not just EU, by the way, it is all of Europe. So also the Swiss business community. Uh, and uh, as well as the Norwegians, the British, etc., and they also basically most of um, uh, these countries, also non-EU countries, have companies represented on our board of directors. Uh, but we also are representing uh, Europe uh, with the joint foreign chambers, and uh, this is quite important in terms of the legislation and uh, the deliberations that are being uh, and hearings. Uh, in front of Senate, uh, et cetera, uh, because together with the Canadians, the Americans, Korea, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, we are representing over 3,000 uh, foreign companies. In, uh, just to add to the numbers, it's uh, 230 billion worth of annual trade and 33 billion of accumulated foreign direct investments into the Philippines. So every so often, the government will come to the foreign, uh, the joint foreign chambers and ask for our opinion. And it can also be the other way around. I think um, there have been very little mention today of uh, the uh, legislation, the many reforms that have been entered into uh, uh, during the, the, the most recent, I would say, 12 to 15 months. But the Public Service Act is one of those where we see the most groundbreaking uh, reform uh, made in several decades. Um, and in, in that regard, 
since it also pertained to uh, shipping, I guess they, all the foreign chambers, they decided that the Viking here had to represent everybody in front of the Senate hearing. Uh, there was an extraordinary hearing there, so I was given the hot chair. And for the same reason, when the uh, president uh, signed, uh, I also symbolically received uh, the Public Service Act signed by, by the president. Uh, that was really, really a major change and also a, a, a shift in the whole approach and embracement of foreign investments and uh, trade and local uh, uh, cooperation. The Retail uh, Act, the Foreign Investment Act, of course, also very important. But what was, it was mentioned earlier about the Constitution. Abad was talking about why not also amending the Constitution. By the way, I've also been, been um, together with John Forbes and the Canadians uh, uh, at the hearing in front of the committee for amending the Constitution, which we are very much for. Uh, amending because it is, as you may know, um, the only one of the few constitutions in the world that actually has restrictions on foreign investments. In that constitution was also the, the restrictions that were interpreted in such a way that foreign companies were limited on investments into sustainable energy with the wind and solar. That has just been changed. The Renewable uh, Energy Act implementation rules and regulations have been changed so that I believe from December 1st, uh, foreign companies can now own more than 40%, actually up to 100% uh, in investing into energy um, capabilities, generating power from those sustainable sources. So there's really a lot to be optimistic about. We already seen a lot of uh, changes uh, or new, new investments. Uh, as a result of the uh, Public Service Act amendments. Elon Musk was very quick at announcing Starlink becoming available to the Philippines. Uh, that's amazing uh, because that's the first ASEAN country. So uh, again, we are a first. We know from uh, Telco, if you recall, the third uh, Telco uh, 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 tender that, that took place before the Public Service Act amendments there was massive invest, uh, interest from providers from Europe, but it, some of them didn't even make a bid because they couldn't get a controlling part, um, part ownership uh, that has also been changed. So we expect massive investments there. And of course, aviation and domestic shipping alike. In terms of ease of doing business, it will always be, um, uh, a main area uh, to look at. And I think in, in this regard, we need to be compared to, um, basically, we need to com compare ourselves to uh, Vietnam and Indonesia. And I think it is important to see that we are on the right track here. I started by saying, I sense that there's a great deal of optimism. Abad was talking about, we have to be open to changes. I believe we have seen so many new amendments, new reforms, and it's ongoing with the new government. That's literally what they are teeing up for, that it is more important not just to see what is our position relative to the other ASEAN countries in particular, Indonesia and Vietnam, but also how are we moving? What is the trend? I mean, when I have a business review with my CEO, I always put emphasis on not only how we are doing year to date, but especially the last three months, what is the current momentum? And the current momentum is tremendous. If you look at uh, ease of doing business, the Philippines is rapidly closing the gap to the two other markets that I keep referring to. Uh, and we have closed it with 94 uh, points. Let me see. Uh, okay, I might have here. Yep, we have closed it with 29 points versus Vietnam and Indonesia, which um, are basically uh, stagnant in those regards. I think this is, yeah, the same. Um, ARTA uh, is starting to be an abbreviation for being at risk. Uh, that is, of course, I just need to put that in here. Uh, we, of course, would very much like to see uh, that uh, 
continued and preserved. And perhaps our good friend Paul Dasa, we should bring him back in in that regard. I see Nono down there smiling. Um, and so uh, the con continued focus um, and uh, greatest importance is, of course, of on our infrastructure. And there, again, we have some uh, very uh, like-minded people now at the helm, uh, especially at Department of uh, Transportation Secretary Jimmy Batista and his undersecretary uh, Bobby Lim. Uh, I think it is it's really the picture that we are so encouraged about with the, uh, at the European Chamber of Commerce right now is the new secretaries, they are truly subject matter experts. And when we were fighting and sometimes losing, or at least not even winning yet certain battles with the former administration, these profiles were on our side fighting our fight with us. And now they are uh, uh, at, at the government side. Finally, finally, it is, I have to wrap up now. Um, this morning in particular, almost every single speaker would refer to education, nutrition, and agriculture slash land reforms. I'm so delighted that so many have done that. Now I have the, the benefit of being one towards the end of uh, today's speakers. And it is just amazing to hear that so many of us are on exactly the same page in that regard, further adding to my optimism, which apparently I share with all of you. And with that note, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Lars Wittig. Moving on to our next speaker, he will be discussing improving the investment and trading conditions for foreign businesses. Mr. Chris Humphrey is the executive director of the uh, EU ASEAN Business Council, which is the primary voice for European business within the ASEAN region. He is a government affairs specialist and the business unit leader with a wealth of experience in developing and expanding businesses in the Asia Pacific region. Mr. Humphrey is currently on official travel, so he sent over a recording of his speech for today's event. Let's listen in. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. First, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak again at this most valuable conference. My apologies for not being with you in person and for not being able to present to you live. I've been asked to speak today about what it would take to improve the investment and trading conditions for foreign businesses in the Philippines. As you all know, the Philippines is a very dynamic and growing economy. It has plenty of positives from its people, its natural resources, its geographical position, and from being part of a group of countries that are presently at the center of global growth and also, unfortunately, some geopolitical tensions. I mean, of course, ASEAN. Today, I intend to look at the current situation and the perception of the Philippines how the country is presently faring in terms of trade and investment compared to others. And finally, what can be done to make the Philippines a more attractive place for foreign businesses, foreign investment, and foreign trade. As you can see from the graph on this slide, the Philippines trade and investment performance has been steady, generally improving, but far from spectacular. Spectacular is where you want to get to. Every year, the EU ASEAN Business Council undertakes an annual business sentiment survey, a kind of snapshot of views of European businesses across the ASEAN region on a variety of topics and issues. I will not bore you the full results, just some headlines that are pertinent to today's discussion. The survey has good news for the ASEAN region as a whole. It is still seen, indeed more so this year, as the region of best economic opportunity over the next five years. The next country or region on the list 
was China at just 11%, a long way behind ASEAN 63%. And with the Philippines, it showed a majority of respondents based in the country as saying they were looking to expand their operations over the next two years, just below the ASEAN average, but still in positive territory. That is good news as well. The less good news, and it's important going forward for trade and investment, is that the general feeling was that not enough is being done to green the economy. More needs to be done, and more needs to be seen to be done on this. If not, going forward, businesses from Europe or elsewhere, simply will not be able to make investments in your economy. Their regulators will not let them, their investors will not let them, their shareholders will not let them, and more importantly, their own customers will not let them. This is not an EU Green Deal thing. It is a fact of modern life. I know steps are being done in the Philippines, but those steps need to be accelerated. A kind of way to look at how the Philippines has been faring in terms of its trade and investment performance is to look at one of your near neighbors in ASEAN, Vietnam. Similar sized countries, both in ASEAN. But one quick look at this table, where the information is drawn from the ASEAN Statistical Yearbook, will show you how Vietnam has been outperforming the Philippines since 2012. Unemployment in the Philippines is essentially flat. GDP has nearly doubled. Trading goods has more than doubled. The same for FDI flows, and the balance of trade has gone from negative to a very healthy surplus. Sadly, the Philippines has not kept pace, and your balance of trade has worsened. The other graphs on this page show that Vietnam has been accelerating away from the Philippines, both on trade and investment, and is also attracting more FDI. Vietnam, in fact, did not see any fall in its exports to the EU during the COVID period. The numbers just kept on going up. So how can the Philippines improve on its economic performance, make itself more attractive for trade and investment? It's not all doom and gloom. I can assure you of that. As a nation, the Philippines has many positives and much to be proud of, and a strong base to build from as well. Your economy is growing. It is growing out of the worst ravages of COVID-19. You still have great, inventive, adaptable people. You have the resources. It is unlocking the potential of all of that, all of those great things that you have, which is the key to getting more trade and more investment coming in. Personally, I have faith in a very bright future for the Philippines. You have a new economic team in government. I've seen them in action already. They are business friendly, dynamic, and are already putting the Philippines on the map. At the end of this year, there will be a big political summit in Europe between the EU and ASEAN. Your president and his economic team will be there, and they will be speaking at our own ASEAN-EU business summit on the 13th of December in Brussels. They will be pressing the flesh and making the case for more trade and more investment from Europe. Secondly, the Philippines must ratify RCEP. This is the world's largest trade deal. It is a good deal. There is nothing to be feared from it, including from your agricultural sector. One reason why Vietnam has done so well is the sheer number of trade deals that it has done. Bilateral deals, such as one with the EU that has clearly driven up the trade numbers, and multilateral deals, such as CPTPP and RCEP. Trade deals will spur increases in trade and investment for the Philippines. There can be no doubt about that. So please ratify RCEP and implement RCEP to the fullest extent possible. You need to continue to review and enhance investment policies and trade policies and regulations to make your economy as open as possible for foreign investment. Open up more sectors for foreign investment and majority foreign investment. This might mean getting creative in how some laws are drafted because of the nature of your constitution, but it has been done before. This will bring new investments and new investments into much needed areas such as power and telecoms and infrastructure and agriculture, etc. Philippines has also been a strong champion of ASEAN. The region is just beginning to do a review of the ASEAN Trades and Goods Agreement. I hope the Philippines will push 
for strong advances on this, particularly in the area of the elimination of non-tariff barriers to trade and increased customs automation. Both of these hold back improvements in intra-ASEAN trade to the detriment of your own exporters and to the detriment of your own consumers. Excellencies. And to the distinguished guests, ladies and more gentlemen. Investment into your country. First, I would like to thank Push the ASEAN Board for inviting me to deliver on its promises at this most valuable conference. will be so much easier. My apologies for not being with you in person and for not being able to present to you live. I was in Brussels last week. So I've been asked to speak today about what it would take to improve the investment of the investment in trading between the EU for foreign businesses and in the Philippines. You have As seen you all know, significant improvements the Philippines is a very dynamic and growing economy with Europe. It has plenty of positives the same. from its people, I know its natural resources, and its, its geographical position. The case. And from being part of the group of EU countries has meetings that are presently at the centre of global growth, and it's also, unfortunately, some geopolitical tensions. I mean, of course, ASEAN. Today, I intend to look at the current situation and the perception of the Philippines, how the country is presently faring in terms of trade and investment compared to others. And finally, what can be done to make the Philippines a more attractive place for foreign businesses, foreign investment and foreign trade? As you can see from the graph on this slide, the Philippines trade and investment performance has been steady, generally improving, but far from spectacular. Spectacular is where you want to get to. Every year, the EU ASEAN Business Council undertakes an annual business sentiment survey, a kind of snapshot of views of European businesses across the ASEAN region on a variety of topics and issues. I will not bore you with the full results, just some headlines that are pertinent to today's discussion. The survey has good news for the ASEAN region as a whole. It is still seen, indeed more so this year, as the region of best economic opportunity over the next five years. The next country or region on the list was China at just 11%, a long way behind ASEAN's 63%. And for the Philippines, it showed a majority of respondents based in the country as saying they were looking to expand their operations over the next two years, just below the ASEAN average, but still in positive territory. That is good news as well. The less good news, and it's important going forward for trade and investment, is that the general feeling was that not enough is being done to green the economy. More needs to be done, and more needs to be seen to be done on this. If not, going forward, businesses from Europe or elsewhere simply will not be able to make investments in your economy. Their regulators will not let them, their investors will not let them, their shareholders will not let them, and more importantly, their own customers will not let them. This is not an EU Green Deal thing. It is a fact of modern life. I know steps are being done in the Philippines, but those steps need to be accelerated. A good way to look at how the Philippines has been faring in terms of its trade and investment performance is to look at one of your near neighbors in ASEAN, Vietnam. Similar sized countries, both in ASEAN. But one quick look at this table, where the information is drawn from the ASEAN Statistical Yearbook, will show you how Vietnam has been outperforming the Philippines since 2012. Unemployment in the Philippines is essentially flat. GDP has nearly doubled. Trading goods has more than doubled. The same for FDI flows. And the balance of trade has gone from negative to a very healthy surplus. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for having me here. It's an honor. Um, now, I have a subject, a topic here that I'm supposed to cover in 10 minutes. Uh, so I have to, to fly as a helicopter <laughs> and broach uh, different topics. Uh, but I have a privilege because my uh, distinguished co speakers have already touched on all these subjects. So I can really make a quick tour of what has been, uh, has been said. Now I'm, uh, the EU perspective is an outside perspective. Outside perspective has uh, shortcomings, but it's uh, how 
it seemed from outside. Uh, I am quite new in the Philippines, just a few months, so I'm still starting my journey of learning the Philippines. Uh, but I know very well what new stakeholders think, what the politician thinks, what society thinks in Europe, where our trade policy, our economic policy is going. So where is the convergence? Um, let me take the EU perspectives in four parts. First, the raw figures. Then the question of the macroeconomics, business environment, and to the end, the framework. All very short since I have, I think, 10 minutes. On the raw figures, well, the EU is the Philippines' fourth trading partner. And given the realities of geography, quite far apart, that's normal. It's actually quite good. However, if you look at the trade structure, 82% of Philippine exports are electronics and in particular semiconductors, 60%, 16% agriculture. So there's little diversification. There's actual imbalance in the structure of Philippine exports uh, to the European Union. And even though the EU GSP plus offers tariff freedom for 66% of the tariff line. So only few tariff lines are actually used by Philippine exporters. So there's a potential here, I think, or an opportunity. Now from the overall picture, quite interesting as well. The ASEAN as a block is the third most important economic partner of the European Union outside Europe. So after China and, and, and the United States, I set aside Switzerland or uh, the UK, our immediate neighbors, where of course, with whom of course our economic uh, relationship is very close. If you look at the Philippines, the Philippines are the sixth partner amongst the ASEAN countries. So overall that makes the Philippines the 40th economic partner of the European Union. So this also shows, and we have a tendency in the EU to always look at ASEAN and to, to look where, where uh, the countries are positioned vis-a-vis -vis European Union in ASEAN. You heard it also from my predecessors. Um, so here again, seems to there's a lot of opportunities and potential. So why do European companies choose to rather trade and invest with other ASEAN countries? There's a lot of untapped potential here. We have heard about it. Why is this potential, potentially, this untapped potential so far sometimes left aside? Now, some people told me this has historic reasons because for a long time, the US were here and the European companies were latecomers to the country. I don't know whether this is true. They have been later than in other ASEAN countries. Um, there's also the geographic distance. But uh, let us also look at other aspects that uh, were also broached by the predecessors. So the macroeconomy is one of them. Interesting economic figures, economic growth, GDP growth, which was announced, which goes, is much better than expected, 7.6%. There will be a slowdown in the next years due to the international environment. But if you look at the perspectives, it's still quite high. It's in particular quite high if we look from Europe, where you heard Ambassador Véran, we are quite disappointed about our own economic growth. So it remains, the Philippines will remain even with a slowdown according to the, to the perspectives, uh, the, the uh, let's say, the, um, uh, the look ahead with the second highest growth rate in the next, next uh, years. Second thing is looking further ahead, we hear from external experts, from experts in the Philippines, quite upbeat forecasts, Philippines being about uh, amongst the five uh, 
uh, top emerging economies in the next 10 years, uh, Oxford economics. So all this combined with economic reforms give lots of opportunities and companies are starting to talk to us, starting to talk to the chambers in particular in the sector of infrastructure, renewable energies, environment. But there's more to do. And um, maybe we all need to, to do a better job also to bring this message back to Europe on a broader basis and also to the medium-sized and small-sized companies. Second element or my third perspective is the business environment. Now here, well, there are the direct quantifiable, item, quantifiable items, uh, cost of doing business, salaries, energy and logistic costs, uh, taxes, incentives, market access, market size, purchasing power, etc. I'm not touching that. I think this is all known. This is part of the uh, general competitiveness. But there's also the qualitative aspect. And uh, there you come into, you know, perceived risks, sustainability, good governance, public service, et cetera. And there you go into the indexes and you go into, into perceptions and also perceptions in Europe, perceptions here. I was at the PCCI conference a month ago, the PCCI business conference and uh, President Barcelon and uh, his colleagues talked about uh, what they are wishing from the government was addressing red tape, sanctity of contracts, tax reform, infrastructure projects, digitalization, all points we have already heard this afternoon, and in particular education. Now, if I talk to our companies, they say actually say education is a comparative advantage of the Philippines. Um, it's it's the, the skills, it's the commitment of the workers. There's also one important factor is that that uh, Europeans and uh, the Philippines understand each other without an interpreter. So the Europeans have the language skills to talk to, to you. This is important. On education, I think the, the concern is rather whether this comparative advantage is, is diminishing also in, in, in view of sustainability, digitalization, etc. But there's something else. And there I would like to follow up on Ambassador Ver. And um, Senan Palada has mentioned that earlier, the sustainability. And this is something where the European companies are very much looking at. Also, um, uh, Chris Sumfrey mentioned that. And sustainability, environment, climate, human rights, labor rights, good governance. This has become very central. And you heard Chris Humphrey, the companies have to look at that. The, the customers want that, the users want that, the investors want that, their banks want that. So this is what has become quite central. On top of that, Luc Ferrand mentioned it, there is more and more legislation in the European Union which imposes due diligence requirements on European companies, whether they deal inside the European, uh, inside the European Union or with their outside trading partners. And that means they have to have a closer look again how their partners are dealing with the sustainability issue. So this really becomes a central <coughs> element also in the perspective from, from the European Union and how EU companies view the opportunities uh, they have around the world. Um, so there's more and more uh, coming up there and uh, the European companies will have to put more and more views on that. And I will just want to give you two, two examples. Uh, the other day there was an index on internet freedom and it was quite striking to see that actually the Philippines are at the top in ASEAN on that. No? It's an interesting, interesting thing. And then, uh, and this is also something that uh, Mikhail Gerin has mentioned. We had a trace bribery index in, on the front page of a business daily in Manila last week. And again, yesterday on the global corruption index where uh, the Philippines is at, uh, at a fifth place in ASEAN. Now, these are indexes. I cannot judge. I'm not, uh, not an expert on this, but this is what people are looking at. And also uh, foreign investors or traders are looking at, and they have to look at it. Because in the European Union, active corruption is a criminal liability. Uh, so uh, also within the European Union, when you, when you go abroad. So this is something that simply our companies and our uh, stakeholders 
are looking at. So it's a lot about the concrete figures. It's also about perceptions. It's about also bringing over back to Europe where these developments are, are going. And we see that there's a lot happening, uh, which uh, makes, uh, makes us all very optimistic. Finally, very quickly, because I have to, I'm told that I have to wrap up. <laughs> uh, I want, of course, to mention the, the, the framework of all this. We mentioned the GSP, the GSP plus. I think it could be used more broadly. Uh, there was the mentioning of an FTA. So, Attorney Abad, we dream. <laughs> and, you know, I think we, uh, one day we will get there. I don't know when, but, uh, you know, things, things have also to move in place. It's a, diff it's a different subject, so I don't want to too much to bro uh, broach it. But I think also uh, that was also something Chris Humphrey mentioned. RCEP will give an important signal about uh, the readiness of the Philippines to engage in international uh, trade agreements. That's uh, also a signal we will, uh, we will perceive. Uh, and uh, then, uh, you know, it's all, all about getting all these elements into a right place. So that was uh, very short. I can see that uh, European business is increasingly interested in, in the Philippines. Um, and uh, that there's a lot of potential, which is, is untapped, but which is coming up, which is opening up. And uh, the key question is, how can we, can we use that? That was my helicopter flight, uh, very short. Uh, I thank you very much for your interest and, and attention and uh, wish you all uh, an excellent continuation of the afternoon. Thank you very much. Ah, okay, <laughs> sure, all right. Thank you, sir. So I'll ask you, sir, to stay here. We'll, we'll now proceed to our open forum. And we would also like to call back on stage our speakers, Mr. Uh, Senen Perlada, Mr. Michael Guarin, Attorney Anthony Abad, Mr. Lars Wittig, and uh, yeah, Mr. Philip. <laughs> all right. And uh, to moderate our open forum, we have Attorney Karen Jimeno. She is the Director and Chief Legal Counsel of SoftCap Partners. She is also the host of The Way Forward, a new show of CNN Philippines, that discusses burning issues impacting the Philippines and Asia. Her former roles in government include Undersecretary for the Presidential Management Staff, Undersecretary for the De Department of Public Works and Highways, and Legal Counsel for the Senate Committee on Ethics of the 17th Congress. Attorney Karen, you may start now. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. And I recognize that we have all the panelists for the next session. So we will make this very quick, and we apologize that we went into overtime. So what we'll do is have each of the panel members answer a question each, and we'll have to limit your answers to two minutes. So seeing how you all uh, went over time, this is going to be a little tricky, but let's try to do this. Okay, so... Listening to all of you, I had some of quotable quotes from what you said, and I'll be asking questions related to some of the things that you said. So, Senen, you said that COVID-19 revealed structural weaknesses in both the global and the Philippine economy. Can you name one major structural weakness in the Philippine economy that needs to be addressed in the short term? Okay, I guess uh, for a country, um, basically following the private sector, we need to look into the concept of business continuity. We are a very, we are an at-risk country, right? So we, we face this, well, practically every month, no? we, we, are, we are visited by no less than 20 typhoons every year. Um, and then we have this, uh, we have this um, health crisis that happens. No? And it's got, uh, it, it made us learn a lot of things and realize that there are so many things internal that we really have to address. And I refer particularly uh, to exports. I did mention that exports was not placed on lockdown, if you remember. Okay? It was one of the sectors we said, you know, the Philippines has to show the world that we are uh, going to be able to 
fulfill our commitments. We, we would be able to uh, supply products that uh, we, we can. Uh, we said that even for medical for medical uh, products for medical use, you know, masks and everything, that we would not, we, we would continue to export and not just keep it to ourselves, et cetera. But then you look at how local governments, for example, implement their rules on lockdowns, uh, all of these passes and all of that. So we realized that really we must look at ourselves and how we can address uh, the concerns of our business community and individual persons in order to address and have this kind of continuity. Okay, then, of course, you know, we also saw that um, the adoption of digitalization, and we saw a very big digital divide. Um, yes, we were able to do a lot of things, but at the same time, uh, we also saw that uh, we do need uh, to address um, uh, digitalization and the benefits that we can reap out of it. Thank you. So one is the digital divide and, of course, continuity. Michael, you said that the RCEP is a low-hanging fruit that we can achieve. Why is that? First, because uh, we're only waiting for the ratification from, from the Senate. And number two, all of the agreements are in place. We know who the trade partners are, what the benefits and obligations from each country is no so it's there it's been present for the past couple of years already so um, and by uh, ratifying the rcep again it, it will prove that the country continues to be in business it shows that we are open to uh, new investments and that the philippine economy is indeed ready no to be an active a trading partner with all of these other countries. Thank you, Michael. Tony, you gave the most philosophical uh, speech, I think. And you said that good economy is negated by bad politics. And you talked a lot about equilibrium. So I guess connecting the two, how far is the Philippines from an equilibrium to have an inclusive growth? Two minutes. <laughs> two minutes. Okay. Hi. Okay. I know you promised a hard question. So um, there's, a, there's actually a study on the economic impact of constitutions um, that um, constitutions that are authoritarian in nature uh, may lead to the correct economic policy. But there's always the risk that the authoritarian system will, will change its mind or do something. So it doesn't, doesn't work in step. In other words, you're, you're trying to have economic competition, openness, economic integration. But at the same time, you have to have also a political system that facilitates that. And if you really are, are serious about inclusion and resilience, then you have to have more participation in the actual governance process, the public expenditure, passage of laws. Um, the people have to have a say in it. So you can't have a system that's well, uh, for lack of a better word, authoritarian or concentrated uh, power. Thank you. In less than two minutes, I think, right? <laughs> now we'll go to Lars. Lars, um, I appreciated the slide that showed the policy reforms that were completed with the advocacy also of the EU uh, Chamber of Commerce. Uh, what other policy reforms May name one that's very important that you think you should be achieved in the very short term. Well, I would like to say, actually, they just completed the one that was most important, and that was the IARs on the allowing the foreign ownership in, uh, to invest in sustainable energy. Otherwise, I mean, of course, we still have to um, expect to see the corporate taxes to uh, to be brought down further, and uh, and we need to see. It's all about the implementation to a very high degree today. Uh, the PPPs, there's all the right intentions, but I also think that it is really uh, something that the country cannot succeed with without. And as it was emphasized by another speaker earlier, 
the the uh, the public debt is now up to 60 percent or just over 60 percent of gdp by european standards that's very very low so uh, it's of course a result of COVID that it increased but COVID hit us at the absolute best time possible the economy had never been stronger in over 50 years public debt had never been lower but to move forward now with investments needed we just have to be very very uh, good at implementing thank you Philip, well, I think I'll also ask a question um, that's related to something that Chris said. Um, but first, something that I, I found very um, quotable from what you said is that outside perspective is a limited perspective, but it's how outsiders look at things. And when it comes to metrics, that's something that's indisputable. Uh, I think Lars also showed like the ease of doing business where we slightly improved, but we're still 95th out of 190 economies. And that's also an indisputable metric that we're not very good at ease of doing business. And you mentioned this in relation to in the EU where uh, active corruption is a criminal liability. So I think here, one of the things that is uh, really a big barrier would be that ease of doing business. And when you're trying to improve that, you can't also engage in any form of corruption, including, you know, directly talking to regulators where any type of favors can be exchanged. So how do you think um, this can be improved um, by the Philippines or how important is the improvement of this to make the Philippines attractive for foreign and EU investments? Okay, thank you for that. Um, as I said, I'm not an expert on, on that, but uh, and it, uh, it goes a bit out of the economic realm. Yeah, so, uh, but I think what uh, and you know, we, we in, in Europe, we also have regularly to confront such issues. Huh? Um, uh, but uh, I think generally what, uh, of course, helps is, is a, is a non-tolerance uh, framework also from the justice. And uh, um, I think that would already, already help to, uh, to remove, uh, you know, to, to make it less easy. It's not an easy answer because I think uh, it's it's uh, it just depends on 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 with you know the place uh, the type of institution etc. So there is no I think there is no uh, no easy answer to that. But uh, I think the tolerance for uh, corruption in in the society as large, but also how justice uh, goes about it, about compliance in the companies very important i think it has to be a management issue in companies that at at the highest management level um people look at that and uh, and work on that um uh, that there's also consensus that um uh, one doesn't vote to that that uh, you know it's easy to say that huh? uh, but uh, that's probably where uh, where you would look at but uh, i don't think there's a there's a simple recipe to that huh? yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll give you one more question because uh, you got the shortest time for for speaking. Um, on what um, Chris also said uh, in terms of EU and the FDA, do you think an EU foreign trade agreement would be helpful for the Philippines to attract more investments or trade? My neighbor just gave an answer. <laughs> <laughs> I would have repeated. <laughs> No, of course. So um, I think first, uh, it's it's of course for the Philippine business to answer that question uh, in first place. But I think uh, what it does is it does just make close the ties, the economic ties, closer. It um, you know an FTA uh, if it is well done, well implemented. If it's also if it is ambitious enough, we're not talking about simply reducing tariffs. We're talking about a broader market access. We're talking open, opening to investments, but also services, procurement. We're talking about property rights. Uh, all this facilitates the economic uh, interaction and, and, and link. 
and uh, it will create jobs. It will uh, it will uh, generate know-how transfer, uh, not only in the Philippines, also in European Union. Maybe in relative terms, the impact will be less visible in the European Union. That's possible, but still, I mean, we we value this very much. Uh, we we have uh, in our uh, you know, in the treaties of the European Union, we, we have the promotion of free trade because we are deeply convinced that free trade leads to prosperity, leads to jobs, and also leads to, 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 to peace, to social peace. You, you have told it earlier. But, um, and, and this is our conviction, and this is how we, how we, uh, we work. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know why it would be different from a, from, a, from a Philippine perspective, but I think there's a lot of experts here from the Philippines who, who can, can take that point of view as well. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you. Philip. Yeah. And Lars raised his hand. He wants to have the last word. With yeah, uh, I would just like to add that uh, you cannot just simply separate uh, foreign trade from foreign investment. Uh, ASEAN, or rather... You, Europe combined is the single largest investor into ASEAN, accumulated 330 billion US dollars. Only 4.7% of that has been directly into the Philippines. Now, we keep comparing to Vietnam, which are ga gaining a, a, a giant share of foreign investments. Vietnam has free trade agreement with, with Europe. Of course, it's more attractive to put up a factory in Vietnam when there's free trade and you can freely export back to any of the EU markets. So of course, free trade for the Philippines also makes it more enticing to invest and put up manufacturing here so that you can export back. Very great answer. Thank you so much. And we made it very concise for all of you. I'm so sorry again that we went over time, but uh, thank you for our panel, Michael, Sen, and um, Philip and Tony <laughs> and Lars. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much again, Attorney Karen, and to our panelists. That was a brief but very insightful discussion. <laughs> Thank you very much again to our speakers. The quarantine measures imposed by the government throughout the country in response to the COVID-19 pandemic resulted in severe disruptions to the economy. Nonetheless, the Philippines has a cohesive, efficient, and innovative private sector, which demonstrated its capacity to help keep the economy afloat amid the public health emergency. However, a supportive government is crucial for the private sector to thrive. A productive synergy creates a domino effect that can address the most urgent socioeconomic challenges and uplift the lives of millions of Filipinos. For the next part of our program, we will go straight to another panel discussion. That will be moderated by attorney Michael Toledo the Director for Government Relations and Public Affairs of the Metro Pacific Investments uh, Corporation. He is also the Managing Director of the MVP Group of Companies Media Bureau, which is involved in telecoms, media, power, water, infrastructure, hospitals, agriculture, and natural resources development. He is currently Chairman of the Chamber of Mines of the Philippines and the Chief Operating Officer of Silangan Mindanao Mining Company Incorporated, a copper and gold project in Surigao del Norte, 
Attorney Toledo writes a regular column in the Philippine Star and is also a host of One News Channel's Titans on Signal TV. But before I pass on the microphone to Attorney Mike, I would also like to introduce first and call on stage our panelists. First off, we have a Mr. Cesar Bong Consing, the president and CEO of Ayala Corporation. He is an investment banker who served as the president and CEO of the Bank of the Philippine Islands for nearly a decade. During his stint in international banking, Mr. Consing was a partner at the Rohalin Group and served as president of JP Morgan Securities Limited, where he headed a firm's investment banking business in the region. So maybe call on Mr. Consing on stage, please. Thank you, sir. Joining us through Zoom is Ms. Cosette Canilao, the president and CEO of Aboitis Infra. Oh, so I'm sorry about that, ma'am. Okay, joining us here live in the Yellow Museum is Ms. Cosette Canilao, the president and CEO of Aboitis Infra Capital, which is the infrastructure arm of the Aboitis Group. She has over 20 years of experience in commercial and investment banking, transaction advisory, and infrastructure. Ms. Canilao was the former executive director of the Public-Private Partnership Center of the Philippines and was the former managing director for PPP Advisory at Atkins Equity. Ms. Canilao, may we invite you on stage, please? Thank you, ma'am. Okay. Uh, next, we have Mr. Alfredo Alpanglilio. He is the president and CEO of PLBP Incorporated and its subsidiary Smart Communications Incorporated. He holds various leadership positions within the, PL, the PLDT group. He was also the senior vice president and the head of customer retail services and corporate communications at Manila Electric Company. A veteran executive who started his career with IBM Philippines, Mr. Panlilio has received multiple local and international awards for customer management and business communication excellence throughout his career of more than 30 years. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Alpan Guillo. Next, we have Mr. Christian Gonzalez. Mr. Gonzalez is the Executive Vice President and Chief Risk Officer and Chief Sustainability Officer of the International Container Terminal Services Incorporated. He is currently the global corporate head of the ICTSI group and was previously senior vice president and regional head for Asia Pacific. Mr. Gonzalez also serves as president of the ICTSI foundation and is a director of Bloomberry Resorts Corporation and Prime Infrastructure Capital Incorporated. Mr. Gonzalez, we invite you on stage. We also have Ms. Riza Mantaring, CEO of Sun Life Financial Philippines from 2009 until her retirement in 2018, after which she assumed the chairmanship of Sun Life Financial Philippine Holding uh, Company up to 2019. She was also president of the Management Association of the Philippines and the Philippine Life Insurance Association. Ms. Mantaring currently serves on the board of trustees of the Makati Business Club and is also its treasurer. She is a board member of the Philippine Business for Education. Uh, Ma'am, may we invite you on stage? Thank you very much. And we have Ms. Maria Aurora Giotina Garcia. Ma um, Maria Aurora Boots Giotina Garcia is the founding chair and president of the Philippine Women's Economic Network, a coalition of women's business organizations advocating the economic empowerment of women. She is also the president of Magio Consulting Incorporated and a former chairperson of the Basis Conversion and Development Authority from 2015 to 2016. She has advised private and public sector clients in various aspects of corporate finance, such as mergers and acquisitions, capital raising, restructuring, among others, for more than 25 years. May we call on stage Ms. Maria Aurora Garcia. And now uh, to start the panel discussion, may we call on uh, attorney Mike.
Good afternoon, everyone. Before we formally start, I would just like you to know that this also served as some sort of a screen test for a possible show on TV5. Uh, I've been lobbying for a talk show, but so far to no avail. So I am hoping that uh, we have representatives from TV5, One News, maybe even GMA7, but we So anyway, levity aside again, a uh, pleasant good afternoon to everyone. And I would like to thank the organizers, of course, led by no less than Ambassador Del Rosario, a dear friend. Mr. Ambassador, partner, always good to see you, sir. And of course, in my view, a truly living hero in our midst, ladies and gentlemen. Let's give him a warm round of applause. And of course, I'd like to thank, as always, my dear friend, we serve under the Estrada administration. That's how young we are. Uh, Dindu Manhit, who now heads a, a strat base, of course, and his brother, RP, and uh, of course, Orly. Again, congratulations. I think this is the nth time that you've asked me to moderate the penultimate uh, activity of the day. Of course, just to be clear and to the BIR, no talent fee involved here. It's all gratis et amore. Maybe a bottle of single malt later on, uh, won't hurt, but it's a Macallan 30 years. Okay. Anyway, levity aside, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to again, of course, welcome all the distinguished members of the panel. Uh, when I saw the list of the members of the panel, I said, whoa, as always, uh, you never disappoint us, Dindo. The panel members are always really heavyweights in their respective fields. And definitely this panel is as heavyweight as the other ones in terms of reputation, integrity, and expertise. So thank you on behalf of the uh, ADR and of that base for being here. Now let's go to the tacit hand. Uh, our uh, topic for today is uh, business value creation, paving the path for inclusive growth. Um, if I ask a question, it could be addressed to all. Uh, should you wish to answer, just answer immediately. Uh, there may be some specific questions. Uh, let's see how it plays out. If you want to comment on the, what was said by an earlier speaker, please do so. I do not know if we have time for an open forum, but if we do, we'll have, uh, ask questions from the, from the audience. So um, we all know that after this, uh, well, it's not even over, but the pandemic has really caused a lot of havoc as far as the economy is concerned. It has ravaged and scarred the economy that's uh, given. And we all know that for us to recover from this pandemic and continue perhaps with a, a sustainable long-term economic growth, we have to shift from more investment-led uh, activities rather than just rely on consumption. Um, so what do you think is the ideal policy direction and concrete steps that need to be undertaken by the government to attain this goal? Uh, may I ask, if you don't mind, my good friend, a very good golfer, Bong Kun Singh, to uh, answer that question first. Uh, it's nothing to do with the fact that I, you're with Ayala and it starts with the letter A. <laughs> That's a tough one, Mike. I, I'm, I'm tempted to look at the uh, examples of, the, of, of, say, China, Korea, Japan, uh, post-World War II. And the, the objective there was really to transfer resources devoted to consumption towards investment, right? And uh, you might say that in many cases, they overdid it, right? I mean, Japan, Japan adopted this beggar thy neighbor policy, 
and, and China really went extreme, right? It almost starved the consumer in, on behalf of investment. But we need some of that. We need some of that because unless you have, have a real uh, significant transfer of resource allocation, um, we're, we, we will never have, we will never rebuild our manufacturing sector. Right. I mean, just just look just look around. I mean, for a uh, we are the uh, in on a per capita basis, we are the poorest triple B plus country in the world. And yet look at our consumer goods. Right. I mean, there's, you, you can find everything here. Right. Far in excess of what you would find in, in equal uh, in equal economies. So clearly there's a there's there's a misbalance. Thank you, Bob. Any of the ladies first? Is that right? <laughs> oh, by the way, uh, I, I've heard rumors about you. That's not true. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, but there's nothing really new to say that that's uh, not been said by the previous panel. But mm -hmm. again, continuous uh, review of policies and aligning and developing policies that would uh, enhance the environment for businesses. Uh, that's what we continuously need. Uh, the government, of course, uh, continue. Uh, uh, they need to do that. And at the same time, uh, you know, um, having this, uh, and, and it's better right now, I suppose, no, or maybe it's just me, the better collaboration or venue for interaction and uh, frank discourse on, on how to create an enabling environment. And I think we have that now, which is a, a good uh, development, right? If, if, I'm, if I may add, uh, while this has been spoken about, talk about our competitive in index, our investment grade, I think there's, there's still a lot of room to improve on these two particular matrices, which are really uh, considerations of foreign investors, even local investors in making local investments. And just to comment on um, Bong's point about moving into manufacturing, I think it's about time we do adopt a production mindset. Okay, let's, I think there's been a lot of focus on services really because of the talent that we have and the, the, uh, the strong characteristics of our, of our citizens. But I think it's about time we do take a look more seriously about producing more locally, especially for local consumption which is in dearth, I think. I guess, Mike, just, just two things to add. I think one is when I was in Meralco a few years ago, um, the way you break up the energy pie uh, consumption, industrial, um, 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 a, a, a consumer, which is really household and, and commercial, is 30-30% each almost, roughly 33% each. But only 10,000 of of the customers contributed 33% of manufacturing, of, of industrial. So clearly, clearly lack of uh, in, um, manufacturing companies that invest in the country. And I think if you talk about manufacturing, it's an investment that's long-term for the country. I know services are excellent, are good, but anytime you know, something happens, it's easy to, like, like um, the, the um, uh, BPO industry was a, a significant industry for us, but. No, you have injust competition and the rest. But look at Pogo and how easy the Pogo industry um, are leaving the country, right? So, and, and I think second item, I think um, to add to Cosette's uh, comments, I think um, there are more opportunities to dialogue with government today. I'm actually part of the private sector advisory council. Yes. Uh, there are five uh, significant pillars that has been uh, the focus of our president, uh, agriculture, healthcare, um, jobs to jobs, um, um, BBB, which is build, 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 and tourism. And where I'm a part of is, is the digital infrastructure. So clearly the president is pushing for digitalization across the country and, and, and really empowering Filipinos and digitizing every Filipino. So I think those dialogues help because I think at the end of the day, the policies, you know, technologies change so rapidly that, you know, unfortunately, I don't want to say this, but our regulators have to catch up terms of how other countries are regulating technology and, and what are the new policies that can be uh, enhancing um, our economy. Thank you all, yeah. And now it's build better more, BBM. 
Riza. Yeah. I, mean, I almost feel like the previous speakers already gave us a very long discourse on what's needed for us to stimulate investment in the country. And as Cosette said, it's creating an enabling environment. But the other thing that I just like to add is we look at the what are the barriers to business? What discourages people from investing? Well, obviously, one is ease of doing business, which all of us know. I don't know why it's called ease of doing business because it seems more like it's lack unease, lack of ease or disease in doing business. But um, one, and the other one is human capital. And uh, we score pretty low on the human capital index compared to other countries like Vietnam, et cetera. So that comes from our education, from our uh, um, well, nutrition, healthcare. Also, they look at what's the innovation mindset in the country, and then our critical thinking, our business skills. And of course, digital is the third one that uh, everyone's looking for. And that's, you, you can't escape it globally. That's, that's, uh, that's important. But one thing I'd like to add also is money is the most cowardly of objects. So if you're investing billions into the country, you have to be certain that the rules won't suddenly change. So sanctity of contracts, I think, will be important. Transparency is important. And um, rule of law is important uh, to encourage people to invest in the country. So from a policy direction, I think the, we really need to send very clear signals that uh, those are the contracts that you enter into now will be respected. Because if you look at Vietnam, what's one reason why they're so progressive? And other people have told me this who've invested there. Because in Vietnam, you know, 30 years from now, the rules will be the same. Well, talking about predictability and respect of the rule of law and rule of contracts, uh, we had so much experience with that. Uh, but we are hoping under this new administration, there will be definitely a respect for the rule of law and, of course, the sanctity of contracts. Because at the end of the day, what business abhors is uh, not being able to predict properly. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're going to say, for example, I I'm now with the Chamber of Mines. If you say, okay, taxes will be at 50%, whatever, but, but tell us in advance so we can properly plan. But if you're going to say this is the tax and yet after two years you change it, because that, that's, how, that's not how business plan things. We have a five-year plan, you have a 10-year plan. So definitely predictability is crucial. Christian. Um, in, in order to, to drive the manufacturing industry, to attract foreign investment in, in, in manufacturing, um, you, you have to have a privatization and infrastructure program that's driven by a broader strategy that's meant to support all of that. Right now in this country, infrastructure privatization is done piecemeal in isolation, right? Someone has an unsolicited proposal there. Someone wants to build something over here. Government wants to invest there. For what? For what purpose? Where, where is the master plan of creating industrial zones in, in areas that are already connected to the global marketplace? Where is the master plan to, to create infrastructure in places that will later become sites for, for industrial and commercial areas that will be meant to be connected to the, to the global marketplace? Unless we start thinking based on a broader infrastructure plan and move out of this isolated um, system of, of, of privatization and, and, and building infrastructure. Um, frankly, we, we will not accelerate foreign investment nor manufacturing in, in the way we all want. You know, the very, very good point that you raised there, Christian, because there seems to be a lack of a whole of country approach as far as building infrastructure is concerned. And I think it's not a lot. There's none. There's none. That's even worse. And a clear example for that, for example, is what happened in the common station. I don't have to delve into the details, but you know what happened there, the common station where an MRT3, LRT1, and MRT7 are all supposed to connect. And the mere fact that it's so sad that we have a railway system, but they're not connected. I mean, ideally, LRT1, LRT2, and MRT3 should be connected, but for one reason or the other, they're not. So we don't know why and how that happened, but I guess it has something to do with the, with, with, with the lack or with the non-existence of such a plan. But thank you very much.
actually, you touched on this, I think, early on, uh, uh, Riza, um, about producing goods for export. And, uh, and then the manufacture of goods that are targeted towards the domestic market is also as equally important as we all know. So since, and I think it was Butch who said that, that uh, we should tap the local market. So how do you think can the government encourage more investments in domestic oriented enterprises or manufacturing activities, or those that cater to the need of a growing domestic market? Maybe Butch, you can start. Well, for one, government should incentivize investment activities towards this area. Is uh, incentives as it is right now I'm not, not enough? Sh I'm not familiar with the current mm -hmm. investment mm -hmm. priorities plan, but if we're talking about, seriously talking about production, then we should incentivize these types of mm -hmm. uh, instant of activities. The other point is, I think we keep on forgetting that the MSMEs are a big recipient of the manufacturing sector. Yes. Okay, so we do have to have this intentional <clears throat> uh, objective of really including the MSMEs in the value chain whether as suppliers of raw materials or intermediate products, et cetera. And the pandemic really hit them bad. And we know that our economy is really, uh, con constitutes a large percentage of it is constituted by small companies. And I, I cannot help but mention that women <laughs> compose the bulk of MSMEs. So really there is a need to also invest in the recovery of these MSMEs in line with creating manufacturing activities because they can be an important and significant participant in the domestic production activities. Good point. As we all know, MSMEs, uh, they actually uh, employ more than 90% of the total workforce. Yeah. And as we know, Boots is also a very strong advocate for women's rights. We all know that. Yeah, definitely. Who wants to add on maybe... Yeah. yeah. Well, to add, actually, the government has done right with the create law. So, uh, and and uh, we've actually somehow right. And uh, though there's some ambiguity between the BIR and PESA on some uh, area, uh, on some aspects, you know, that they need to solve immediately to attract foreign uh, investments. But uh, based on what we're seeing right now in our economic estates. There are actually local uh, manufacturers moving into our economic assets, and they're not availing of the PESA incentives because the, the, mark, uh, the market is domestic. But because of uh, some uh, provisions of the CREATE law, they're able to, to benefit from it. So in the right direction, there's some ambiguity. Let's continue to enhance and improve the policies around that. The, the second critical thing is uh, to, to encourage uh, local uh, uh, production is upskilling of our workforce. Uh, we do have a huge workforce, and I and I've seen one of the questions that the, uh, one of the comments that we are in a approaching, or if not there yet, the sweet demographic uh, spot. No, but the problem is, uh, yeah, we have a yet a lot of young workers, but with without the necessary skills to be employed in the areas that would give them uh, better uh, better benefits or salaries, right? So again. Um, and maybe the private sector can move towards that by initiating or being the catalyst rather than waiting for, for government to, to uh, start it. Um, the, the, I guess I, those two, and, and I guess the last one is for the MSMEs, we have to include them you know, in, 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 in providing uh, digital access. So digitalization of government processes will actually not just benefit the uh, foreign investor, but most especially the MSMEs, and that will promote uh, economic inclusion. Before I go on to, to Bong, I would just like to say that uh, earlier on, I was uh, invited to speak on a FinTech event to talk about FinTech on, on healthcare. And prior to that, there were speakers who talked about the importance of providing uh, digitalization and knowledge, uh, connectivity to our as I mean, uh, small and medium scale industries, and it's very crucial. And I think there was a consensus there really that for, for them to be able to rise up and compete in the global market, it is important they get connected. That's why I'm glad that Al Palini is here because he's making sure that we're always connected, definitely. Yeah. Bong, you know, Mike, Mike I'm, a, I'm a little bit worried about this distinction between uh, production of goods for our domestic consumers and production of goods for exports. I think that gets us into trouble, all right? I think we want to produce good quality goods efficiently, goods that are you know competitive with anywhere in the world. And that 
that means a whole bunch of stuff. You know, tariff, uh, tariff reform, incentive reform, uh, costs of factors of production. Uh, I would not separate that. You know, domestic goods versus foreign goods. Mm -hmm. I, I think, I think we're beyond that. So you believe that the premise in itself is is, is erroneous. I think. So. Okay. Very good point. Very good point. Yeah. Please. So, sorry, just to tie up with those two things. Um, first of all, Bong's completely right. Um, but if 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 you lump the MSMEs, you know, in in into that general pool of, you know, people we, who who we want to give the opportunity to to produce in an efficient manner, we need to, as Cosette was saying, connect them in a way that the flow of goods to them and the flow of goods from them outward, whether it is a domestic market or an international market, is, is transparent and known. Every MSME right now has no bloody idea how much it's going to cost them tomorrow to import what they need to produce a product. They don't know what the tariff is going to be. They don't know what the truck is going to cost them. They don't know what they're going to have to pay to the to the LGU. They know none of this. So it's a it's a crapshoot. And, you know, if foreign investors, if we keep talking about giving foreign investors all this this uh, transparency and 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 uh, and incentives and honoring their contracts. What about all the what about all the locals? Right. We, we, we should start there and make sure these guys Ladies, sorry, these people are are you know are are is politically correct. Are are you know, it, it's it's extremely frustrating, right? Um, they, we we need to find a way to get all the information. The data is out there, whether government or private sector. Um, get it out there in a way that is clear, transparent, and that gives them certainty um, in order to run their business efficiently. Um, in order for them also to price their goods efficiently, right? So very good points, Christian. Yeah, I agree. Go local first. Yeah. Risa? Yeah, I and I, I agree with that, no, the clarity, transparency, because it's very hard to do business when you don't know what the rules are. And particularly for MSMEs, it's harder because the capacity isn't there. They don't have the capacity to hire lawyers or accountants the way the larger companies would. But I just wanted to add, when you talk of markets, whether it's local or do domestic or foreign, you're also talking of supply chains. And we really need one big factor, one big cost for manufacturers is the cost of transport. So we really need to build our infrastructure to be able to bring goods from the remotest areas in the Philippines to all the, the cities and vice versa. So that you, you can really build a much more efficient operation if your transportation is reliable and it's um, cost effective. And transport also goes, because remember, supply chains aren't just physical supply chains. So they, they say it's breaking up into three now. And one um, sector for it, supply chains is the tele, um, telecommunications technology and the media supply chain. So even the digital infrastructure has to be there because you 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 capacitate them um, digitally. Okay, so they have the digital, but where they are, there's no internet or the internet's not reliable. So even where... It's available when you have no access, it's useless, right? So infrastructure is critical also to be able to, to build um, that capability for, both, uh, for reaching both domestic and international markets. I think that's my cue to respond to that. <laughs> Thank you, Risa, for bringing it up. I think, I think that's one of the, um, as I said, in the, in the PISAC, that's one of the, the initial initiatives that really connectivity for the whole country. And I think all the telcos who were there, uh, PLDT, Globe, and Converge, are committed to continue to roll out. In fact, PLDT has been building infrastructure for the last few years to the tune of about a billion, uh, sorry, $10 billion. And we will continue to, to do that. But what we ask government, and I think when you talk about private and public partnership, it's really in those remote areas where there's sort of missionary routes that it doesn't make sense for private sector to invest if, if you just talk about a business plan, right? So I think where, where we can help each other is maybe some investment also coming from government and we will help them execute a connectivity into those areas. I know somebody said about satellite. 
it's it's a it's a complementary solution, but it's also expensive, right? So I think we need to understand the the economics behind all of this. Um, we were just in the PISAC, we were just sharing with Secretary Uy, if if um, DPWH Secretary can ask for a budget for physical highways, why can't the DICT Secretary ask for digital highways? And I think it's important that there's a budget uh, of government that that will also invest in in infrastructure because in other countries honestly the backbones of of uh, digital infrastructure is funded by government not here here it's private sector and 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 i know we're in the common tower infrastructure that we can be more efficient we can share the cost um, i think more of those uh, kinds of uh, um, uh, regulation uh, is welcome but i think um, we need government also to help out i just wanted also to comment on the on the skill set um, I think I was in Google last week and I visited their offices. And the one who was uh, sort of touring us in the, in the complex said they only have two types of, of, um, of employees, in, uh, engineers and everyone else. Okay. What I'm, trying, what I'm trying to drive at is I think even when I, we're looking at, I, we have a, a strategy called EPLDT, wholly owned, where we build data centers and at the same time, we're looking into the ICT side, where I think you know, a lot of the cloud solutions that we can also bring to the SMEs uh, so that they don't have to think about payroll or, or ERP systems, that they cannot invest on SAP, they cannot invest on this billing systems, but maybe we can offer um, sublight or, or Kenan light right, type of offerings. And we have the scale to offer it piecemeal. No? And, and I think, They've been saying, even, even us, I think our problem in building ICT is the pipeline of talent in, in ICT. In the States, I think they, they put premium on STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. I think there's a big um, gap in terms of our curriculum also in the Philippines, where I think we need to work with the universities and even government and how you could really um, execute more STEM-like uh, curriculums, right? Uh, and uh, you're a lawyer, right? <laughs> yep, I'm the others. Yeah. <laughs> so we here have... and the others. <laughs> so I think we need to really push on IT yeah. um, and scaling up yeah. towards IT. I think that's that's what I hear also in the region from Microsoft, from Google, uh, and also from Amazon. Thank you very much. Uh, good points. Woods, since, go since we're at the topic of human capital and education, in the same manner that uh, Christian spoke about the uh, infrastructure roadmap, why not an education roadmap? Because, because we, really, we really have to accept the fact that our educational system should be demand-driven, that we should be producing the talent that we need. Unfortunately, we have a lot of lawyers like you, accountants <laughs> like us, uh, very few engineers maybe, in fact, uh, even among the youth, you know, I think they're not the take up on the STEM track in K-12 is not as great. So let's start thinking about revamping the educational curricula to provide the needs of industry. And that goes not only goes towards tertiary education, we can look at tech book, technical and vocational skills. I happen to sit in the advisory council of TESDA and uh, particularly the Women's Council. And we're, in the past, we've been training women to be sewers, dressmakers. So we, we tell them that's no longer what we need. We need the women who can thrive in the digital world because most women take on administrative tasks. And once you start trimming down people, they're the first to go. But if they had skills which could address the needs of the, they say the fourth industrial revolution, and then there's more chance that they will be employed. And therefore, and we will be satisfying the need of industry, as Al says, telecoms people or th those types of skin. Very good points. In fact, I think uh, from the outset, um, I, there has always been talk about, let's say, the, the education sector uh, and the vocational schools talking with the different conglomerates and asking them, what talents do you need? But I don't know, it's always been talked about, but uh, so far, I don't know if there's been any movement towards that. But I guess, uh, put in its simplest terms, that's the most logical way of doing it. Ano bang kailangan nyo? Oh, eto, ayun ang kailangan nyo. Pero at the end of the day, you still need lawyers. 
because <laughs> yeah, nothing can be it can be put into paper, can work without the passage of a law. That's where lawyers come in, and we do charge uh, hefty fees sometimes. Uh, but uh, Mike, but, yeah, please, please, please. Uh, there are already certain legal tasks that are being done by AI. Uh, That's true. What's now? <laughs> That's only for notarial services. <laughs> But the points that also were raised by Al, if I may share with the body, I was with the president in, 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 in Bangkok for the APEC ABAC meetings, and we had a uh, roundtable discussion with Thai businessmen uh, on the sidelines of those meetings. And he really uh, uh, emphasized the importance of connectivity. Uh, he mentioned it uh, with the uh, heads of the Thai business groups, and he said, one of the cornerstones of this administration is definitely to improve the connectivity. So that's a good uh, message uh, to, to send out to investors as well, and of course, to all the play major players in, in the country. Um, now, actually, uh, some of the questions that we have here were, has been touched uh, by the discussion, which is good. Uh, this is nice, uh, just a flowing of ideas. Um, but uh, just to be more specific, Stratbase had a survey, and they usually have this survey from time to time. And the survey results, and the survey results showed you know, that uh, a lot of the people, or a lot of uh, businessmen and, and, and in the, the public in general, they are 80% in approval of a private public partnership, PPP. And we've been, of course, we've been exposed to PPP, especially infrastructure. It was just uh, and uh, it was just a bit perhaps uh, sad that uh, during the previous administration there was they veered away from PPP and went more into ODA, but I think now there's a movement and I think Cosette knows this very well to go back into PPP because if with PPP on infrastructure for example it frees up some of the uh, resource you no know, funds needed for socioeconomic economic development education health etc. And for as long as it's a, it's a workable partnership between government, and of course, at the end of the day, no one would invest without getting their money back, and at the same time provide the, the best services, then it should work. But aside from infrastructure, what sectors do you think can, be, can PPP be very, very successful or useful? I, I'd like to take that question because, you know, like, uh, like Al, I'm on the PSAC, but I'm in a different group, which is the job generation. Yes. And um, one of our key recommendations is on skills development, because we said to be able to generate jobs, you've got to have the right skills. And um, one one of the things we're proposing is, we well, first of all involve the private sector in redefining the K to twelve uh, program, so that graduates are employable after they graduate, you no know, K to twelve. But um, the other one that we're saying is something a bit more ambitious. We look to other countries, Singapore, Malaysia, India, where there are public-private partnerships for skills development. And in particular, I'd like to cite India, because for us, this is aspirational. India has a national skills development corporation, which is a public-private partnership. 49% owned by the government, 51% owned by the private sector. It was founded in 2010 and the, because the primary goal of India is to become the skills capital of the world when it comes to skills. So what's that corporation responsible for? It's formed about 40 skills councils now, participants both in the private and public sector. For every industry, there's a skills council. They define this, the first analyze the skills gaps because as we always say, we don't get the right skills, no? skills gaps, and then define a training path program or curriculum to be able to close that skills gap, and then uh, have certification, um, have accreditation programs and certification. It also funds training institutions, especially if you have an innovative model that is sustainable and can get people through with high quality. So there's funding for that. It will fund entities which uh, put up training institutions whose goal is the employability of people. And then it does certification of the graduates. And since it was founded, it has already put 15 million people through the, the programs that have been developed. There are, I don't know how many hundred, they have 18,000 training centers. They've, they're partnered with 21 universities and uh, 4,000 high schools. 
So it's really a whole of nation approach to developing that are the skills that are needed by the industries of today. And they have a particular focus on STEM education, which we were also pushing for how to convince people and graduates you know, to go STEM because one of the things corporations can do is go to the schools and say, these are the jobs of the future. So students will be encouraged to enroll in those courses. So it was one of the proposals we had. Um, it's quite ambitious, but hopefully if we can do something like that, you know, that's why India, you know, they, they run all the companies now <laughs> all over the world. Why not Filipinos being able to go down that skills path? So they've, they've really, 15 million people trained in the skills of the future. And then they also have a system for upskilling so that if uh, you have employees that uh, go through that program, there are incentives that are given to both the employer and the employee every time you're able to upskill someone. So some of the ideas where you can have a public-private partnership, human capital development in education and skills building, I think is one which is very doable because it's been shown to be successful and feasible in other countries. Very, very good points. Uh, we will be watching that, definitely. No, I, I can add there, Mike. Oh. I think that's, well, that's a great uh, vision if we can do that. Just to add to that, Misha, I think the technology companies are willing to help um, certify, uh, develop a, a talent academy or uh, some sort of university just for those kinds of skill sets because they're also looking for talent. So maybe uh, private sector here and government, plus the technology companies globally like Microsoft, AWS, and Google would be willing to also be part of that. Just to add, in fact, in India, the corporates have already gotten into it too. They've started booting up training academies and gotten them accredited. So it's all across the board from SMEs to corporates. Well, okay. question. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I, I remember 22 years ago, in the late 90s, um, we would go, I was JP Morgan then, I would go to the IIMs and the IITs in India. And the, the trick there was you, if you were a global firm, you wanted to be voted by the seniors to come in on their first day of interviews. Uh, that was the kind of competition. So basically, the firms were competing to, to, uh, uh, to make offers to the seniors first. Can you imagine that? You had, you had McKinsey, you had JP Morgan, you had Goldman Sachs. And that was the competition. It wasn't the competition for the kids trying to get it to us. It was competition for us trying to recruit them. And you had to be in the first day or else the best candidates were taken. This was 22 years ago. And I remember hiring kids out of the IIMs and IITs. They had never left their villages, right? Never left their villages. They didn't know how to put on a suit, okay? But six months later, they're in New York, they're in London, they're in Tokyo, they're in Hong Kong, okay? Can you imagine why we can't do that here? Very good point, very provocative, very good. Christian? Yeah, I, I, I have three. First, first has been kind of top of mind for for us for the last couple of years no healthcare um there's there's three here if we left the vaccination drive to ayala mvp group and us we would have vaccinated 10 times more 10 times more people in one tenth the time <laughs> and there there are going to be other opportunities in healthcare I mean, you know, you, you guys, you guys know this very well. Ayala also, right? Um, tremendous opportunities for the private sector to get uh, to get involved and and to to share the burden with the government. Um, the second one, I'm going to need a bodyguard after I say this, but um, and 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 this hasn't really been done in many places around the world, but but um, duties and tax collection, customs in particular. Right. I mean, there, again, I have to be very careful what I say, but uh, uh, that that will provide um, an extremely high level of accountability, um, and you know, it just make things so much more transparent. I mean, can can you imagine if if you had the private sector running running the Bureau of Customs, right? And that's, that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> um, 
and then the 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 third is is in relation. I think this is a little bit more specific. Um, but when I was talking earlier about transparency across the supply chain, what, one of the reasons people don't get transparency across the supply chain is it's everybody providing their own little bits of data. Um, in, a, in a lot of places, Singapore, Dubai, for example, the, the, the supply chain information um, is, is provided to the public in, in port or supply chain community systems where you can pay your toll, you can book your truck appointments, you can book your trucks. Uh, trucks are able to, to, to do what we call um, it, it, uh, MSMEs, truck drivers, sole proprietorships are able to, to effectively sell the receivable to that, that private company to, to generate cash flow in advance, right? Um, which is, is one of the biggest problems these guys have. Uh, and, and, and a whole multitude of other things, right? Pay the ports, pay the trucking companies, pay all, all, all sorts of other things. And, and, and you do it out of one system, which then gives you end-to-end -end visibility across the supply chain. So then you have somebody who, who, who needs to bring in a product or who needs to send out a product, and he has complete certainty over time and cost. And I mean, with all due respect here, the government cannot do that. That's got to be some done by the private sector. Very good points. Well, I, I guess, you know, uh, based on the answers, it's, it's very clear. And I've been an advocate of that uh, when I was in government. Anything can be done via PPP. The framework is there uh, on how to do it. The good thing about PPP is that it's, uh, it, it's uh, output uh, driven rather than input driven, right? So as long as the government agency is, uh, it's clear to the government agency or implementing agency what they want to achieve and what are the service levels that they want to get from the private sector, anything can be done via PPPs. But, you know, there has to be mindset shift. Not government. You know, many many debates uh, I've gone through with the the, the different uh, agencies within government when I was in PPP Center because uh, they uh, they have uh, government has this mindset that it's our job to provide that service and not the private sector. But then my argument was, but we're not doing it. So <laughs> it's our uh, when I was in government, it's our um, obligation to develop the service. You know? So if we use the private sector ingenuity, technology, knowledge, and um, um, uh, money to deliver the service while allowing them to make money off it and that we should be fine with it. Again, also, um, and, and that's critical. Uh, now that uh, it's clear that we can do anything via PPP, then the Philippine Development Plan becomes very uh, critical because that's where we can see uh, what the plans of the governments are in the mid to long term. And based on that, unfortunately, Christian, I'd like everything done to be uh, via solicited bid, but there's capacity constraint, I guess, on the government side. So if, if the private sector can, can, can also submit real unsolicited proposals and government can come out with real uh, and transparent and predictable uh, qualifications on who can submit and, and uh, you know, the criteria and uh, you know, where it moves. Then, then it will be, uh, you know, it'll be a better uh, collaboration on PPP contracts, that PPP collaborations. So I, I, I'm, not, I'm not against unsolicited proposals. <laughs> I've put a few in myself, yeah. um, or, or we, we have, no? But it, it, it's got to be, again, based on, on what yeah. you're saying. What are the government's long-term objectives? You don't want unsolicited proposals for stuff that's only going to serve that private sector entity, right? It, it, it has to fit into what the, the, the country needs and the economy needs. Indeed. And in fact, uh, hats off to you, Cosette, because you did, did a fine job as head of the PPP Center at that time, really. And, um, that, but the thing is, I, I want to ask this of you. Um, good points that you raised, no? But it seems somehow, would, you, would it be accurate to say that sometimes when you propose, there's a PPP, whether it be unsolicited or bid it out, but there seems to be, especially if it's uh, unsolicited, there seems to be a degree of lack of trust on the part of government, uh, on the private sector. There, correct me if I'm wrong, but there, there seems to be an impression that, no, the private sector, they're just out to make money. 
uh, then in the day, uh, the, the, what's wrong with that? Exactly, but you know, they just how to make money. So let's really scrutinize this and, and all that. And, and it, it takes so long passing to di different government agencies. And sometimes one government agency says yes, the next government agency says no, and uh, we, we know the horrors. You know? So uh, is, is that really the mindset of government? Is there really a lack of trust on the private sector's one capability or sincerity in delivering services to the public? Uh, okay. <laughs> well, it's not uh, unique to the Philippines. No, I think in in countries or jurisdictions with uh, weak institutions, I suppose uh, there's always that uh, mistrust. But in, in develop uh, no, in developed countries like Australia, uh, Canada they do a lot of unsolicited proposals. And I think there are uh, frameworks by which, uh, within which the government can actually hire uh, consultants to, to provide them with the proper uh, advice on, 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 you know, on uh, the merits of that, an unsolicited proposal. So I guess, and even in Australia, they have a very strong anti-fraud or whatever at their primary you know so so i guess there there are there are laws third this year is very familiar with that so so there are laws but again uh implementation of those laws so that's where the 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 distrust comes but i hope you know more than more than i i think i think somebody uh the the MAS, former MAS uh, chief said this, that the societal gains from, from, you know, from PPP projects far outweighs the, the gains of the private sector. That's something that, uh, you know, the government should really, you know, consider. Very good point. And I hope, I hope that this heard by all our uh, members of cabinet uh, regarding that topic. But uh, one last question, and maybe just one person to answer this before we wrap up. Um, a lot of people are saying now that globalization should be, re there should be a rethink as far as globalization is concerned. Neoliberalists uh, are, say, are, 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 are people are of the view that neoliberalism is not, shouldn't be embraced the way it was in the past. Why? Because we saw it happen when the pandemic happened and we saw it happen when the Ukraine war hap happened. And we see that uh, in globalization, yes, a lot of countries actually uh, went better off. But there were also a lot of countries who suffered the, the divide between these countries instead of uh, the, the, the ones below catching up, that great, the, the great divide as far as income wealth equity is concerned. And in fact, also, aside from that, uh, we see, for example, because of globalization, Yes, you come up with the best rubber shoes, for example, but child labor is exploited or labor loss uh, in other countries. So do you think that there should be a rethink as far as globalization is concerned? So Mike, Mike, that's why you have this whole push towards sustainability, right? Because uh, there's no question when you look at any, any economic data globally, the globalization increased wealth in the world. The real issue was, you know, it got distributed in all kinds of places yes. and the winners did not compensate the losers. So hence this push towards sustainability, towards shared value. That's just, that's the counterpoint. Um, and uh, the, the, I think uh, this is a an issue that, you know, will run its course. I suspect it will probably, the pendulum will swing probably too far this way yeah, yeah. and then we'll come back. Uh, and I think that's just the way things are. Well, thank you very much, Wong. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd like again to uh, thank all the distinguished members of the panel. Christian, again, for your very uh, down-to-earth survey comments. Uh, we like that. Of course, Al, as always, thank you so much. Uh, I think you might have won yourself a show in TV5. Yeah. <laughs> well, as you know, PLDT owns uh, TV5, so I have a show. Anyway, and Butch, thank you so much. Uh, continue to love lawyers. Okay. <laughs> And Cosette, as always, good to see you. And indeed, um, uh, your views on PPP, really, uh, that's really the way moving forward. And of course, Bong, as always, thank you so much. And Risa, again, my uh, former MAP president. Maraming maraming salamat. So, maraming salamat po sa inyo lahat. Palakpakan po natin sila to give them a warm round of applause. Thank <laughs> you.
You're welcome. Mic test. Thank you very much again to our panel for that very insightful and uh, provocative discussion. And uh, so to formally close our two-day conference, we would like to call Honorable Alfredo Fred Pascual, the Secretary of the Department of Trade and Industry. Over the past four decades, he has contributed to society as a governance advocate academic leader, international development banker, and management educator. Mr. Pascual was the president of the Management Association of the Philippines and was the president of the University of the Philippines from 2011 until 2017. He served at the Asian, at the Asian Development Bank for almost two decades in several positions, including as director for private sector operations, director for project finance, and advisor for public-private partnership. Ladies and gentlemen, Secretary Fred Pascual. Let me first greet the organizer of this event, uh, Strat-based ADR Institute President Dean Dumanhit. Uh, the distinguished panels whom I uh, almost missed if I came uh, a little later. Uh, colleagues from government, if any, and uh, of course from the private sector. Ladies and gentlemen, pleasant afternoon to all. Congratulations to Strat-based ADR for successfully <clears throat> organizing this uh, Filipinas Conference 2022 with the theme Business Value Creation, Paving the Path for Inclusive Growth. The three panel discussions have indeed been packed with insights into the vital role of business in nation building. In the first panel, sustaining the Philippines growth momentum amid fiscal challenges and global uncertainties, I understand that uh, there were discussions on how the private sector investments have contributed to rebuilding our economy, generating jobs, achieving development goals, and boosting resilience through multiple stakeholder, multiple multi-level stakeholder partnerships. In the second panel, balancing recovery with progressive development through global cooperation. Uh, I, I understand and I caught part of it. Uh, 
we heard from international partners how we could uh, realize opportunities for increased connectivity development through trade and investments and improved business environment and investment climate. In uh, today's third and last session, leaders of the country's blue chip companies have given insights on creating long-term value for all stakeholders. We create long-term value for all stakeholders when we are responsive to the needs of not just our shareholders, but also our other stakeholders, uh, employees, suppliers, customers, and community. We all know this. The private sector is the engine of economic growth, and the private sector is also a crucial partner in achieving the country's green, sustainable, and inclusive development. Beyond corporate social responsibility, corporations should also plan and implement sustainable and inclusive development programs in partnership with the government at the local and national levels. Government creates long-term value by building relationships with and among stakeholders. It links knowledge and skills, capital and resources, and the all important market players to each other. The current administration, for example, established the Private Sector Advisory Council to link government and the private sector. This council, uh, or PSAC, comprises a diverse group of the nation's top CEOs from various industries. It is tasked to promote government and private sector collaborations, seeking to create intra and inter-regional links among businesses, government, and the academe, the Department of Trade and Industry, my department, introduced the Regional Inclusive Innovation Centers, or RIICs. These hubs connect various stakeholders and address gaps in every region's innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem. The RIICs are one of our drivers for inclusive growth in the region, along with multi-stakeholder investment planning and promotion. The RIICs, the RIICs are expected to address the inequalities in regional development. And if we address these disparities in regional development, we can claim that we have achieved inclusive growth. But we cannot talk of inclusive growth without focusing on MSME development, the development of micro, small and medium enterprises. One of DTI's strategic priority is the linking of large corporations with MSMEs to develop uh, supply and value chains at the national and global level. Aside from addressing gaps in the value chains, in the supply and value chains, these links will help us graduate micro to small, small to medium, and medium to large enterprises. We have designed and launched programs to help make sure MSMEs are on par and ready to work with large corporates. One of our priorities at DTI is to upgrade, upskill, and upsize MSMEs. By the way, MSMEs, in terms of number, constitute 99.5% of the total number of enterprises or companies in the Philippines. For MSMEs to continue to upscale, we are addressing constraints to access to their access to finance, technology, and markets. To help MSMEs address financing or access financing, DTI is developing a number of instruments that will cater to MSMEs in different capacities. For example, we have a grant matching facility that supports agribusiness uh, addressing gaps in food value chain in selected regions. We also have other financing programs through the Small Business Corporation, or SB Corp. To help ease MSMEs access to services, including technology and uh, skills, we have established 1,344 negotiation centers throughout the country. These centers serve as mentoring hubs and provide business development services. To further on uh, helping small business, including large businesses, 
uh, improve their uh, technological uh, situation, uh, we have or we are adapting the Industry 4.0 technologies through the establishment of a Center for Artificial Intelligence Research and the Industry 4.0 pilot factories. These are two innovation hubs that uh, we are in uh, the process of uh, setting up. In, the, in partnership with Union Bank and Global Learning Solutions, we launched the Center for Artificial Intelligence Research in Laguna back in uh, September, a couple of months ago. This uh, AI Research Center is a hub where data scientists, researchers can perform collaborative AI R&D. Uh, this, uh, this center will uh, help mainly small businesses, but its uh, capacity for uh, R&D is also available to large enterprises. We know that uh, the super large enterprises in the Philippines already access AI research uh, through international outfits uh, in, country, in places outside the, the country. But we're bringing one here to be able to serve the needs of uh, smaller enterprises. Complementary to the AI Research Center, we are establishing the Industry 4.0 Pilot Factory. This pilot factory uh, will be a demonstration and learning uh, site for relevant technologies. The, these relevant technologies include robotics, intelligent manufacturing, and cyber physical systems. The pilot factory to be set up in BGC, Taguig, will be a space where businesses, researchers, and universities will have hands-on lessons on robotics, automation, and smart factory, among others. We will soon be able to bring equipment donated by Siemens of Germany into this facility. When we were visiting Singapore a couple of months ago, I had the opportunity to visit the pilot factory that Siemens established in, in Singapore. And that's exactly what we're trying to replicate in, uh, in the Philippines. Uh, we believe that uh, by developing MSMEs, we can achieve inclusive growth. And to develop them, we need to gear them toward science, technology, and innovation. And we're providing the means for doing that. DTI has also conducted industry consultations on DTI's science, technology, and innovation-based industry strategy for the next six years. This industry strategy focuses on four industry clusters. One, health and life sciences. Two, technology, media, telecommunications. Three, industrial, manufacturing, and transport uh, industries. And fourth, modern basic needs of a resilient economy. The first three, will avail of the opportunities that have opened up as industries restructured in response to disruptions that are happening even before the pandemic, you know, the, the rapid uh, changes in technology. And then the, when the pandemic came, another set of disruptions. And now uh, the war in Eastern Europe is a, a cost for a lot of disruptions as well. And there are opportunities created by those changes. Like, for example, uh, the idea now that uh, for large uh, international companies, it is not wise to just rely on one source, one country source. So there's now diversification of supply sources and the Philippines will try to catch some of those uh, additional facilities that will set, be set up to, for al al the alternative uh, supply uh, uh, sources or for those that will exit certain countries uh, to another Flandbier uh, location. To zero in on the need for a strong linkage between educational competencies and industry workforce requirements, DTI launched in June 2021, the Philippine Skills Framework or PSF, an interagency effort to build the skills and competencies of, of the country's workforce toward the needs of the future economy. It involves the development of sector-specific skills framework that will address stakeholders' concerns, guide the country's workers in skills enhancement, 
help employers design progressive talent development plans and assist educators in revising existing curricula or designing new courses that are more relevant and responsive to current industry needs and emerging market manpower demands. Priority sectors include construction, creatives, food, agriculture, fisheries, health and wellness, information technology, business process management, logistics, and supply chain, manufacturing, and tourism. As we participate in this, in the ongoing potential uh, growth industries that we have uh, identified, we need to be able, or we need to be mindful of the stakeholders involved. Living wages and good working conditions for employees, fair contracts for our suppliers, customer focus products and services, community centered activities. Only in doing so, can we realize shared prosperity for all and uh, inclusive growth? Uh, last month, I was in Brussels trying to negotiate the renewal of our GSP plus coverage. And uh, there are conditionalities there. And some of the conditionalities uh, affect on what we do to our share uh, stakeholders, particularly uh, labor and uh, environment. And we're trying to explain to them what we're doing. I thank you, thank you all for uh, listening to me this late. Uh, I thank the business community for its uh, solid commitment to the country's growth and development for being our partner for many years now in creating and managing opportunities for the Philippines and in seeking new areas of cooperation. We look forward to many more years of fruitful partnership. I encourage you to be part of the Philippine growth story and be it, let it be an inclusive growth. Uh, let's make uh, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable growth happen in the Philippines. Thank you, and again, good afternoon to all. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. First, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak again at this most valuable conference. My apologies for not being with you in person and for not being able to present to you live. I've been asked to speak today about what it would take to improve the investment and trading conditions for foreign businesses in the Philippines. As you all know, the Philippines um, is a very dynamic and growing economy. And it has plenty of positives from its people, possible. its natural resources, so its year, geographical we'll position, and from being part of a group of countries everyone. that are presently at the center of global growth. And it's also, unfortunately, some geopolitical tensions. I mean, of course, ASEAN. Today, I intend to look at the current situation and the perception of the Philippines how the country is presently faring in terms of trade and investment compared to others. And finally, what can be done to make the Philippines a more attractive place for foreign businesses, foreign investment and foreign trade. As you can see from the graph on this slide, the Philippines trade and investment performance has been steady, generally improving, but far from spectacular. 
spectacular is where you want to get to. Every year, the EU ASEAN Business Council undertakes an annual business sentiment survey, a kind of snapshot of views of European businesses across the ASEAN region on a variety of topics and issues. I will not bore you with the full results, just some headlines that are pertinent to today's discussion. The survey has good news for the ASEAN region as a whole. It is still seen, indeed more so this year, as the region of best economic opportunity over the next five years. The next country or region on the list was China at just 11%, a long way behind ASEAN's 63%. And for the Philippines, it showed a majority of respondents based in the country as saying they were looking to expand their operations over the next two years, just below the ASEAN average, but still in positive territory. That is good news as well. The less good news, and it's important going forward for trade and investment, is that the general feeling was that not enough is being done to green the economy. More needs to be done, and more needs to be seen to be done on this. If not, going forward, businesses from Europe or elsewhere simply will not be able to make investments in your economy. Their regulators will not let them, their investors will not let them, their shareholders will not let them, and more importantly, their own customers will not let them. This is not an EU Green Deal thing. It is a fact of modern life. I know steps are being done in the Philippines, but those steps need to be accelerated. A good way to look at how the Philippines has been faring in terms of its trade and investment performance is to look at one of your near neighbors in ASEAN, Vietnam. Similar sized countries, both in ASEAN. But one quick look at this table, where the information is drawn from the ASEAN Statistical Yearbook, will show you how Vietnam has been outperforming the Philippines since 2012. Unemployment in the Philippines is essentially flat. GDP has nearly doubled. Trading goods has more than doubled. The same for FDI flows. And the balance of trade has gone from negative to a very healthy surplus. Sadly, the Philippines has not kept pace and your balance of trade has worsened. The other graphs on this page show that Vietnam has been accelerating away from the Philippines, both on trade and investment, and is also attracting more FDI. Vietnam, in fact, did not see any fall in its exports to the EU during the COVID period. The numbers just kept on going up. So how can the Philippines improve on its economic performance, make itself more attractive for trade and investment, it's not all doom and gloom, I can assure you of that. As a nation, the Philippines has many positives and much to be proud of, and a strong base to build from as well. Your economy is growing. It is growing out of the worst ravages of COVID-19. You still have great, inventive, adaptable people. You have the resources. It is unlocking the potential of all of that, all of those great things that you have, which is the key to getting more trade and more investment coming in. Personally, I have faith in a very bright future for the Philippines. You have a new economic team in government. I've seen them in action already. They are business friendly, dynamic, and are already putting the Philippines on the map. At the end of this year, there will be a big political summit in Europe between the EU and ASEAN. Your president and his economic team will be there and they will be speaking at our own ASEAN-EU Business Summit on the 13th of December in Brussels. They will be pressing the flesh and making the case for more trade and more investment from Europe. Secondly, the Philippines must ratify RCEP. This is the world's largest trade deal. It is a good deal. There is nothing to be feared from it, including from your agricultural sector. One reason why Vietnam has done so well is the sheer number of trade deals that it has done. Bilateral deals, such as one with the EU that has clearly driven up the trade numbers, and multilateral deals, such as CPTPP and RCEP. Trade deals will spur increases in trade and investment for the Philippines. There can be no doubt about that. So please ratify RCEP and implement RCEP to the fullest extent possible. 
You need to continue to review and enhance investment policies and trade policies and regulations to make your economy as open as possible for foreign investment. Open up more sectors for foreign investment and majority foreign investment. This might mean getting creative in how some laws are drafted because of the nature of your constitution, but it has been done before. This will bring new investments and new investments into much needed areas such as power and telecoms and infrastructure and agriculture, etc. Philippines has also been a strong champion of ASEAN. The region is just beginning to do a review of the ASEAN Trades and Goods Agreement. I hope the Philippines will push for strong advances on this, particularly in the area of the elimination of non-tariff barriers to trade and increased customs automation. Both of these hold back improvements in intra-ASEAN trade to the detriment of your own exporters and to the detriment of your own consumers and to the detriment of attracting more investment into your country. Push ASEAN forward, make ASEAN deliver on its promises and life will be so much easier for trade and investment in the Philippines. I was in Brussels last week and spent a significant amount of time championing the cause for the recommencement of FTA negotiations between the EU and the Philippines. You would have seen the significant improvements in trade and investment that Vietnam has gained from its deal with Europe. The Philippines can get the same. I know Secretary Pascal and his colleagues are pressing the case. I know that the EU has meetings this week in the Philippines to assess positions and review what the progress might be if talks were to restart. My personal view is that an FTA between the EU and the Philippines could be one of the EU's easier negotiations and should be relatively quick. I believe there is a desire in Manila to see it done. And Executive Vice President Dombrovskis, the EU's trade commissioner, has said recently he wants to see more trade deals done. Let's hope negotiations can be announced in December at the ASEAN EU summit. You have competition from Malaysia and Thailand for the recommencement of negotiations, and the EU team has limited resources. So it is imperative that the Philippines makes it crystal clear to Brussels that you are both ready to restart negotiations and have the desire to see them through quickly. Finally, there is a need to accelerate work on greening supply chains, greening energy buys, and doing more on climate action. Unfortunately, you're a nation which is very prone to climate change issues and adverse weather conditions. Improving life in these areas and accelerating work in these areas will actually have the potential to attract more investment in themselves, particularly from Europe, where there are many leading firms in these spaces. They will also create employment, but more importantly, they will create conditions that allow for further investments in other sectors. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, your excellencies, um, people in the audience, I see the Philippines going forward as a country which can truly motor on and can truly attract more foreign investment and more trade from overseas, particularly from Europe. You have all the right ingredients in place. I believe you now have the political will in place as well to do so. Let's get those FTA discussions with the EU underway. Please ratify RCEP and look at how you can further enhance your rules and regulations to attract more investment into the country and then that investment will flow. I wish you a good rest of the conference. Thank you very much.